Dedication For Alex, with thanks to Joe and the Leshers. At my coming back I shot at a great bird which I saw sitting upon a tree on the side of a great wood. I believe it was the first gun that had been fired there since the creation of the world. I had no sooner fired, but from all the parts of the wood there arose an innumerable number of fowls of many sorts, making a confused screaming and crying, every one according to his usual note, but not one of them of any kind that I knew. As for the creature I killed, I took it to be a kind of a hawk, its color and beak resembling it, but had no talons or claws more than common. Its flesh was carrion, and fit for nothing. Daniel Defoe, Robinson Crusoe One. On August 14th, at three in the afternoon, Michael Schaefer noticed a small poster on a board inside the front window of a small tea house. It said, The Amazing Powers of the Intellect, in bold letters at the top, and this attracted his attention. He hoped that there were amazing powers in the intellect, although his dealings with others and many years of self-examination had revealed none that he thought much of. In smaller letters at the bottom, the poster said, 14 August, 4 p.m., and Lynchgate House, Bath. He had a little trouble finding it, because in England, Lynchgate House could mean anything from a private cottage to the corporate headquarters of a conglomerate. By asking directions, he discovered it to be a country house not, strictly speaking, in Bath, owned by someone not named Lynchgate. When he arrived, he found a pair of pink, beefy young women at the entrance to smile at everyone and presumably to shut the door when their number approximated the capacity of Lynchgate House. Inside, he followed a middle-aged woman in a flowered dress to a large room with leaded glass windows that reached from the fifteen-foot ceiling nearly to the floor and looked out onto a garden with a foreground of topiary trees shaved and worried into the shape of gumdrops and a background of hedges nearly twenty feet high. The room contained about thirty-five people, all very British, and all apparently from the class of British people who always seemed to be busy doing things that couldn't possibly bring in any money, but didn't necessarily cost much either. Gardening and bird hikes and lectures. He wondered how many of them knew Latin, and decided that probably all of them did. His eyes settled inevitably on a pretty young woman who was arranging some pamphlets on a table at the front. She bent over as she worked, and he appreciated the curve of her hips under the light silk dress she wore. At this moment the Honorable Meg came in, scanned the crowd, and sat down next to him. The first thing Schaefer noticed was her skin. It was fair and appeared to have an even, uniform smoothness, like natural ivory, its only variance a slight flush to her cheeks. Her shining dark brown hair made the skin seem to glow, and her bright green eyes looked amused. What she had wasn't exactly beauty, but perfection, and this was unnerving because it tempted him to scrutinize her for flaws. He sat stiffly in his chair to keep from violating the expanded amount of space that seemed her due. The girl he had been watching turned around and announced, Mrs. Purvis will open the meeting with a few announcements on our autumn trip to Atlantis. Schaefer barely breathed. Maybe it was the name of something else, or maybe he had heard the word wrong. Mrs. Purvis was a slightly plump, enthusiastic blonde lady in her forties, and she dispelled his doubts. After the experience we had last year on our trip to the alien landing strips on the plains of Nazca, I'd like to beg everyone to pay attention to the instruction sheet when packing this year. We'll be establishing our base camp on Grand Turk Island. It is tropical, but we'll be there in hurricane season. During a hurricane, between twenty-five and fifty centimeters of rain may fall in two days, and the winds may be violent. So dress accordingly. Michael Schaefer felt distinctly uncomfortable. He wondered for a moment how this group of people would go about dressing for twenty inches of rain and one hundred fifty mile an hour winds. The girl who had introduced Mrs. Purvis now launched into a few more details. 
Everything we know about ancient Atlantis suggests they wore bright colors, probably lots of reds and yellows. So please try to respect that scheme. There will be ever so many lingering spirits about, and it won't do to offend them. Schaefer slipped out of his seat and moved toward the door. As he made it past the two beefy girls, one of them asked, "Something wrong, Meg?" And he heard a soft voice at his shoulder. "Sorry, dear." We've just got to leave. My friend has another appointment. Then she slipped her arm in Michael's and pulled him out of Lynchgate House. Outside the door, she didn't let go of his arm. Thank you. I'm sorry I had to hitchhike, but when you left, it was my last chance. Two persons might have to leave at once for some perfectly benign reason, but if they leave one after the other, it appears to be a trend, and they get very upset. Do they? He said. You're welcome. He tried to turn toward her to remove his arm from her grasp subtly. Don't do that, she insisted. They'll think I just grabbed you for a convenient exit, and they already resent me. Who are you? Their psychiatrist? Meg Holroyd, the Honorable Margaret Susanna Moncrief Holroyd. Does that mean anything to you? Where I come from, it would mean you're a politician, so the honorable would be a lie. Here, I suppose, it means something else. No, it's a lie here too. It means that hundreds of years ago there was a man in my family, whose homicidal tendencies got him a title. My people are from York, but nobody goes up north any more, except to sweep the cobwebs out of the family battlements. Where do you come from, by the way? Arizona. Automatically, he fed her the first half of his prepared story. She demanded the other half. What's your name, Michael? Would you like to go for tea or something? Charmingly put. Who could refuse? Macready's isn't far. Good. When we get there, you'll have to let go of my arm. Why do those people resent you? She smiled proudly. I did something cruel to them for fun. You did. He watched her as they walked. What? Something horrible. Afterward, at the next meeting, they voted a formal reprimand and made speeches saying how irresponsible I was about taking care of the hidden secrets vouchsafed to the initiates. She laughed happily. In other words, you're not planning to tell me. She studied him for a moment. Or pretended to. Yes, knowing you as I do, I suppose I'll have to. You'll make me, won't you? As they entered Macready's tea shop, and he followed her to a table in a dark corner, he had a moment to evaluate the risk he was taking. But then they were seated, and he decided to defend himself with questions. You don't seem to take your friends very seriously. What are you doing with them? She shrugged. They're one of my hobbies. I give them money so I get to play with them. I inherited them actually. My grandfather was a scholarly sort, and all his life he supported study groups and lectures on scientific topics. But late in life, when he was beginning to think a lot about dying, and was getting a bit dotty, he lost interest in geology and archaeology and flora and fauna, and became obsessed with this sort of thing. Expeditions to Atlantis. Well, it's a whole range of things, all mixed up and linked together. There's Atlantis, but some of them think it was an ancient civilization, and others think it was people from outer space. There's a smaller faction who think it was an ancient civilization destroyed by people from outer space, and another that think it wasn't destroyed at all, that they're still under water, waiting for us to be worthy of their company before they'll come out. I hope they're not holding their breath. It's pretty easy to get an expedition together. If you're a lunatic, you have to hold some theory that accounts for Atlantis. Why? Because lunatics are systematic thinkers. If they have a secret history of the world to put forward, they can't have other lunatics shouting. Then how do you account for the pyramids? What about Stonehenge, Easter Island? They have to include these things. What did you do to them? I'm ashamed to tell you. 
She stared into her teacup, then added, But of course I will. I assaulted them. Sexually. Schaefer looked at her. All of them? Every last one. All of the people who were there today, and a few more who were otherwise engaged. Attendance is down today. You were the only new one. A month ago I came in and took the podium. I'd been in Paris for some time, but I'd told everyone I was going to Bolivia. I was supposed to tell them about my research in Tiwanaku. I went on for some time with slides of the ruins, the weeping god and all that, and then told them about my greatest discovery. I'd found a true aphrodisiac. I told them that in a tiny village I'd found a caraca, and paid him eight hundred pounds for a small vial of the stuff. Don't tell me you sold it to them. Oh, no. It wasn't anything so crass as wanting their money. I just wanted to play with them. I told them I'd put it in their punch at the reception before the meeting. And had you? Of course not. There's no such thing. I slipped in a little powdered Valium mixed with cognac so they'd feel something. I said I'd just put some in so they could help with the experiment. But I'd prepared them rather well. I'd hired two very attractive and respectable-looking prostitutes in London on the way home, and had them come to the meeting separately as interested beginners. Around this time they began to show symptoms that something was very wrong, if you know what I mean. No, I'm afraid I don't. Well, I don't know how to say this delicately. They began to adjust their clothing and wriggle in their chairs a bit. When that began to attract some attention, they started to make rather brazen advances to their male neighbors. Then, when the response was positive and visible, they both moaned with a certain urgency and insistence. And it worked? Not immediately. At first, the emergency struck some people as medical rather than erotic. But then they both tore off their clothes and began to attack the men around them. There was a good deal of pawing and clutching. They were also extremely good at disrobing others with an economy of movement, and when a man's trousers are suddenly around his ankles, he feels very silly. He must decide immediately either to pull them up or not. Several of them delayed the decision until too late, and very soon some kind of line was crossed. It was like a riot. I ran to the door, locked it, and shouted that it was a gigantic disaster. Things had gone terribly wrong, all the while unbuttoning my dress as though I couldn't help myself. But it was unnecessary. By that time, both of the Hartleby sisters, the plump ones who take attendance, were uniformly naked, and Eunice Plimstall, the one you were ogling today, had convinced herself she'd fainted, and the poor dear had fallen with her skirt up to her waist, so old Mr. Capshaw was giving her an esoteric form of artificial resuscitation. She came to herself rather quickly, I have to say, and then she was up in search of a comforter with more stamina. Mrs. Purvis went to her hands and knees to help the fallen, but within seconds the vicar had lifted her dress and was helping her to free herself of her underclothes. It didn't seem to cure her hyperventilation, but she appeared to be grateful for the thought, and the orgy was fairly begun. Afterward they considered having me arrested, but thought better of it and settled on a reprimand. "'That's a wonderful story,' he said, then sipped his tea. She looked disappointed. "'You don't believe it, do you?' He shook his head. "'Not a word of it. But that doesn't matter. I don't know any of those people. Why would I care if it's true?' The stories are better if you believe in them, said the Honorable Meg. I always tell them to be believed. I hope you aren't going to mind. Not at all, he said. He looked at her thoughtfully. It ensures a certain level of quality. A story has to be pretty good before you can tell it as a lie. It was at this moment that things were settled. The Honorable Meg had found someone who would listen with fixed attention to her stories, and she was content to spend the next two years cherishing him for it. The time simply happened, without anything unpleasant to make her notice its passing. 
Michael Schaefer was competent and solid, an American businessman who had done something so thunderously dull to earn a living that as soon as he had gathered enough to satisfy the dictates of respectability, he had retired to England and stopped talking or even thinking about it. Of course, marrying a man like that would have been unthinkable. The Honorable Meg, as a young, healthy, attractive member of the aristocracy, was the property of an invisible national genetic trust. Her only duty as a loyal subject was to be scrupulously careful not to be impregnated by the American. She helped him to assuage his curiosity about music, art, and the other pursuits of the rich. But after the first year she became accustomed to the fact that his curiosity wasn't strong enough to lure him far afield. He wouldn't go to London for the theatre or even for the food. This was acceptable because it enabled her to move among her equals and let her life proceed unimpeded by the presence of an embarrassingly unacceptable lover. It wasn't that she was worried that one day he would show up in a terrible necktie and disgrace her before all England. He was without personal preference, and so would pay the best shops to dress him in the way other people dressed. He was unacceptable only because of who she was. The Honorable Meg would have to marry a young man with a name her family had heard of, and she was certain that it wouldn't matter to Michael Schaefer when she did. He wouldn't expect their relationship to change at all because as nearly as she could discern, that kind of morality was simply not something that occurred to him. It was something that other creatures had, like the desire to migrate or hibernate or lose their feathers. 2. At the end of the two years, a morning came and Schaefer opened his eyes to evaluate it. He'd had the window in his bedroom knocked out and replaced with glass bricks before he had allowed himself to sleep in the room. The effect had been to provide him with a view of the quality of the light without the distraction of objects or images. The position of the wall of light was high. A rifle shot would have to come from a helicopter, pierce the translucent glass bricks, and then would hit a lone man standing inside only by chance. The grey ceiling of clouds that had covered Bath for the past week must have gone because now the light was gold and blue. He sat up and looked around him. Nothing of the years of working had left him. When his eyes opened, he was awake and alert. Without thinking about it, he knew at any moment where the nearest weapon was hidden. It had been a simple matter when he had established himself in the house to present himself as a gun collector. He had bought a collection intact at an estate sale handmade purdy shotguns, engraved presentation revolvers, the worn four fifty five Webley pistol that the former owner had carried in the trenches at Verdun, even a delicate set of dueling pistols that looked as though they would crack into fragments if they were fired. Thereafter he had been able to add a few more modern and functional weapons without alarming the housekeeper or her husband. The precautions he had taken had never been elaborate or inconvenient, they were simply the normal, sensible things he had been doing since the days when he had started working. He remembered that Eddie Mastruski would not sleep in a bed when he was working. He would rent a room, move the mattress to the floor, and sleep there with a pistol beside him. Once he and Eddie had taken a motel room and slept in the car, and that night Eddie had been right. At three in the morning, two men carrying shotguns had burst into the room. Until Eddie had started the car, he could hear the two of them in the dark room, blowing hole after hole in the twin beds. A blast, then a metallic slide and click, then another blast. Even as they pulled away, he could still hear the firing and see the muzzle flashes through the open doorway, lighting the walls and leaving a bright orange afterimage floating behind his eyes. As Schaefer stepped onto the floor, he heard a quiet clicking sound and realized that someone was trying to turn the handle on the bedroom door. He walked toward it and listened. Oh, damn! It was the voice of the Honorable Meg. Then there was a small thump on the door. It was a steel fire door that he had bought from a restaurant supply warehouse in London, so the sound of her fist on it carried no resonance. Ouch! Damn it, Michael! I know you're in there. Mrs. Satterthwaite said so. Get up and open this door. Just a minute, he called. It was only at times like this, when he had been asleep and had wandered in the places that dreams constructed for him, that the name still sounded strange to him. 
He put on his bathrobe and moved to the side of the door. There was no telling who she might bring. Members of the entourage of overbred young aristocrats she swept along with her, or the regimental band of the 3011th Welsh Borderers in full battle regalia. He opened the door and saw that she was alone. She wore a wide picture hat and a thin sleeveless dress of yellow cotton. She had calculated today's costume as striking, the bold and direct look of the big-eyed young girls in nineteenth-century paintings who had such oddly curly hair. Was that Turner? No, he was the one where the sky looked as if a nuclear war were being fought somewhere in the suburbs. It was somebody else. As soon as he opened the door, she snatched the hat off her head and marched into the room already talking. There's not much time, so you'll have to be quick about it. This place is ridiculous. You know that, don't you? Of course you do. But you don't care at all. It was a perfectly decent old house, and you've made it look as though Hitler had escaped and built a bunker in Arizona, and then went even madder and moved it intact to Bath. How can anyone be expected to surprise you? I don't like surprises. I like sleep. She looked at him slyly. It's because you wake up with an erection, isn't it? I beg your pardon. It is. Don't deny it. You're afraid Mrs. Satterthwaite will walk in and set a tea tray on it, and you'll be discovered. Hurry up now. Your secret is safe with me. Hurry up with what? We're going to Brighton for the races, and the horses are only going to wait so long for the likes of you. Schaefer had only a vague notion of the whereabouts of Brighton. It was near the sea somewhere in the southeast. Isn't that a little far? No problem. Jimmy Pinchasen has offered to take us all in his Bentley, and he drives as though he'd signed a suicide pact. His family was really named Pinchhausen, but they changed it when they came here with George I because he was German too. So Jimmy has a genetic desire to drive the way they do on the Autobahn. He sat back down on the bed. I don't think so. If you don't believe me, then ask him. I mean the other races. He thought for a moment. I'm not much of a gambler. It was true. He never gambled. And yet he'd had terrible luck at it. After he had done his last job, he had gone to Las Vegas to collect. They had sent him to a casino to pretend to play blackjack, and he remembered the sight of the dealer's perfect paraffin white fingers making face cards appear from the shoe in front of him. The dealer had been a mechanic they had brought in just to pay him with chips. So that he would go out into the darkness, loaded down with money, his senses dulled by the warm, fat, stupid feeling that winners had. We'll talk about that in a few minutes when you're finished and can be expected to think clearly. Finished with what? She tossed her hat and purse on the nearest chair. With me, silly. I'm wearing only the kind of undergarments that the worst sort of woman wears to inflame the jaded desires of men like you. See. She lifted her skirt and showed him that she was wearing only a garter belt and stockings, then dropped the skirt again. He looked up into her eyes, but the flash of white thigh was fresh in his memory. Well, you've got my attention. Come on, Michael. I sincerely hope this pleases you, because I've been thinking about it ever since I woke up this morning, and walking over here feeling secretly naked, and, well, it's gotten me into rather a state. So, if you don't mind, I'd just as soon forego some of the preliminaries I'm entitled to in favor of immediate gratification. She looked down at his bathrobe, which was beginning to slip open. Thank God, she said. So would you. Lying on the bed, he stared up at the glass brick window. The sun was higher now, and there were squares that looked like small golden containers of sunlight. The honorable Meg was in front of the mirror, slipping the yellow dress over her head. "Look sharp, old fellow," she said. "They'll be waiting for us." I thought you said we'd talk about it. Of course we will. While you're getting ready, if you like, we can talk about it all the way to Brighton. She glanced at him, then shook her head. I agreed to go because I know you have only two emotions: curiosity and lack of curiosity. I thought you'd be curious about horses. He stared at the ceiling. It wasn't as though he were about to walk into one of the gambling clubs in London with a beautiful woman on his arm, and two or three loud, half-drunk young Englishmen drawing attention to themselves. 
Brighton probably wasn't the sort of place he had to be wary of, and he'd seen Pinchasen's Bentley. It looked quiet and conservative, almost absurdly so, with slightly tinted windows in the back seat. He could tell from the wall of light that the sun already had warmed the earth and dried the dew on the grass. He sat up, walked to the bathroom, and turned on the shower. Like everything else in the house that was intended to perform a function, he'd had it installed. It had French fixtures and Italian tiles and French porcelain, and looked as though it had been assembled in a co-op in Manhattan. As soon as he felt the hot water on his skin, he admitted that he already had a high opinion of the day. The decision was behind him. He was going to please Meg. After ten years, the surviving capos in the United States wouldn't be thinking about doing each other favors by spotting people like him in remote places. Instead, they would be worrying about some D.A. hauling in their children's babysitters as witnesses to convict them of conspiracy. He could afford to relax a little. "'Do you go back to the States often?' Peter Filching asked it as though he were stating a fond wish. They could feel the car accelerating relentlessly as the long straight stretch of road seemed to be getting used up. No, Schaefer answered, then sensed that he needed to elaborate or become the subject of conversation at a future dinner. For an American who was dull-witted and reticent wouldn't be particularly surprising, so that Peter would have to add entertaining details. He glanced at the windshield and felt the same sensation he often felt in airplanes. Would the vehicle lift up in time, or hurtle into the woods at the end of the runway? Years ago there was an advertising campaign built around the slogan, See America First. So I did. I'd planned to see the rest of the world second, but now Jimmy's driving, and I'm glad I didn't pay for any tickets in advance. Jimmy Pinchasen's jaw dropped, and he bared his long white teeth to bray, Haw! There was a moment of pronounced deceleration as the big sedan drifted into the turn at the end of the road, and all the passengers braced themselves to keep from sliding into one another. "'Too bad,' said Peter Filching, as he shrugged to elbow his way off the door, where the centrifugal force had plastered him. "'I've heard you can now pick up bargains there on certain things that used to be expensive,' Meg let out a groan. "'Michael doesn't want to buy you cocaine, Peter.' She squeezed his arm. It's passé in America now, anyway. Is it? Peter's jaw tightened. If he hadn't been forced into exile in a place like Bath for the past two years, he would know these things. But the disasters he had suffered at the hands of the Frenchwoman he had met in Caffera had been impossible to hide from his father. In a year he had exhausted the careful husbandry of generations of filchings, who had made themselves blind fiddling over ledgers in the East India Company headquarters in Calcutta, and then had patiently awaited the rewards of compound interest in the family stronghold outside Bath. And that was the worst of his luck. To be born in a place that had glittered with celebrity and social lightning a hundred and fifty years ago. Jimmy Pinchasen executed a sedate approximation of a power shift to bring the old Bentley out of the turn. The beautifully meshed gears survived the experiment, and the car rumbled to reach its former cruising speed, and soon there were hedgerows slipping past the window again in an exciting blur of green. Jimmy glanced in the mirror to catch a glimpse of Meg and her middle-aged American in the back seat. The Honorable Margaret Holroyd certainly wasn't interested in the man's money, if he had any. The thought intruded on Jimmy's complacent consciousness that perhaps the fellow was some kind of sexual athlete. Those fellows, Indian mystics and Jamaican ska singers and South American Marxist poets, all seemed to flock to the south of England to debauch high-born young English women. It seemed as though every few weeks he was hearing that the daughter of the twelfth Earl of something was temporarily not being invited to things because she was having it on with a Maasai warrior with great beaded gewgaws hanging from his ears. Jimmy glanced in the mirror again. This time he slouched to the left so that he could see himself in the foreground. He studied his beloved and familiar head, the shape of the nose and chin, and the complicated molding of the noble brow and above it the thin, blonde hair. When it was time for marriage, they would have to come to men like him, the last Englishman on earth. 
Jimmy was distracted when they all felt the subtle change in the air and the sudden drop in temperature signifying that the ocean was near. Are we there? asked Schaefer. No, said the Honorable Meg. This is just Southampton. Now we hurtle along the M27, then careen on to the A27 to Brighton. By the time we get there you'll feel as though you'd ridden a horse yourself. Are you a horseman, Michael? Peter Filching's voice carried some dim hope. Schaefer didn't like to remember the horse. He had been trapped in the barn at Carlo Balacantano's house, outside Saratoga. He had found himself beside a huge beast, all taut muscles, distrust, and outrage, because a smaller two-legged animal had slipped into its stall. The big white eyes had rolled in their sockets, and the long face had swung around, the nostrils frantically twitching and sucking in deep breaths, as it prepared to hammer him against the wall of the stall with its iron-clad hooves. He had opened the gate, clambered onto the big animal's back, cut the rope, and clung to it as it shot out of the warm building and across the pasture over the thin blanket of snow, then flew over a fence. The pair of them had been combined into a single mass of terror and energy, his own fear of being shot by Bala's soldiers merging with the beast's fear of everything and everybody, and his fear of being thrown to the frozen ground from this heightened speed working to spur the horse's fear that it couldn't run fast enough to free itself of the vile creature clutching its back and mane. Then, unaccountably, the horse had come to a stop at the second fence, some dim and cloudy memory reminding it that on the other side was the road, which it feared more than the night, the cold, or the intruder on its back. He had slid off and muttered, "'Thanks for the ride, you big stupid bastard,' and slipped through the fence into the darkness, while Bala's men were still fishtailing their big Cadillacs down the icy driveway to intercept his non-existent car on the road. Months later, when he was already in England, he had read that one of Carl Bala's horses had won a big race in Florida. He had always thought it might be this one— it had been granted brief fame not because it won the race, but because by then it was the property of the Internal Revenue Service. They had attached Bala's visible assets during the murder trial, but by then it had been too late for even the IRS to reclaim the entry fee, so they'd had to let the horse run. Not me, Schaefer said. I haven't been on a horse since the pony rides when I was a kid. How about you? The car sped along the highway, floating past other vehicles as though they were laboring against a thicker medium, like water. "'We don't keep horses any more,' said Peter regretfully. The conversation became intermittent and tentative, as conversations involving Michael Schaefer often were. There were always questions that required answers about his life before Bath, or that might reveal something about his education, income, or past acquaintances. Schaefer was quick and responsive, but his mind always seemed to be full of observations about the present. He never introduced the past, except as a way of prompting someone to talk and thus divert attention away from Michael Schaefer. Meg sidled into the void as they reached the outskirts of Brighton. Michael needs a Baedeker tour. He's never been to Brighton before. The two men in the front seat were silent. All right, then, she said. I'll do my best. They cruised slowly past the royal pavilion. Its vaguely Arabic spires and domes made Schaefer think of Disneyland, but Meg supplied the commentary. The Prince Regent built this as a playhouse, where he could get away from it all. Which prince? asked Michael. He had accepted his responsibility to feign interest. Later he was George the Fourth, but all his friends built houses here too, and that was the start of the carnival mess you see around you. What you can't see is in the palace, the reason why Peter and I have always been so close, like brother and sister almost. We have, said Peter Filching. I wasn't aware. You know, the mock oriental bed in the red bedroom. To Michael, she said, most of the place was refurnished in Regency furniture from the royal collection, but that bed was bought by the National Trust from my father only ten years ago. It used to be in the family digs in Yorkshire, but it was moved to Bath during some massive house-cleaning a couple of generations ago. I was conceived on it, and I've always suspected Peter was, too. My father probably felt guilty. Nonsense, 
Peter protested. Jimmy Pinchason coughed and cleared his throat. I think I'll drive up and let you two out right at the track. Peter and I will put the Bentley where they won't crash a lorry full of horse fodder into it, and then catch up. He pulled the big car over into a crowd of pedestrians, letting them grab each other and sidestep to avoid the gleaming machine's inexorable progress into their midst. Once out of danger, they glared into the dark windows impotently. That won't be necessary, said Meg. I'm a very good walker, and I wore sensible shoes. I insist, said Jimmy. He glanced at the silent filching. I really do. Meg opened the door and stepped out onto the grass. Come on, Michael. We'll go tell the horses what we want them to do. Schaefer got out of the car and stood beside her as the vehicle resumed its deadly progress through the crowd. Your story offended him. Peter, don't worry. As soon as he's served his time as the monk of Bath and his father frees his trust fund, he'll return to Babylon and tell the story himself, after altering it to his taste. I've always done this to him. I wonder if anyone will believe it. He doesn't have the conviction I have, but they might, she said. He noticed that she was assessing him as though she were trying to decide how far she could push him. I taught him to lie when we were children, just in case I wanted him later as a lover. Beside the grandstand, several small wooden structures had been erected that were not much more than desks with awnings. They looked as though they had been clapped together in haste, but the apparent age of the wood argued that they had been assembled on the grass for the races and carted off each season for generations. The awning over one of them bore a printed sign that read, B. Baldwin, Turf Accountant. When the Bentley had knifed its way into the crowd, Mr. Baldwin had grinned and displayed the peculiar arrangement of his teeth, which were straight and even, but had small, regular spaces between them, as though they had once belonged to a much smaller person. In fact, they had. Mr. Baldwin, a man in his forties, whose face had already acquired a permanent wizened squint, still had his baby teeth. The others had never grown in to displace them, and when he'd had his jaw x-rayed, he had learned that he was the victim of a minor genetic disorder. One theory expressed by the scientific minds around the betting circuit was that he was so greedy he couldn't bear to give up anything he had. But another theory that gained more popular credence was that Baldwin was like a shark, growing row after row of sharp little teeth, each row moving forward to replace the last as he wore them out on the victims of his veracity. Baldwin's grin caused the two men with him to follow his gaze to see what was causing the commotion. They saw the beautiful girl get out of the Bentley and listened to Baldwin's appraisal. I'd give five hundred pounds. For one of her earrings, said Mac Tellerese. That's a roll she just got out of. His name was Mario, but nobody called him that any more, except his relatives. One of them was his uncle, Tony Tellerese, whom he called Uncle Antonio with the greatest humility and a hint of gratitude. Uncle Antonio lived in New Jersey, but he had managed to get young Mario a chance to make his bones as a soldier for the Carpaccio brothers, two entrepreneurs who were trying to establish a business in England. Some day Uncle Antonio hoped his nephew would wear Savile Row suits and carry a briefcase in a two-hundred-year-old building where he would manipulate the computers and fax machines Antonio thought of as the instruments of power, buying and selling and controlling the immense flow of cash that would be coming from America. The money would be translated into investments of incalculable value and unassailable strength. But first Mario would need a few years to make himself into the man who could do it. He needed the experience that would make him different from the other men in tailor-made suits in the old gleaming offices. He had to know without faltering what he would do when a man tried to avoid him on the day his loan was due what he would do when one of his hookers withheld a portion of her earnings, what he would do when a rival appeared to be surpassing him. He had to know that when the time came, he would not hesitate to act with force and certainty. He had to know where all that money came from. Now Mario saw something that struck him as the greatest good luck. The man who had emerged from the Rolls-Royce looked familiar. Mario couldn't remember his name— but at home they would sure as hell remember. 
He was the hired specialist who had gone crazy years ago and whacked all those guys. He had killed even Mr. Castiglione, who must have been eighty at the time, living like a withered emperor in a fortress on a man-made oasis outside Las Vegas. Mario considered how to use his good luck. He could call his uncle Antonio on the telephone and tell him what he had seen. But then his uncle would be the one who would get the credit. He would put a couple of men on a plane. If Mario could just handle this himself, take a careful grasp of the good luck so that it wouldn't slip through his fingers, he could take years off his apprenticeship. Somebody would hear about it and elevate him to a place of respect that was rare for a man of his years, and free him from dependence on the meager patronage of his conservative uncle. Mario took inventory of the assets at his command. There was Luki, the young Sicilian, who was making the rounds with him. Luki had been a waiter in a small, dirty London restaurant that the Carpaccio brothers owned. They had brought him here from Sicily and given him a job to pay off some debt they owed someone through the complex and prehistoric accounting system they carried in their heads. Luki still dressed like a waiter in tight black pants and loose, bloused white shirts with ancient stains on them, and he walked like a woman. But Mac also had Bert Baldwin. See the guy with her? asked Mac. He's somebody we want. When he had said it, he felt a wave wash over him. It was as though he could feel a huge infusion of heat pump into his blood. What if he were wrong? He had seen him only once, by chance, and he had been a kid then. What do you mean you want him? asked B. Baldwin. Does he owe you money? Mac gritted his teeth in fierce urgency. He's a psycho, so we have to be careful. And I think he had two guys with him in the rolls. B. Baldwin squinted at him. After a moment he was satisfied that he understood, and thought he might be able to wrest something significant out of this. After all, he had been the one who had pointed the victim out, or at least seen the bird, and that was the same thing, wasn't it? Well, good luck to you. I've got a lot to do before the first race if I'm going to pay after the last one. Mac clutched his arm. This is bigger than that. It's bigger than a hundred damned races. If we get him, I'll pay the Carpaccios myself. When he saw Baldwin's saw-toothed smile, the wave washed over him again. He remembered that he had no idea how much Baldwin actually owed the Carpaccio brothers. The two Sicilians kept everything in their heads, and told him how much he and Luki were supposed to collect from each of their fish. They didn't even let him carry it. Luki was supposed to deliver it, and they talked to him in rapid, low-voiced Italian that only a native-born Sicilian could understand. He still didn't know if he was in charge and Luki was his bagman, or if Luki was in charge and he was sent along only because Luki's English was so bad. But it didn't matter now, because he was going to make his bones on the butcher's boy. Baldwin winked and nodded to a man in the crowd Mac recognized as a pickpocket. The man sauntered over to the booth, and while Baldwin handed him his stack of betting slips, Mario turned to Luki and searched his memory for the Italian words. It's a question of honor. This man has acted like an animal. In fact, Mario had only a vague idea of what the butcher's boy had done, except that he had somehow managed to kill a large number of men, and at the same time get Carlo Balacantano convicted of one of the murders and Bala was still serving a life sentence for it, and sending embarrassingly inflammatory reminders through channels to the outside. Mario watched Luki's face as he exhausted his vocabulary. He violated hospitality, threw loyalty out the window, and made my uncle ashamed. Luki's eyes flickered in a faint reaction. Mac hoped that something in his stammered litany had meant something. See. Si said Luki quietly. The Carpaccio brothers had not brought Luki to England to save him from the endemic poverty of Sicily, but from a sudden manhunt launched by the National Police in Rome. When he had killed the banker Giovanni Parla in his bathtub, it had been to expunge an insult Parla's grandfather had committed against Luki's grandmother before Luki's father was born. 
And since Luki's father had died attaching an oversensitive pipe bomb to a parlor automobile, Luki had not felt he could honorably stop there. After he had left Parla bleeding to death in the bathroom, he had gone to the other rooms of the house and killed the wife and two children. Now, he said in English, How do you want it done? 3. Meg pulled Schaefer into the stands and sat him down in the center near the bottom. Okay, Michael, let's appraise these horses. My system is to ascertain which are the tallest, and then place large wagers that they'll win. Schaefer stared out at the broad green lawn. There were a few horses being exercised on the track, which was little more than a white railing cordoning off a portion of the expanse of grass that stretched from the road to the hills where buildings began. It wasn't like American tracks, which were almost like freeways for horses, bordered by huge concrete structures for crowds of betters, electronic tally boards, and the subterranean bunkers where money was pushed through windows and machines pumped out tickets. He liked it. Things in England always seemed to him faintly amateurish. I wonder what's keeping the others. Jimmy's always been like that about parking. He cares about machinery. Have I ever told you that's something I like about you? You don't care at all about machines. Are you sure you haven't offended Peter? Positive. She turned to him and gave him her most enigmatic smile. It looked so open and guileless that he knew it was a practiced artifice. When we were young, he talked me into taking off my clothes, one garment at a time, of course. He took Polaroid pictures of me. I could see that I was beautiful from the first ones, and I got rather caught up in the whole thing, mainly from the pleasant surprise and narcissistic curiosity. So I kept unbuttoning things further, and letting the cloth slip lower to reveal a little more. When there was nothing left to take off, I found I wanted to see myself from angles I hadn't seen. Peter still has the pictures, I'm sure. I was just reminding him that I remember, too. Why do you tell these stories? Schaefer asked. Because it should have happened, she answered. Or something should have. Something shameful and scandalous. In fact, we were a sad gangling lot, with running noses who were lonely and bored and cold most of the time, but were afraid to speak to each other. It would have been nice if something had happened, and if I tell it that way, it will make it seem true. Who does it hurt? No one. I'm going to find them. What on earth for? So when we want to go home, they'll allow us in the car. He stepped carefully down the wooden bleachers, then made his way through the people on the ground. As he had since he was young, he avoided looking straight into their eyes when he moved past them, always looking at the place where he would be after a few steps. In the street, he turned in the direction Jimmy had taken when he had let them out of the Bentley. A small feeling of discomfort lodged in his throat as he scanned the straggling trail of men and women strolling through the track. In the years since he had gotten off the airplane at Heathrow carrying a passport in the name of Charles F. Ackerman, he had come to depend on an orderly sequence of events that could have passed for a sense of decorum and conformity. He had an instinctive dislike of walking toward a large herd of people, presenting his face for each of them to notice and wonder about. When at last he saw the Bentley, it was parked at the curb under an ancient walnut tree. Already the black skins of nuts had specked the mirror finish, and a couple of leaves were plastered on the windshield. Jimmy Pinchason was an idiot. If the car was so important to him, he should at least have parked it in the open. He walked to the car, stopped, and looked around him. If they had come this far, why hadn't he passed them on the way? He squinted to see through the smoked glass, and froze. He could dimly see Pinchason and Filching inside the car. Pinchason was lying on his side in the front seat, as though he had simply toppled over. Filching was lying face down in the back seat, and his pant legs had ridden up to his calves. Someone had dragged him by the ankles to his present position. From the quantities of blood that had seeped into pools on the leather seats and the floor, he judged that their throats had been cut. 
He straightened, looked to the right up the street and to the left down the street to see that no cars were coming, then started across. The steady stream of people kept coming, a little faster because the races were about to begin, and now he looked at them differently, staring into their eyes, searching for a sign of recognition. All his old habits came back automatically. At a glance he assessed their posture and hands. Was there a man whose fingers curled in a little tremor when their eyes met? A woman whose hand moved to rest inside her handbag? He knew all the practical moves and involuntary gestures, and he scanned everyone, granting no exceptions. He and Eddie had done a job like this one when he was no more than twelve. Eddie had dressed him for baseball, and had even bought him a new glove to carry folded under his arm. When they had come upon the man in the crowd, he hadn't even seen them. His eyes were too occupied in studying the crowd for danger to waste a moment on a little kid and his father walking home from a sandlot game. As they passed the man, Eddie had touched the boy's arm, and he had opened the webbing of the glove so that Eddie could pluck out the pistol with the silencer attached to it. Eddie then turned and put a round behind the man's ear. He remembered the man taking another step and then toppling forward to the sidewalk. As Eddie hustled him away, he had heard people saying something about heart attacks and strokes. Bystanders had made way for them, apparently feeling sorry that Eddie's little boy had seen some stranger at the moment when a vessel in his brain exploded. Schaefer felt his pulse beginning to settle down now. In the first glance into the parked car, he had known it all as though he had seen it happen. His mind hadn't raced through a series of steps or shuffled through the possible implications of the sight to his own survival. In an instant, he had been jerked back ten years to the old life. Somebody had spotted him. They never forgot, and they never stopped looking. Mac Talarese leaned his back against the side of the courier shop and tried to catch his breath. He looked at Lukey with horrified awe. The little waiter had turned out to be something else, and Mario was not entirely comforted by what he had seen. Mario and Baldwin had come up on the driver and the bodyguard from the front of the car as the driver eased the big rolls into the curb. Mario had formulated a notion of taking the two of them somewhere and shooting them. But then Luki came up on the right side of the car behind the driver, and his right hand appeared from behind his thigh, and there was a gravity knife already open. And the hand went inside the open window, and when Luki drew it back it was bloody. Then Luki had the back door open and was inside the car doing the other one. The man had managed to clamber into the back seat and unlatch the door, but Luki was already on him. He was already dead when Luki grasped his ankles and hauled him back inside. Then the little Sicilian walked casually ahead of Mario and Baldwin back toward the racetrack. But Tellarese had caught the look on Luki's face as their eyes met. When Mario was a child on Long Island, his dog had caught the scent of a rabbit in the field and run off after it, interpreting Mario's calls as some kind of exhortation to greater speed. Then the dog had brought the broken, limp thing back with him in his mouth, his eyes looking proud and hopeful, returning for the approval he knew he had earned. Lukey's eyes had looked like that. Baldwin leaned close to Mario as they followed Lukey. Ferocious little bastard, isn't he? Dolorese nodded. Lukey was dangerous. He was something Mario had never anticipated. A throwback. A Sicilian like the ones who had gotten off the boat at Ellis Island before the First World War. Lean, cunning, ambitious, and utterly without compunction or reluctance. Mario decided to let the implications of his discovery wait until the day was over. He was operating on his own already. The Carpaccio brothers would have no idea who the man was. When it was over, Mario would be the only one in a position to take advantage of the accomplishment, and he would be transported to the United States and raised to the heights appropriate to young men who had initiative and decisiveness. Lukey would be a fond memory. Come on, Mario said. Now that he can't leave, he's ours. He walked out from the side of the shop onto the street, and he could hear the other's footsteps following. He didn't look back. He concentrated only on moving through the crowds of people toward the race course where the butcher's boy—Jesus, that was the best part— 
he must be forty by now, would be sitting in the grandstand with his girlfriend, never suspecting that the forces he had set in motion years ago had already stripped him of his soldiers and cut off his only means of escape. It was like that Shakespeare play they made everybody read in tenth grade. The bastard felt like a king, sitting there in the sunshine with a woman who wore the kind of jewelry a queen might have. Well, today was the day that Burnham Wood was coming to Dunsinane. The trees were closing in on the bastard. Mario smiled and felt an impulse to say something about it to the others, but of course it would have been pointless. Baldwin was English, but probably hadn't made it to the tenth grade, and Lukey wouldn't even know who Shakespeare was. Margaret Holroyd was fighting disappointment. She looked out across the field to where the beautiful horses were being steadied and reassured by jockeys and trainers. They were festooned with silks in gorgeous, gaudy colors, and the jockeys wore oddly clashing combinations, probably cut from the same ten bolts. They were so far away that she could see very little except the tiny spots of emerald, pink, crimson, and gold. What in the world was she going to do without Michael? He had been gone for only ten minutes, and already she missed him and was feeling angry with him. She couldn't go on playing with him much longer. Soon she would begin to get little wrinkles at the corners of her eyes, like Aunt Caroline, and then she would have to be responsible and act as though she'd never had a time like this in her life. There already was no doubt that she could change, and this was a sign, too. Not so long ago she wouldn't have believed she could. People would have recognized the hypocrisy immediately and laughed about it. But now she was perfectly competent to carry it off. What a shame. If she had been at home now, she decided, she would have spent the afternoon in the big leather chair by the library window, wallowing in poetry, probably Ubi Sunt poems. Où sont la neige d'antan? And she would have let the bright afternoon sun deep into amber, then darker and darker shades of blue, as the light slowly dimmed the page and finally left her in darkness, a little rehearsal for getting old and dying. No, she wouldn't, she admitted. It was a lie. She stood up and stepped quickly and recklessly down the steps to the grass. It felt good on her open toes, a little damp and tickly, and there was Michael already. He was striding quickly toward her as though he wanted to head her off and say something before she wandered away to the loo or the betting booths. Well, fine, she thought. She was perfectly willing to be distracted from whatever she would have found to pass the time. When he reached her, he didn't stop walking, just took her arm and swept her along. She kept up with him, conducted smoothly by a gentle pressure that changed directions subtly, telling her where to go. "'I was getting bored,' she said. His face was empty, and he was looking ahead as they walked. "'Don't talk, just listen.' We've got to get out of here right now. Some people are here to kill us. He looked at her for a second. It sounded impersonal, as though he had overheard a weather report. What is it? she whispered. The IRA? Schaefer didn't understand the question at first. Even after all the years in England, the whole endless bitter struggle had remained as remote to him as the wars in Lebanon or Mozambique or El Salvador. People had talked at dinners about the Irish question, and he'd only been puzzled by what they thought the question was. No, he said after a moment. She certainly would know more about it than he did. It's my problem, but I'm sure they've seen you. Are you trying to make me feel silly because I told you stories? No, he said. There was no change in his expression. He was still staring at the people they passed. In spite of her resolve not to be duped, she began to feel afraid. It was impossible, she told herself. Here they were, walking along in the middle of a huge gathering of perfectly respectable people on a sunny afternoon in Brighton. Working women and clerks in London shops loaded their children onto the train and took them here to toss pebbles into the sea and eat the dreadful candy. But then she made the mistake of reaching to gather more evidence to bolster her cause, and thought about Michael Schaefer. She knew nothing about him except what he had said. 
A cold feeling settled in her stomach. She had somehow gone too far, foolishly straight across some invisible line, and now she was on the other side of it, wishing she could scramble back. But she was already too far away, sinking with this man into some horror. She felt small and weak, and the world was sharp-edged and full of eyes watching her. When Michael led her around the stands and up the road toward the city, she had a moment of relief. Are Peter and Jimmy bringing the car? They're dead, he answered. It hit her senses like a loud, sharp noise, and she felt herself fall another step downward into the horror, as though her foot had slipped on a ladder before she stopped herself. When she did, she was surprised by her thought. Well, I'm alive. What it meant she didn't know, but it reassured her in some simple-minded way. After a moment she realized it had been a question, and since nobody had contradicted her, she began to feel stronger. They walked along the road until they came to a row of curio shops. There were five of them, and the windows seemed to contain crowded troves of identical china souvenirs, postcards, and embroidered placemats, all having to do with the seashore at Brighton. When Michael didn't go inside the first shop or the second, it occurred to her that whatever was after them was too big for that. It wouldn't wait, foiled by the simple ploy of hiding in a shop while they ordered a taxi on the proprietor's telephone. It would roll over them like a tide, not delayed at all by the fear that the old ladies buying china would see it. The thought crossed her mind that Michael was being pursued by the police, but he had said some people are here to kill us, and the Brighton police didn't do that. They lived in the same world she did. They tipped their hats and gave people directions. When the bomb had gone off in Mrs. Thatcher's hotel, they had expressed the same surprise and distress that Margaret had felt. They didn't think in those terms either. Michael led her down a long passage between the second and third shops. The buildings were so tall and close she could feel that the sunlight never fell here. The air was cool and damp and dark, and the stone foundations had a tracing of deep green moss up to where the clapboards began. At the end of the passage Michael stopped. He put his hand on her shoulder, and she felt affection for him. But then he surprised her by grasping the shoulder strap of her purse and slipping it off. He stepped forward into the sunlight, and she saw the white flash. It was a man's arm, and it had a white sleeve on it, and the hand was in a fist. It punched at Michael, fast and hard, like a piston. But Michael had somehow known it was going to do that. He clutched her purse in both hands and caught the punch on it. Then it was all too fast. He had already wrapped the shoulder strap around the white arm, and now he tugged with all his strength. She saw the man dragged across the entrance of the passage. He was thin and dark, and his hand was still in a fist, but somehow stuck on her purse. There was a strange, alert look on his face as he passed, and for that instant his eyes seemed to stare down the passage at her. She heard three distinct noises, hollow and sharp, like a croquet mallet hitting a ball. Then she heard a scraping sound, as though something were being dragged on the ground along the back of the next shop. Michael reappeared. Now he was sweating, and his hair was hanging in his eyes. He had her purse, and he jerked a knife out of the side of it, and hung it on her shoulder. He swept his hair back with his hand. She looked at his face, but there was no expression she could identify as fear or remorse or disgust, which amazed her because she could still hear the three cracks and knew that they had been the sound a man's head made when it was broken on concrete. Michael was already thinking about something ahead of them in time or space, like a cricket batsman anticipating where the bowler was going to throw the ball. She turned and took a step back toward the other end of the passage. She was ready to run now, her heart pounding in her chest. They would have to get out of this dark place, and she was willing to keep up with him by running as fast or as hard as he wanted her to. But his hand shot out and held her arm. She looked into his eyes, but they weren't looking at her. He only shook his head and pushed her back against the wall. Then she could tell it was too late. She heard the footsteps of a man running, and Michael was tensing his muscles, his knees bent a little, one foot ahead of the other, his arms out from his sides. 
Mario stopped running when he saw the legs protruding from the space between the third and fourth stores. Luki had done it. The little bastard had stalked the man behind the buildings and cut another throat, and this was the one that counted. Mario was going to be rich. He was going home. He fought an impulse to turn and go back to the street. This was the time when he would have to control himself, if he never had to again. He looked around for Luki and felt a little tingle of annoyance. The nasty little faggot could be anywhere. Then Mario remembered the girl. Something occurred to him, and he began to sweat. There was no question that Luki had gone off after the girl. But what if he was that kind of psycho, too? He might be doing something to her, something that Mario didn't want to think about. He decided that the revulsion was something else he would have to control. These few minutes were the ones that were going to make all the difference for the rest of his life. Nobody back home was going to take his word that he had done this. He had to have something to carry away from here that proved he had found the butcher's boy and killed him. He didn't have much time. He walked toward the body. As he passed the opening between the first two stores, then the next one, he turned his face away and moved faster. If people passing on the street happened to see him, they saw nothing. He controlled the impulse to go back to the front of the stores and look for Baldwin on the street. Now he was close enough to see the legs clearly. His mind took inventory. Black shiny shoes, black tight pants. Luki! Then he heard a footstep behind him. He reached inside his coat for the pistol, but then abandoned the intention because an arm was already around his neck. In the instant before consciousness left him, he felt a sharp pain move up under his ribs toward his heart. B. Baldwin strolled along the sidewalk in front of the shops, using his peripheral vision to peer into them and around them as he went. He had seen the little Dago go around the corner to check behind them, and he calculated that Mac T. would be covering any spillover onto the side street. When he had come to the race course today, he had been in a foul humor. He had known that they would show up before the sixth race to see how much cash he had taken in before he could chance handing it off. The life of a debtor was something he wasn't accustomed to, and he hated it. To owe money was to place everything at someone else's disposal, from your betting booth to your spectacles. But to owe money to the Carpaccios was to sell yourself into slavery. You couldn't decide to take a day off and go to London instead of working the football outings, because that night they would send someone to pick up the rake-off. Until they had their money, you were theirs. But Baldwin's mood had brightened considerably since then. Young Mackie T. had spoken without asking for numbers. B. Baldwin was going to be his own man again, a man with a debt of eight thousand pounds that was about to vanish. Baldwin kept his hand in his coat pocket as he walked, running his fingers along the big sailor's clasp knife that he carried there. He had bought it years ago in a pawn shop in Southampton, and had it sharpened like a razor, and then spent hours taking the tarnish off the blade with jeweler's rouge. It shone like a sliver of mirror now. A man who used his knife would have tried to darken the blade, but Baldwin didn't worry about an opponent seeing the sudden reflection in his hand. He didn't use his knife. He would just sit facing a man across a table and open it to clean his nails or idly scrape the dirt off the sole of his shoe. He would watch the man's face and try to catch a bit of sunlight on the blade so that a flash of the reflection would hit his eye. That sort of thing worked with the small shopkeepers and restaurant help who made up his usual clientele. Baldwin had once thought of himself as a man ready for anything, but time and a few blows with heavy objects had made him calm and helped him to find his natural niche in the hierarchy of the universe. He was a predator, but too small to take in everything he wanted in one bite. Time gave a man's luck a chance to kick in. He was beginning to wonder if Mackie and the little ferret had simply done their work behind the shops and run off. It wouldn't do for B. Baldwin to be found standing here, not fifty yards away, with a razor-sharp sailor's knife in his pocket— not with his previous life history. 
The police would see him as a gift from heaven, and he suspected they wouldn't be above giving his knife a little dip in the gore to make sure the gift wasn't taken away. He sauntered by the first passageway, then sidestepped into it without missing a step. He moved quietly down the space between the buildings toward the light, feeling a little disappointed in young Mac Talarese. Taking off and leaving a man on the scene was something that just wasn't done. It was probably his own fault for involving himself with foreigners who didn't know any better, but it was going to be his last time, he swore. Unless it was Packies, who were for all practical purposes Englishmen with black faces. B. Baldwin would just take a quick peek to be sure the bodies were there, then go back to work. When he reached the end of the passage, he heard a sound. He knitted his brows and held his place, listening. It wasn't loud enough for a struggle, just a single footfall somewhere in the courtyard behind the shops. Baldwin took his knife out of his pocket and opened it. Could they have walked right past the victim and his woman? Could they still be hiding in the shadows between the next two shops? Well, if, when he stepped into the light, Mackie and a little rat terrier were busy going through the dead woman's purse and taking the diamond studs out of her ears, he would lose nothing by having the great gleaming knife in his hand. It would make them feel he had been one of them, in on it from the beginning and still ready at the end. Baldwin crouched low and leaped out of the passageway, his eyes taking in the scene at once. There was the man— kneeling over Mac Talarese's bloody corpse where it lay on the ground. His hand was in the coat pocket. The man looked up at Baldwin, and his face brought Baldwin very bad news. It showed no fear or anger, and worst of all, no surprise. The eyes weren't looking at him to size him up as an opponent in a knife fight. They were aiming. The man's hand was on its way up from Mackie Talarese's chest, and there was Mac's little black pistol in it. B. Baldwin noted this with displeasure, but his mind troubled him no longer, because by then the bullet was already bursting through the back of his skull, bringing with it bone fragments, blood, and even a tiny bit of the brain tissue that might have cared. The shot was too much for Margaret. She sprang out into the sunlight in time to see Michael pressing the gun into the hand of the dead man on the ground. The shot had been loud in the passageway, and it still rang in her ears. It seemed to propel her forward, as though it were still sounding behind her. Michael stood up and took her arm, not slowing her momentum at all, just guiding her in the direction she wanted to go. She was barely aware of him now. She was only thinking about putting space between herself and what lay back there. She wanted to run, and he let her, the cloudy sense of the design of the city she carried in her memory taking her across the courtyard to the next passage between two houses and along a quiet lane away from the ocean and toward the royal pavilion. Then he stopped her. Do you know where the train station is? She nodded. Go there. 4. In Alexandria, Virginia... Elizabeth Waring Hart stirred in her sleep and opened her eyes. She waited for the whisper to come out of the darkness again. She lifted her head a little from her pillow so that she could hear with both ears, and stared into the shadows near the door for a shape that she hoped wouldn't remind her of a man. Her muscles were rigid, held in tension more to keep her from moving than because she had any way of fighting or any place to run to in her closed second-floor bedroom. Then she realized that she had already given a name to the voice she had heard, and the name made it impossible that there was a voice. It was Dominic Palermo, and he had been dead for ten years. She collapsed back on the pillow and let him come back, and the room in the Las Vegas hotel came back with him. When she had awakened that night, it was dark, but she'd had the disconcerting feeling that she was already late for something. It was a feeling of urgency— Something had begun, and she was still in bed. It was then that she had heard the knock on the door, and knew that it had been going on for some time. She turned on the light, but it hadn't helped, and she had put on her bathrobe and slipped the standard-issue thirty-eight police special into its pocket, but that hadn't helped either, because she had been a novice in those days, 
and the Justice Department had hired and trained her to analyze information that might result in a trial, not to shoot people. But she had opened the door, thinking somehow, with sleepy logic, that if people were banging on her door at four-thirty in the morning it had to be urgent, and nobody she didn't know who had urgent business would bring it to her. And there he was, standing in the hallway, and that was when she had heard the whisper. He had said, You're Elizabeth Waring, and then said, Please, can I come in? This was the sound that haunted her now. It was the saddest sound in the whole world, a man saying, I'm dying out here, let me in. Now the rest of him came back, too. The way he looked, his dark hair beginning to turn gray, the wide shoulders made less menacing by the big belly, the big sad brown eyes protesting that he didn't deserve this. For Christ's sake, look at me, he had said. I weigh two-thirty and I'm five-eight. I'm over fifty years old. For the last twenty years I've cleared over two hundred thousand a year. Do I look like somebody who takes on wet jobs? Hell, they hired somebody to do that. A specialist. Even then, Elizabeth had instinctively understood that what he had told her was immensely important, already more important than anything else about Dominic Palermo. The specialist was the one the Justice Department wanted, the one who would know things. She tried to prompt Palermo. But we don't know what to do about a professional like that. Look at all the assassinations. We can't protect you from that kind of killer unless we know who he is, or at least what to look for. Palermo shook his head solemnly. He said, Jesus, you must think I'm stupid pulling that on me. The specialist? Shit, him I'd give you for free if I could. Problem is, I can't. I never saw him, and I don't even know his name. When they talked about him, they just called him the butcher's boy. She remembered what she had said. Nice name. Yeah, said Palermo. Isn't it? He was trying to make it sound sarcastic. Look at the sort of thing I have to put up with. But he couldn't carry it off at four-thirty in the morning, still talking in a whisper because he was afraid. And that was what she was feeling now. It was Nicky Palermo's fear. He had died of it. Nobody would ever have said it that way, but it was true. He had gotten scared enough to decide in the middle of the night to be a witness for the Justice Department, and the only way he could think of to go about it was to turn himself in to the agent who had been visible serving papers and taking depositions that week. Only he couldn't know that the agent had been visible not by accident but by choice and foresight, because Justice Department thinking at the time was that the only agent on the case whose anonymity was expendable was the one who shouldn't have been in the field in the first place, Elizabeth Waring. And this had killed him. Not the man he was so afraid of, but his own friends. Because he had talked, and she couldn't protect him. Nobody would have said it, but she knew it and Nicky Palermo knew it, even though he had been dead for ten years now, and was not even a ghost, but an uncomfortable memory. Elizabeth sat up and turned on the light beside her bed. It was four-thirty again, only now it was Alexandria, Virginia, and Las Vegas was a long time ago. She looked over at Jim's empty side of the bed. It was four-thirty, the coldest, darkest hour out of every twenty-four, and Nicky Palermo was dead, and her husband was dead, and her career was dead. No, her capacity for having or wanting a career was dead. Next week, or a year from now, she would be going through it again. There would be a new office that was almost like the last because it was in the same huge building, and new people, some young and eager, and the others quietly and unofficially burned out but carrying too much rank to be randomly reassigned somewhere to fill in for a GS-7. There would be some new special problem the Justice Department thought it could solve with a crack task force. Stock fraud, or banks, or imported flea collars with so much poison in them that they made Rover roll over with convulsions, and Elizabeth Waring would volunteer for anything except organized crime. She listened to the baby monitor beside the bed. 
Above the static, she could hear Amanda breathing the slow, regular breaths of the innocent. Five. As the train added power, slowly clacking out of the station, Margaret sat stiffly, willing it to go faster. She timed her breaths to the precise moments when it passed the poles along the track, and found that she felt smothered until they were floating past too often to have anything to do with her breathing. Cautiously, she pretended to look out the window, but craned her neck to use the reflection to look at the other people in the car. In the very back were two elderly ladies in flowered dresses, who had raised a redoubt of oversized purses and shopping sacks to repel any smokers who might try to sit nearby. They were wisely returning from a morning at the shore early enough to miss the crowds of horse fanciers and gamblers, and be in their flats in time for tea. There were three young boys in the front who could be misidentified as representatives of the very element the old ladies intended to avoid. They had hair cropped in peculiar patterns of tufts and lawns like little dogs, and sported clothing of leather and denim held together with metal rivets. But they were well mannered, merely nudging one another at intervals and pointing out landmarks and milestones that were invisible to Meg. She guessed that these must have some significance in their lives, perhaps scenes of early exploits as they had widened their range away from Brighton and closer to London. Why are we going to London? She whispered. Schaefer studied her and acknowledged the injustice of it. She looked small and young. Her bright green eyes even greener because her pumping heart had brought more oxygen than she had ever breathed into her, and even now something hard and admirable was keeping her from going limp and grey from the shock. She had first approached him out of a sense of adventure and had stayed involved out of some notion that liveliness was better than torpor. But she hadn't signed on for this. It's the sensible thing to do, he answered. Most people leaving town will be going to London. And once we're there, they have to pick us out of millions of people. Of course, she said. I'm not sure that was what I meant to ask you. I was hoping you'd tell all, as they say. He thought about what had happened. She had come to his house this morning in the full and delighted confidence that she was the wildest creature in the little universe she inhabited. Now the walls had shattered, and let real monsters in. I'm sorry. He said, "I should never have let this happen. You were very brave." I'm trying to hold on to my sanity," she said quietly. "Michael, I can't even believe this is happening. Has happened. No, it's still happening, isn't it? I'm afraid, and I want to know if I'm just being weak or if I'm right to be afraid. Because in a minute, they're going to stop the train, drag us off, and... She stopped, and he could see her making a conscious effort to beat down the terrors that were spontaneously taking on specific shapes with hard, defined lines. She failed, but he could see she was holding them on one side of a line for the moment. Or will I always have to be afraid because it's never going to be over? Schaefer searched for something that would make sense to her. Sometimes in the newspapers you read that somebody in Parliament made a speech demanding that the warmonger Americans get out. Well, I guess I'm one of the ones they mean. It gave him a morbid fascination to watch her mind grab for this little bit of comprehensible nonsense, and clutch it to her. I should have known it, she said. I even thought about it, but I told myself there really weren't any such people, or any way that I'd never see them. CIA. What could you be but one of them? You move into a big old house all by yourself, and never talk about anything that could even begin to give anybody an idea of who you are or what you did before. In her mind's rush to gather evidence to support the lie, she had begun to forget that there were other people on the train. He put his hand on her forearm and moved his eyes toward the three boys at the front of the car. To answer your question, I think the bad part is over now. He whispered. We just have to be sure we aren't followed. Where are we going? Am I five? Your embassy? He shook his head. All of the obvious places will be under surveillance. We're on our own. He tried to remember which it was, in the cold or out of the cold. We're going to have to stay out in the cold for a while. Then he remembered that he would have to prepare for the future. 
or I am, anyway. One more thing, and I won't ask for any more secrets, she said. Those men weren't English, except maybe the last one. They looked like Italians. What has Italy got against you? He had to block that avenue of thought. They were Bulgarians. They probably came in from Yugoslavia across the Adriatic into Italy. That's the way they usually do it. They look the same, and lots of them speak the language. It's only a few miles. He was quoting a travel brochure he had seen once. An hour or so by boat on a calm, sunlit sea. Or was that Coleridge? Down to a sunless sea. He had been reading some of the books in the library of his house again, and it sounded familiar. He felt a small prickle of alarm. Books were a trap. If he accidentally quoted from one of them, she would recognize it. Her face retained its look of intense concentration. But why were they after us? After you? You were in Brighton only for the day, and even I didn't know he'd be there before this morning. He looked as puzzled as he could. That's something I've got to find out. I came to England ten years ago, and since then I've been in the deepest cover. Even the chief of station in London doesn't know. I'd say our troubles must have started in the United States. A mole, she said. A Bulgarian mole inside the CIA? He let his puzzlement turn to frustration. That's the hard part. There's no telling the nationality in a case like this. The information could have come to the KGB, and they may have passed it on to the Bulgarians in this area. She looked very sad. Poor Peter and Jimmy. They weren't up to this sort of thing at all. He stared out the window at the flat green countryside sweeping past, and strained for something to give her, like a present. I'm going to tell you something that's absolutely secret. Very few people even inside the Western intelligence community have heard it, and I'm not cleared by your government to be one of them. There's a special room inside a building near Whitehall. It's a big room in a basement, and outside the door there are always two sergeants of the Royal Marines, fully armed and at attention on two-hour shifts. Inside the room are hundreds of identical black velvet boxes with little gold plates on them, engraved with the names of the heroes of the secret wars. When a member of England's intelligence services does something spectacular, there's a quiet ceremony where he's given a medal. Because who he is and what he did must be kept secret, the medal is put inside the little velvet box and kept in trust by the government. But years later, when the man dies and the secret is no longer crucial to national security, the Queen invites his family to the palace for an audience and gives them the box. But it's not just for professionals. A lot of the boxes in that room are set aside for people like your friends, just regular citizens who maybe got involved by accident or performed some service when the need arose. For the moment, their families and friends are going to think that Jimmy and Peter were killed by robbers or something, whatever story the government puts out for the press. But some day they'll get a little printed invitation to come visit the Queen, and then they'll know. Margaret stared at him, and in her eyes he could see that she wanted to be able to tell the story, to go to Peter's sister or Jimmy's mother in some private room of the gigantic old country houses they lived in, and whisper the lie he had offered her. Then there was no telling where it would go, and he knew it wouldn't hold up. You've got to keep that to yourself, he said. If it ever got out, the Russians would do anything to get into that room and read the citations. The ones for the last fifty years, anyway. But you know, and now I know, she said. Michael, if I could just tell one or two people, and after all, it's their secret, theirs and mine, not yours. He wavered as he thought about her. If she told it, she would probably make up lots of details that would make it sound more authentic, but he couldn't chance it. It's a deep secret. None of them would ever have told an American, even one who's been here for years trying to protect their country. Then how do you know? He sighed as though he were giving in against his better judgment. A few years ago, a man from MI6 managed to get inside a Soviet communications post in Afghanistan. How that happened and how he got out, I can't get into. 
but he ended up with me. He'd seen some things. The specification plates on the equipment, written texts on the computer screens, and so on. The problem was he didn't speak Russian. He'd looked at them, but there was no way he could remember them because they meant nothing to him, just gibberish. His own people tried hypnotism, locking him in a sensory deprivation chamber, everything. But they knew that we'd experimented with certain drugs. I can't name them, but chemically there are several generations beyond truth serums. This Englishman came to my house and met a doctor we'd flown in from Langley. The doctor shot him up, and he started to draw. He drew for days. He drew the Russian letters he'd seen on the computer screens and made diagrams and maps. He saw everything all over again and traced it on paper. But he also started to talk. It was endless, compulsive talk about all kinds of things that he'd kept secret. He told me about sexual experiences, childhood lies, and things his parents hadn't caught him at. Secret fears and worries that he'd never resolved. It turned out he was from an old family that had been involved in British secrets for generations. The way it sounded, they were recruited by their fathers about the time they left Eton for Oxford, so they'd be sure to study hard and read the right books. Anyway, one thing he told me about was the room with the velvet boxes. When he'd been in the service only a few months, they called him in and showed him around. There were boxes in there for his father, who had helped crack some German code, and his great-grandfather, who had done something or other in the Boer War. And I think somebody was in for the Crimea. He kept raving on about the medals, the Victoria Cross, the Distinguished Service Order, and I don't know what else. The whole thing seemed to bother him a lot. At first I thought it was because, when he got the tour, he was so green. He couldn't have been more than twenty-two, and seeing all those medals made him think he could never amount to anything compared to all of his ancestors. After the drug wore off, I asked him about it, and he said that wasn't it. By now he had a few medals and citations in a box of his own. It was the secrets that bothered him. A lot of the things from a hundred years ago are still current. Secret family contacts in Russia and East Germany, for instance, that have been kept up for generations. If those got out... The Russians would have whole families put up against a wall. Things change on the surface, but not underneath in the world where spies live. It all seemed to him like a string that might unravel. If one thing came out, it could be traced to something else, and so on. But this is different, she muttered. What can it possibly hurt to give their families something to hold on to? It's not different, he said. Knowledge is dangerous. You'd be doing them no favors. He wondered if he had sounded ominous enough, but it made her stop asking, and he had to be satisfied with that. As the train rattled on toward London, he stared out at the grass and trees. He wondered if he detected in himself some annoyance at her for luring him out into the world where they could find him, but decided he did not. She had made such a small, innocent offer, and the consequences had been huge and abrupt. It wasn't even a problem she could have imagined. But now he had to work his way out. He had done exactly what he had promised himself he would never do. He had become lazy and comfortable and forgetful. It had been so stupid that it now struck him as a kind of miracle. For some time, maybe for years, he had kept up a few hollow rituals and observed a few minimal precautions. But it was only out of habit. He remembered a day nearly fifteen years ago in New York, when he had waited for a man named Danny Catano to come home from a night at the theater. He had sat in the dim light the man had left burning in the huge living room and contemplated the nature of human beings. This man no longer called himself Danny Catano. He had been an accountant for a friend of the Castiglione family in Chicago, changing a few dollars into apartment houses and putting particular people on the payroll as managers or handymen or gardeners. But one day Danny Catano had bought himself a BMW and paid for it in cash. Somehow the IRS had gotten curious about it because it had cost $60,000 that had not come through a bank account. Within a few days, Catano was sitting in a room somewhere that was full of men who could not afford BMWs, but were good enough at arithmetic to prove to Danny that he couldn't either. Years later, maybe seven, somebody had seen Danny Catano in New York. The Castiglione family, by now run by the son and his two sons, since the old man had retired to the southwest, 
had quietly made inquiries. It wasn't that he had done any real damage to the family reputation. The name had been famous since before the son was born. And the family friend had gotten off with a small fine and a wordy warning about fraudulent business practices and shady connections, because he had never been arrested before and had other friends besides the Castiglione's. But the Castiglione's were curious about the same thing that had attracted the IRS. The BMW that wasn't attributable to any of Danny Catano's personal bank accounts. Danny was a thief. A contract had been offered for Danny Catano as soon as he had disappeared. But it had produced no satisfaction. After he had been spotted, the Castiglione's had decided to hire a specialist. Schaefer had known that the Justice Department had some kind of agreement with Castoria College, which granted degrees to people on the basis of oral examinations given in courtrooms thousands of miles from its campus in New Hampshire. The government lawyers also gave their graduates false birth certificates and driver's licenses and social security numbers and then said goodbye and good luck. All he had to do was to keep checking Danny's mother's mailbox for a month to see that Danny was beginning to forget his troubles. About once a week there was an envelope from a brokerage in New York with a check in it. When he had gotten to New York, all he'd had to do was to pick up a little brochure the company put out advertising the qualifications of its brokers. Among the dozens of brokers who had gone to places that meant nothing to him, he found David Cutter, an honor graduate of Castoria. He had looked around the apartment a bit while he waited for David Cutter to come home. It was the sort of place that cost a million or more up front, and another half million that had to be paid to decorators, furniture dealers, and art galleries. In the antique writing desk he had found a pile of credit card receipts for expensive restaurants. He had been astounded. The man had even gone on a trip to the Bahamas a month before. People had a way of pushing things out of their minds, like the ones who built fancy houses in the floodplain of the Platte River, or on top of fault lines in California. It was a miracle that a man like David Cutter had lived as long as he had. He had gone to restaurants where he couldn't help but sit next to people who would do anything to gain favor with the Castiglione family. He had spent his days betting large sums of money for people, a lot of whom had gotten it in ways that must have brought them into contact with acquaintances of the Castiglione's. What did this man think? When he had made his reservations for the Caribbean, didn't he wonder who might be sitting next to him on the plane? Schaefer had looked in drawers and closets, bookcases and backlit cabinets, thinking about human folly. All the time he was planning. If ever in his life he had to disappear, he would submerge without a ripple and never come up again. He would never allow himself to become so comfortable and mentally lazy that he forgot he wasn't the man he was pretending to be. That night he had made the decision to begin the preparations for his own disappearance. He would put money in safe deposit boxes in towns he never visited. Often in his career he had found it prudent to use false names on credit cards and licenses. But now he would do it in earnest, start to build up a few identities and never use them, so that they would be old enough and deep enough on the day when somebody began to look for him the way he had looked for Danny Catano. Eddie Mastruski had raised him to abhor mistakes. It was better to stay home than to make a mistake. Better to pass up the money than to take a chance. The police could be as stupid as cattle, spend the day stumbling over their own feet. But in the evening, they could go home, pop open a beer, and sleep like stones. But people like Eddie and the boy got to make only one mistake. That was true of people like Danny Catano, too. Only Danny didn't seem to know it. He had accepted an identity as Cutter the stockbroker, and somehow he had forgotten that he wasn't Cutter the stockbroker. The money and respectability that protected people like Cutter couldn't protect him. Before he had satisfied his curiosity in the apartment, he had found Danny Catano's gun. It was hidden in a little pop-out compartment in the wall beside the bed. The gun was lying under a pile of gold cufflinks, a couple of watches, and some hundred-dollar bills. It would have taken Danny thirty seconds in bright light to fumble around for it. It looked as though it had been placed there a long time ago and forgotten. When he examined it, he found it hadn't even been cleaned and oiled lately. 
but he found it worked well enough when Danny Catano came home from the theater. The police told the reporters the next day that David Carter was a lesson to others. An unlicensed firearm was just as likely to be used by a burglar as by its owner. Now Schaefer wondered how he had forgotten about Danny Catano. He had managed to set aside enough money, and he had nurtured the identities until they had sufficient patina on them to obscure their flaws, but he hadn't done the rest of it. He had put off getting the plastic surgery, telling himself at first that he needed to get a feel for the country before he could be sure how to go about it. Surgery would involve spending a lot of time in London, being photographed and examined by doctors who might wonder why a man with perfectly regular features would want something expensive and painful done to him in a foreign country. Then later, when he had learned to move around comfortably in England and was confident he could have accomplished it, he had developed other reservations. People in Bath knew him by now, and would wonder why he would suddenly do such a strange thing. He had put it off so long the dangerous time was probably past. If anybody had traced him here, they would have gotten him by now. And certainly all that time must have changed him as much as surgery would. The truth was that hiding had made him reluctant to obliterate his face, because it was the last thing left that was part of who he really was. He had already destroyed or relinquished everything else. He would never have run out of excuses to put off the plastic surgery. For the first time, he understood Danny Catano. It was late afternoon. The southern outposts of London began to pass by the train, and brown brick buildings appeared that reminded him of the ride from Kennedy Airport through Queens. Then it struck him that the similarity wasn't the reason he had thought of it. He was going back. As the train pulled slowly into Victoria Station, he calculated. Assuming the police had found all five bodies by now and were questioning everybody at the racetrack, it would still take them a couple of hours to find out that the Bentley had stopped to let out a man and a woman. They would take still longer to satisfy themselves that the man and woman were no longer in Brighton, and that the only place that made any sense if they wanted to hide was London. Fingerprints didn't worry him. In spite of the nonsense the police put out for public consumption, not one of them in a hundred could lift a clear print from anything more textured than glass or metal. Neither he nor Meg had touched the windows, and Peter had opened the door for them. And if they had idly grasped the door handles, the killers would have touched them afterward and probably wiped the surfaces off before they left. His mind was already working its old, habitual, methodical way through the traps and snares. He turned to her as they stood up, careful to keep his face turned away from their companions on the train. Keep looking out the window. You said nobody knew we were going there today. That's right. I met them on the way to your house. They saw me on the street and told me when they'd picked us up. He assessed the damage as they walked across the platform toward the gigantic enclosure of the station. It wasn't so bad, really. If the police were lazy or stupid, it was nothing at all. Their professional habit of seizing upon the most easily comprehensible explanation would make them overlook things that didn't fit. They would assume a gang of thieves had murdered two wealthy citizens, then quarreled over whatever they had found in the bodies or in the Bentley. There would be no telling what that was, because somebody in the gang must have lived, and he would have carried it away with him. That part was inevitable. No matter how much they wanted to, the police would not be able to convince themselves that three men who had died of a broken skull, a knife up under the ribs, and a bullet fired from five yards out had not required the services of at least one person who hadn't been found on the scene. But even that much would take them a few more hours, because before they could commit themselves, they would have to go over everything with tape measures and cameras and sketch pads. And they would bring with them the assumptions that would make their efforts a waste of time because all the time they would be preparing to look for the missing man among the local street thieves, not among the acquaintances of the two wealthy victims in the Bentley. Just as he had at Brighton, he made Meg stay in the ladies' restroom while he bought the tickets. He had to get her out of here without letting more than a few people see them together. He waited at the most crowded ticket window, then all he said was, Bath, too, to hide his accent, and took the tickets without looking at the man inside. They met again and stood a few yards apart on the platform just before the train was to leave, and boarded separately as though they were unaware of each other. 
Later, if anyone remembered seeing a pretty young woman in a yellow dress, they wouldn't remember seeing her with a man. As Margaret had walked across the huge nineteenth-century station, he had watched her. She came out of the ladies' room with several other young women in bright, stylish dresses, and stayed within a few steps of them all the way to the platform. An observer might have said she was one of them. Five girls, who each merited a second glance, but who all drifted across the crowded place at once, a single vision of colors, stockinged legs, clashing scents, smooth white complexions, hair up, hair hanging long. Which one was blonde and which dark? Who would remember? And the women themselves were laughing and talking with animation, too interested in themselves to pay attention to each other, let alone to someone who was simply walking in the same direction. He didn't know if she had done this instinctively to fade into the herd of people who could hide her best, or had merely let the fear guide her, the terror of being alone attracting her to people as much like her friends as possible. It didn't matter. They were going to get through this. On the train he found her again, but when he sat down beside her, he realized that she'd had time to think. "'We'll stop at your place and close the house,' she said. "'Then you'll stay with me.' When she conducted him into the library, he was envious. She had grown up here, in huge rooms with twenty-foot walls in two tiers, all of them lined with paintings and books. It didn't matter what the books were about or who had written them. To him they were a symbol of privilege. The more ancient and eccentric they were, the greater the advantage. The room represented how many generations of people who had titles and money and manners and tutors and parents. Ten? Do you have to go? You could stay here and call for help. Or we could drive up to Yorkshire. Even if they'd been watching you, nobody could know about that. And lots of people must have been hidden there over the years. My forebears in the time of Henry VIII didn't feel comfortable with the forced conversion and may have hidden a monk or two. Lots of people did. I do know somebody hid from Cromwell there three generations after that. We were exactly the sort of people he was born to rid the world of. Still are, to the degree we can manage it. It's a huge, rambling place with lots of rooms, but the village is small enough so nobody could come after you without being spotted. It entered Schaefer's mind that her ancestors really weren't from the same planet he was. Time meant nothing to her— or to any of them, really. If he chose to stay at the family estate, she would feed him and bring him the daily newspapers until one of them died. And then he would be part of the story, too. He opened his suitcase and pulled out his two passports. He looked at one of them and handed it to Meg. I've got to go to the United States. When I'm ready to come back, I may call you and ask you to mail this to me. She looked at it, then plucked the other one from his hand and read the name aloud. Charles Frederick Ackerman. It hadn't occurred to me that you might have another name, she said, her voice a little hollow. Michael Schaefer is the real one. He put his arm around her waist. The name already sounded strange to him, like the name of someone long dead. What I've been trying to say is, are you going because you have to, or because you think being with me puts me in danger? because I really don't mind. It struck her as an odd thing to have said, so she added, Really? I have to find the mole. He studied her face. There was no possibility of an argument. Of course he had to find the mole. Whose job was it if not his? She had read all the spy novels, then given them to him to read. He wished he had paid more attention to them, but he hadn't. Her questions might grow more astute and penetrating, so he needed to think more carefully about what he said. But he also needed to think about reality, and time was passing. The Satterthwaites would stay on at his house indefinitely, keeping it open and clean and inhabited, and they would feed his cat. Mrs. Satterthwaite had understood that he sometimes traveled, and she would continue to pay the bills out of the household account. He had always been like a ghost in his own house— coming and going quietly without having any discernible effect on the daily business of the place. The Satterthwaites were the real occupants, living high among the rafters upstairs and showing little curiosity about anything he did. If he never came back, the will he had filed in the solicitor's office a few blocks away would be revealed to them. 
Mr. Satterthwaite would paint a neat hand-lettered sign that said bed and breakfast, and they would continue to care for the place and serve the food. The only difference would be that he would be replaced by other ghosts who came and went quietly. He closed his suitcase. I have to get back to London tonight for the plane. I'll get the keys to the jag. She moved to pull open the library door. He watched her go. He knew that some day, if he lived to be old and alone, he would look back on this moment and grind his teeth with anguish and remorse, straining his memory for the exact color of the Honorable Meg's hair and the way her yellow dress swayed as she tugged open the big oak door. Six. Charles Frederick Ackerman walked down the long accordion tunnel past the smiling flight attendants, all poised to dart out and block the narrow aisles and offer assistance. The travelers were barely able to negotiate the cramped space with their burdens of carry-on luggage, let alone balance dwarf pillows on chemical-smelling blankets. They paid no more attention to him than to any of the others. If they'd had to describe him to a policeman, one of them might have been perceptive enough to have judged that his coat was a good piece of English tailoring, but not new, and that he was no longer in his twenties, but wasn't yet wearing the strangely driven look that men acquire on their fiftieth birthdays. He was, at this stop on the cruise route, invisible through protective coloration, eyes and hair a dull brown, maybe English, maybe American, maybe German not thin enough to be French or elegant enough to be Italian. They looked at him only long enough to assure themselves that he wasn't disabled and probably spoke enough English to do what he was supposed to without exaggerated gestures on their part. He took his seat by the window and looked out at England with regret. But all the England he could see was a patch of lighted tarmac and part of a baggage rack. The ten years were already over. Michael Schaefer had made his final appearance before this man had gotten onto the airplane. He settled back in his seat and meditated on the time that would come now. He knew only the name in the wallet of the man who had been carrying the pistol. Mario Talarese. That would be enough. As the rest of the passengers filled the seats around him, he tried to fathom the reasoning of the people who would send a pickup team of amateurs to find and dispose of a man like him. Somebody should have given it more consideration. If they remembered the contract, they should have remembered who he was. In all the councils that were intended to keep these men's pride and ambition and greed from interfering with the steady, predictable profits they shared, wasn't there one calm old voice left to remind them that if they killed him it would gain them nothing, and if they failed they might bring back old trouble? He had done everything he could to convince them that he had relinquished that life. Why hadn't they just let him die? He knew the answer already. They had. There was nothing in it for the dozen old men who had the power and the right to decide things, and if they had decided it wouldn't have been two weasels with knives and a guy with a pistol designed to fit in a lady's purse. The south of England would one day have filled up with quiet men who called themselves Mr. Brown or Mr. Williams, but each had return tickets to three American cities in other names. It couldn't have been the old men. It had to be that an eager, small-time underboss had decided to do it on his own. He even knew who it was. If the one with the gun was named Talarese, the man who had sent him had to be Antonio Talarese. That knowledge gave him one small chance to stay alive, and even that would disappear unless he took it now. If the idea had been to pull off a sudden triumph a couple of thousand miles from home and collect on a ten-year-old contract, then it had to be a secret until it was accomplished. Talarese couldn't have told anyone else that he had found the quarry, or he would have had rivals he couldn't hope to compete with. Ackerman had no choice now but to come back and to do it as fast as he could, because the minute Talarese told the rest of the world what he knew, it was over. Michael Schaefer had not made the sort of preparations that would allow him to slip into another life in time. Ackerman had to get to New York before the news that Mario Talarese was lying behind a building in Brighton. Ackerman leaned back in the padded seat as the huge airplane lumbered down the long runway, its wheels bumping over the cracks faster and faster until its engines screamed an octave higher and lifted it into the night. 
Talarese had made a terrible mistake to fail in his first try. When a man's peace and confidence and the tranquility of his home were gone, there wasn't much left. The Honorable Margaret Holroyd sat on her bed and looked at the clock on the nightstand. The clock had a red digital readout, and had been manufactured no more than a year ago of microchips shipped to Japan from a company outside San Francisco. The nightstand had been made in France in the sixteenth century, out of a tree that had been young at the time when Charles Martel was gathering his troops near Tours to rid France of the baneful influence of Islam. Michael would be midway across the Atlantic by now. It was very likely that a mile from here the Filchings were awake too, sitting up thinking, trying to discern a way that they could accept the rest of their lives after what had happened to Peter and his friend Jimmy. Tomorrow the telephone would ring, and one of them would tell her what they knew. She would have to feign what? Surprise? Shock? Horror? No, the horror was real enough. She had no choice about that. What she wasn't prepared for was lying to those poor, sad people. She put on her robe and walked along the hallway to the back stairs, then down to the library, closed the door behind her and looked around at the familiar place. She wished her father were still alive, sneaking in late at night and sitting down at the old desk to pursue some perfectly dotty arcane study. He had been completely mad, of course. Even as a child she had known it, although her mother had behaved as though it were the furthest thing from her mind until she had known she was dying. Then she had sat Meg down and told her simply, "'Take care of your father if you can.' There had been no moment of doubt in either woman's mind that Meg could. He had been beatific and peaceful much of the time, the way she imagined idiot savants must be. She remembered the day he had let her have the run of this place. She was ten, and she had been at a birthday party for Gwendolen Ap Whitting. She had told one of her stories to Gwendolen, a scary story with ghosts that came up out of the ancient mounds between their estates. Gwendolen had told a duller, less sophisticated, abridged version to her Aunt Clara while she was upstairs fixing her hair. The aunt had come downstairs and made a public announcement that the other children were to believe nothing that Meg said, and followed it with a lecture about Jesus sending angels to make indelible black marks in their books whenever little girls told lies. The children had been more terrified by this than by the ghosts, and they had spent the rest of the long afternoon maintaining a distance of twelve feet from Meg. Their rudimentary religious training had convinced them that God had a history of striking down sinners in groups rather than singly. The criteria were vague, usually just falling into some broadly defined category like the wicked, seemed to be enough. So self-preservation dictated that their status be unambiguous. Whenever she came near any of them, they would recoil and move away. As Gwendolen opened her gifts in the drawing room surrounded by all the other children, Meg had hovered in the doorway, looking at all of them from an immense distance, as though she were one of the ghosts in her story, caught alone on the earth in daytime. When the driver had pulled up in front of the big manor house at four, little Margaret had appeared suddenly from behind a thick yew tree, and clambered into the back seat as though the rolls were the last steamer out of Krakatoa. At home she had sat alone in the garden contemplating the wreckage of her life, when she had noticed her father standing nearby, staring at her. Probably he could see she had been crying, although she had taken pains to hide the signs, because they were not only a consequence, but also evidence of her guilt. It was unusual that he paid any attention to her, and often she suspected he was unaware of her existence for long periods. But now he was absorbed in his study of her, looking down at her with the same benevolent curiosity that he was devoting that year to his list of medicinal herbs mentioned in ancient texts, but not identifiable among modern flora. Finally he had said, "'Come with me.' and walked through the French doors into the library without looking back to see if she had heard him. When they were in the secret little room behind the walls of books where nobody would ever disturb them, he had spoken to her as he probably spoke to his contemporaries. There are times in life when it's useful to know of a place like this. Hiding places are extremely difficult to come by, so treat it with respect. 
You may come here whenever you please. She missed him now as she lay on the leather couch, staring up at the vaulted ceiling and wondering if she had seen the last of Michael Schaefer. The whole day had degenerated from a succession of bright, vivid, jarring sights and sounds into a collection of events she was too exhausted to remember very well. He was gone already, back to a place where serious people had serious things to do, and engaged in awful, deadly struggles to accomplish some ephemeral advantage. It wasn't so much his disappearance that disturbed her. It was the discovery that he really belonged to that life instead of hers. It didn't even matter that he'd told her all those lies about being a spy, that she, of all people in the world, understood. He had only wanted to make it all seem nicer and prettier for her. If he came back, she knew she would probably marry him. She already was listed in Debrett's as the last of the Holroyds, and she was a whole generation too late to do anything selfless about it. Perhaps she couldn't do anything about the fact that he was obviously some kind of criminal, but she could be his place to hide. Gwendolen's Aunt Clara would probably have said it was typical of her to fall in love with the worst person she ever met. She devoted a moment to hoping that Clara's angels had volumes of black marks on her when she had died a few years ago, and this took her mind off the present just long enough for sleep to come. As the passengers shuffled up the aisle toward the door, Charles Ackerman reached under his seat and retrieved his small suitcase. He had brought only one. The place to trap a man like him was in an airport baggage claim area, when he had just stepped off an international flight that required going through metal detectors at both ends, and was standing mesmerized in front of a turning carousel of luggage. He joined the agonizingly slow queue with the others. Here it was only ten in the morning— but it was three o'clock in the morning for the load of passengers straggling into the airport. This suited him perfectly. When the tired functionary at the customs and immigration barrier looked at the passport, a hint of interest almost snapped him out of his lethargy. "'You haven't been home in some time, Mr. Ackerman?' "'No,' he said. "'I live in England now.' He watched with fascination as the man placed his open passport on a machine that appeared to be an optical scanner. That was new. He was glad he had used the Ackerman passport. He had obtained it fifteen years ago on the strength of a bogus birth certificate. But the State Department had issued it, and he had renewed it regularly so it was real enough. The man read something on a computer screen that didn't surprise him, then handed it back. "'Here on business?' "'No.' Ackerman answered. I just haven't been home in a long time. Anything to declare? Nothing. It was all negatives, all denials. I'm nobody, doing nothing here, bringing nothing with me. Forget me. The man ran his hands inside the suitcase quickly and moved on to the next person in line. He latched the suitcase and moved into the open terminal where rows of faces glanced hopefully at him, scrutinizing his features, and then, instantly failing to recognize the right configuration, discarded him, and looked behind him for the brother, the father, the business associate. He passed the waiting throng and moved toward the lockers built into the far wall. He saw one with a key sticking out of it, then remembered he had no American coins. He moved on to the gift shop. There was a woman who seemed to be an Indian behind the counter— staring intently at a garish tabloid she had draped over the cash register. As he approached, she set it aside, and he could read the headline. Russians find World War II bomber in crater on the moon. Meg would have said it had something for everyone she knew. I need to change some English money, he said. She pointed out into the hall. The yellow booth. Then she added confidentially, They give you more at the bank. Thank you, he said, and turned to go. Haven't you got an ATM card? He had no idea what an ATM card was. There was probably another name for it in England, but he certainly didn't have one. No. They'll screw you out of ten percent. I'll do it for five. He resisted the temptation to smile. New York. It must come from the air or the water. They'll screw you, but I won't. We're in this together. 
Even the ward politicians got elected that way. How much can you give me for five hundred pounds? Seven fifty. He had read in the New York Times on the plane that the pound was one dollar eighty nine cents, so her five percent was about twenty percent. He counted out five one hundred pound notes and accepted the money from the till. He asked for the last ten in singles and the last three in quarters, and she gave them without reluctance or an attempt to palm a bill. Having taken her fair usury, she wasn't interested in stealing. He used the coins to free the locker key, left his belongings in the locker, then strolled to the ticket counter and paid more pounds for a ticket to Los Angeles, leaving at seven in the morning. He looked up at the big clock on the wall and reset his watch. He still had almost nine hours. Out in the street, the cabs were lined up with an airport policeman flagging them forward whenever a prospect stepped up. As he presented himself, a dirty yellow Dodge shot ahead crazily and rocked to a stop on its useless shock absorbers. The ride into Manhattan hadn't changed much in ten years. The buildings were a little older and dirtier than he remembered them, and the cars seemed a little better and cleaner. He was thinking about Antonio Talarese. The young idiot with the gun had been Mario Talarese. There was no question that he was a relative. More than twelve years ago, he had met Antonio Talarese in the back of a small gourmet food store in Lower Manhattan. There had been three men waiting when he had arrived. One had been the owner of the place, an eager shopkeeper type, who was standing at a cutting board, making a tray of salami and cheese and opening a bottle of wine, as though this were a little party. Talarese had said, "Leave us now," and the man had gone out to the front to wait on his customers. He had come to the store to talk about a job with Paul Santorini. Santorini was an upwardly mobile manager for Carlo Balacantano, who had been running a Ponzi scheme on the side, taking money first from a greedy New Jersey real estate agent, then from the agent's friends, telling them he was putting it out on the street at astronomical rates of interest. He had paid the man inflated interest for months, long enough to be sure he would brag to his friends about his profits. Then they were hooked too. A group of doctors and engineers, and even a couple of lawyers who obviously hadn't spent any time defending criminals. Among them, they had given the real estate agent about two million dollars to pass on to his underworld friend. Santorini still had about a million and a half of it in hand, and it was time to make the real estate agent disappear. When that happened, the doctors and engineers and lawyers would remember that none of them had ever actually seen Paul Santorini. And certainly hadn't handed him any money. About half would be of the opinion that the real estate agent had taken their money to Brazil. The other half would maintain their faith in him, which meant that Paul Santorini had quietly killed him, and could very easily do the same to them. In any case, none of them would go to the police to report that they had been cheated out of their loan sharking profits by their mafioso partner. But Santorini's clean exit from the venture required that the real estate agent be expertly plucked out of existence, not left butchered somewhere by the likes of Santorini's best soldier, whom he introduced as Tony T, then elongated it to Antonio Talarese. At this point, a boy of about twelve had wandered in to pick up some cardboard cartons and looked surprised to see the men in the back of his father's store. He had stopped and looked at Tony T. Then the store owner had rushed in. Grinning and sweating, and jerked the boy out by the shoulder. The job had been simple enough for the money. The realtor was in the habit of going out alone early on Sunday mornings to put open house signs at the places he was selling. It hadn't taken much imagination to search the New Jersey newspapers for his listings, and be at one of them before he arrived. It was winter, so it was still dark when he had come upon the man taking the signs out of the trunk of his car. He shot him and pushed him into the trunk. Then pulled the keys out of the lock and drove him to a woods a few miles away, where he buried him. That was the part that he remembered best. He could still see and smell the thick layer of wet, leathery maple leaves on the ground. He'd had to push at least four inches of them aside before his shovel could break ground, and then he kept hitting tree roots. They were thin, like fingers, but so tough and rubbery that he'd had to push them aside and dig around them. Then, when the hole was barely three feet deep, he backed into one of them, and it had startled him. At that point, he decided to dump the body in and cover it. When he'd finished pushing the leaves back over the dirt, it would have been difficult even for him to find the grave. 
Then he had left the car in the long-term lot at the Newark airport and taken a cab from the terminal like a passenger. The man's wife had reported his absence that night, but even she never came forward with a theory about what had happened to him. Either she hadn't known about Santorini, or she had decided her husband would have wanted her to live to collect his insurance. Ackerman thought about Antonio Talarese. He was probably a little more substantial than he had been twelve years ago, but he would probably still be in the same part of town. With all the trials that had made the London newspapers in the past couple of years, plenty of vacancies would have opened up above him in the hierarchy. By now, Tony T. might even be what Santorini had been in the old days, which would mean that he would have some underlings of his own. In the old days, it would have been easier in another way, too. There would have been somebody he knew who could supply him with a weapon at eleven o'clock on a Saturday night in New York. This time he couldn't talk to anybody, and he couldn't wait. If Mario Talarese was a relative of Tony T., a telephone call from England announcing his death would be coming soon. As the cab crossed the Triborough Bridge, he spoke. Don't go down East River Drive. Take 125th. The driver said, Are you sure? It's not real safe. I'll give you an extra twenty. The cab coasted down the incline onto East 125th, and now he could see the distant glow of the tall buildings below Central Park. As the cab turned off the busy street to head south, he saw four young men standing under the shadow of a billboard high above them on a brick building. The building had boards nailed where windows used to be under the wrought iron bars. He noticed that while three of them were talking to each other, the fourth never took his eyes off the cars that stopped for the red light on the corner. There was no question what they were doing here. They were waiting for easy prey, the car that would come off the bridge with its radiator steaming or a tire flapping, or the woman alone who would stop for the light with a window open, her purse on the seat beside her, and the radio turned up loud enough to cover the sound of the footsteps coming up behind her car. I'll get out here. The cab driver's eyes appeared in the rearview mirror. You from around here? No. Then let me take you a little farther down. This is Harlem. In the fifties there are a lot of good hotels. You don't want to get out here. No, thanks. He handed the driver sixty dollars and climbed out. Keep the change. The driver didn't speak. The buttons on the doors all came down automatically, and the cab was already moving to catch the green light. The man had decided not to sit through another red and watch what he was sure would happen. Ackerman glanced at the four young men beside the building. The watcher was moving his head from side to side rapidly, as he had seen one of the horses do at the post this morning at the racetrack. The life of a petty thief was mostly watching and loitering, and the thought that the waiting was over always seemed to make them twitch and flex and make unnecessary moves, just to wake up their limbs. The guns wouldn't be in their clothes. If the police surprised them on a sweep, they wouldn't want the ten-year sentence for carrying a firearm, or worse, to give a cop the excuse to open fire. The weapons would be in a trash can or behind a loose board over a window. He held the thieves in his peripheral vision as he moved up the street. It was a delicate matter to pique their interest enough to get them to reveal their hiding place, and then to induce them to reject him as prey. He knew the critical moment would be the instant when they thought he had stopped looking. Then at least one would make a move, if only to check the place where the weapons were. He walked past their building, and they held their places, but he could feel their eyes moving up and down his body. They would be looking for some sign that he was a cop acting as bait. If he was dangerous, it wasn't because he could chase down four men half his age and handcuff them. It was because attacking him might bring five or six carloads of cops screeching in from all directions with riot guns and body armor. He sensed that they were making their decision. In a moment, one of them would betray the hiding place. Hey, man! came a voice. It disconcerted him. That wasn't how it was done. The voice came again. Want some crack? A little blow? Crank? He stopped and turned to look at them. What the hell were they doing? Of course it would be drugs these days. The watcher was the salesman. The salesman strutted out to the sidewalk, his head at a slight angle from his shoulder. He was skinny and black, 
with long legs and fitted jeans that ended in a pair of white high-topped sneakers with big tongues half-laced with red laces. On his left wrist he wore a Piaget watch with a band that looked as though it had been chiseled out of a two-pound gold nugget. He had misread the signs. These weren't hit-and-run thieves. They were pharmacists. He stood thinking as the salesman approached. He had been out of the country too long. What else didn't he know? He glanced over the young man's shoulder at his three companions. Now that his eyes had adjusted to the darkness of their shadowy stand, he could discern that they were all black, too. They all wore high-topped sneakers that looked as though they had been designed for players in the NBA, laced haphazardly with red laces. What was that all about? A sign to customers? A uniform? The cops would love that. The young man smiled. You be here buying or looking. Don't have all night. I got shit to move. Won't do better anywhere around here. His smile was vacant, unfeeling, and confident. He didn't speak quietly or look over his shoulder for the patrol car the way street dealers used to. A line of five cars cruised up to the light, and the other three stood up, walked out into the street, and leaned down to speak into the driver's windows. Two of them made quick deals, taking money and handing the drivers tiny plastic bags from inside their jackets, then moved on to the next two cars. When one driver didn't roll down his window, the young man's expression didn't change. He just gave the door a lazy, half-hearted pat, already looking ahead at the next potential customer. Ackerman pushed his amazement to the back of his mind. This was a distraction, and he had to work with the new circumstances, regardless of how they had come about. I want to buy a gun. The salesman cocked his head again and leaned closer. Say what? From the exaggeration, he could tell that the salesman was already savoring the irony of the situation enough to want to hear it again. I don't want any drugs tonight, but I do want a gun. Can you help me out? The grin broadened. If I have a gun and you have money but no gun, what's to stop me from having both of them? You're making too much here to fuck it up robbing people. Come back tomorrow. I'll see what I can do. The young man turned and sidestepped back toward his building's shadow, like a base runner shortening his lead. He followed the salesman back toward the shadow. It's got to be now. Can't do that. How am I supposed to hold my corner with no gun? So that was it. They weren't afraid of the police or a tapped-out, desperate customer ready to kill to get the whole horde. There were so many dealers now that they were fighting over prime locations. I don't want all of them, just a pistol. Pistol? Shit! The salesman's professional grin returned. Behind him the light turned green and the traffic moved past again. The three vendors looked up the street, then began to drift toward the shadow of the building, so the salesman felt comfortable enough to turn his back. He removed the board from the window and reached inside with both hands. When he turned, he held a nickel-plated three fifty seven Magnum revolver with a four-inch barrel. A gun like that weighed at least two pounds empty and was fat and squat, like a little cannon with a thick round hand grip. Ackerman could see that the salesman and his friends weren't in the concealment business. The only conceivable reason they would pick a gun like this was that it wasn't as heavy to carry around as a forty four. But then, with his other hand, the salesman reached deeper into the cache and produced something bigger, black and square and utilitarian, that didn't resolve itself into a recognizable shape until he had it at chest level. How much for the Uzi? It's not for sale. I'm not giving you a loaded piece and then standing here with nothing in my hands like a fool. Ackerman smiled. May I? He took the revolver in his hand and examined it. It hadn't been fired more than a few times, but it had some kind of filmy substance on the barrel. He opened the cylinder, touched the inside of the barrel to the tip of his little finger, and sniffed. It was the familiar smell of gun oil, so the kid had at least cleaned it. Then he sniffed the outside of the barrel and detected a lemony odor. What are you doing? If you're going to eat the barrel, don't do it here. What's this got on it? Pledge. I waxed it to save the finish. Ackerman nodded sagely, as though to ratify the wisdom of spraying furniture polish on a revolver. 
These kids had no more idea of what they were doing than they would if they had arrived this evening from Neptune. How much do you want for it? A thousand. It was as though he had no smaller numbers in his head. I haven't got that much. But now the salesman's eagerness to sell was gnawing at him. He had already spent too much time with this man. What did you think I wanted? They sell for two hundred new. All right. Give me five hundred and go away. He was miserable. The idea that there was a grown man walking the streets who didn't have a thousand dollars depressed him. He had spent five minutes haggling with a panhandler. He accepted the five hundred dollar bills and jammed them into his pocket with impatience. As Ackerman tried to conceal the big revolver under his coat, the air around him seemed to tear itself apart with a sudden roar. For the first fraction of a second, he thought the salesman had let his finger straight at the trigger of the Uzi. But as he jumped to the side, he saw one of the street vendors sit down abruptly. There were muzzle flashes from the windows of a big brown Mercedes at the corner as two passengers fired wildly at the two salesmen still standing up in the street. Hitting the curb, the side of the building, and parked cars as though they were blind. Cars began to squeal out of line and roar back up the one-way street. Each time one of the street vendors hid behind a car, it would move, and he would have to run to the next. Ackerman saw one of them run to the driver's side of a car, fling the door open, push the occupant over, and drive off. The Mercedes now backed up to afford a better angle on the one who was left, but then it stopped abruptly as the driver saw Ackerman and the salesman in the shadows. Ackerman saw the face of a young black man, and then the barrel of the shotgun swung toward them. As the man pumped the slide, the salesman seemed to collect his thoughts. The Uzi came up, and the now empty street became a different place. The little machine gun jerked, and a brief, messy shower of sparks and flame sputtered out of the short barrel. Some of the burning powder still glowing three feet out of the muzzle. It took less than two seconds to empty the thirty-round magazine into the Mercedes. Then there was a brief second of silence when Ackerman could hear the brass casings that had been ejected clattering onto the sidewalk. The doors of the Mercedes were punctured in at least a dozen places. The right side of the windshield was gone, and the left was an opaque fabric of powdered glass held together by the remnants of the plastic safety layer. But miraculously, there was activity in the car. The driver popped up, leaned over the wheel, and began to sweep the ruined glass out of the windshield. Then the shotgun barrel swung up again, and there was a face behind it looking for a target. As Ackerman sighted the pistol, he noted with detachment that the car must have been modified. Military ammunition should have gone through the doors and done some damage to the people behind them. Probably they had put steel plates in the doors, the way the old gangsters did. Ackerman aimed with both hands and squeezed the trigger. The big pistol jerked, and he could see that the man with the shotgun had been hit. His head lolled forward, and it appeared he had lost some hair and scalp. Now the car's tires spun and smoked. When they caught, and the big Mercedes jumped forward, the shotgun fell from the dead man's hands and slid a few feet on the pavement. The street vendor, who had been sprinting for a hiding place when the Mercedes had backed up, now stopped and dashed for the shotgun. He knelt beside it, brought it to his shoulder, fired, pumped, and fired again at the Mercedes as it screeched around the corner. The salesman disappeared around the building as the street vendor trotted over to his fallen companion. The wounded man was sitting in a growing pool of blood, rocking himself back and forth slowly. In a few seconds, the salesman pulled up in a jaguar that looked a lot like Meg's. The two men hauled their wounded companion to his feet and dragged him into the back seat of the car. As Ackerman watched them, he felt something that could have been sympathy. You know how to apply a tourniquet. The salesman turned on him, his eyes wild with anger and fear. None of your business. He's going to bleed to death if you don't. No, came a frightened moan from the man sprawled on the seat. Ackerman could see that he was stiff and shivering now, going into shock. The word "no" might have referred to anything he had heard, felt, seen, or remembered, but it seemed to affect the salesman, who said, "Get in with him." Ackerman climbed into the back seat and closed the door. Then squatted and leaned his back against it to stay out of the blood. He took off his necktie and tightened it around the young man's thigh as the car pulled out. He looked at his watch. It was just eleven thirty now. In ten minutes he would have to loosen the tourniquet to keep the leg alive. Is there a hospital we can get him to? The salesman sounded furious. Okay, you popped that fucking Jamaican, but you don't know nothing. He's your friend. It's up to you. 
The salesman leaped to adopt his point of view. That's damned right, and that's why we're taking him to the emergency room. He was a born leader. Don't worry, B-Man, I'll get you there. The salesman was calming down now, driving with reasonable attention to whatever was in front of the car. Ackerman waited and watched, counting the minutes. The wounded man was now limp and probably comatose from the loss of blood. As the car moved uptown, he wondered if the salesman had changed his mind. But the kid spoke again. We'll take him up where they won't piss their pants if they see a black man with a hole in him. But I got to throw the Jamaicans off. If they know he's hit, they'll come right to his room and cut him up. Ackerman used the tall buildings that floated by to orient himself. The Honorable Meg and her friends used the term culture shock to describe the feeling he was experiencing now. A day ago he hadn't been thinking about coming back to the United States, and now he felt as though he had been shot out of a cannon and landed here. It all looked the same, but it wasn't, and he was beginning to suspect that he wasn't either. "'What do you think?' the salesman asked Ackerman. He held up his watch until a passing streetlight swept across it, illuminating it like a photographer's flash. There was still five minutes before he had to loosen the tourniquet. The salesman was nervous and wanted support. Sounds okay. If you can get him there in five minutes, it'll help. The street vendor had said nothing since getting into the car. Now he was leaning back in his seat as though he were asleep. What's wrong with your buddy? Oh, shit, said the salesman. He's hit, too. Why doesn't he talk? He doesn't know any English. The B-man knows a little Spanish. Ackerman looked down at the man sprawled across the seat. He was sweating and shivering and looking gray in the face. He might live, but he wasn't going to do any translating tonight. Ackerman leaned over the seat and put his head over the other man's shoulder. He could see that a bullet had hit the man's arm, and blood had soaked the front of his blue shirt. He looked closer. It was a clean hole, punched through the left bicep, about the size of a double-aught buckshot pellet. But he could tell that that wasn't what had hit him. A stray round had clipped him when the salesman had hosed down the neighborhood with the Uzi. At the time, he had noticed that only about half the magazine had hit the car. It was probably just as well that they hadn't called for an ambulance. The ones nearby could be filling up now with people who had been sitting in their apartments watching the late news. It looks like only one shotgun pellet, he said. He's not in danger, but he'll need some help, too. The salesman didn't seem to recognize the absurdity of the theory that twelve pellets in a five-inch pattern had left only a single small puncture. It's just down there, he said. Pull over, said Ackerman. What for? Do it. We've got to go through their pockets. If they've got drugs or too much money on them, they'll have to answer different questions. The salesman coasted to a stop, then executed a perfect unconscious parallel parking job, backing right to the curb. But then he forgot to take the car out of gear, and it lurched into the car and back with a crack, rocking it a little. The man in the front seat seemed to understand what was happening to him and pointed to the pockets he couldn't reach. In the back seat, Ackerman found that the unconscious man was more difficult. His limp, dead weight was enormous. There were little glass tubes of crack hidden in all his pockets, and a huge roll of bills in his jacket. The last thing Ackerman found was an automatic pistol at the small of the man's back unfired and probably forgotten in his terrified dash to get away. He slipped it into his coat pocket. He was aware as each second passed that he could easily raise the three fifty seven Magnum and kill the salesman, then the man beside him and walk away. Drug dealers had always been crazy and unpredictable, and he had stayed away from them. They always seemed to him to be driven by some horrible, aching greed that would make them feed until they burst, like ticks. He had never heard of one who had stopped because he had decided he had enough money. They just kept getting more bloated and voracious until they died in some violent explosion of overconfidence or madness, or the sheer physical principle that when a hoard of money got big enough, it created its own predators to disperse it. His reluctance to be rid of them had something to do with how young they were, and how spectacularly inexperienced. They were so alien to him, he sensed that the environment that would allow them to survive was a place he had never been. In the old days, he recognized that his urge to use that phrase trapped him in the past and made him only a visitor in the present, but he had no choice. These small entrepreneurs would have been co-opted and trained in the iron discipline of the local organization or else swept away. 
The only explanation for these tiny gangs of boys in the streets was that anarchy must have descended on the world. The salesman stared at him over the car seat, and Ackerman could see that he was sweating and frightened. He took pity on him. Okay, here's what we do. You pull up the driveway where the ambulances go. Get as close to the emergency room door as you can and keep the motor running. The salesman drove to the blue sign that said emergency and ambulances, but nothing else. As he took the turn, he swung wide and had to jerk the car to the right to avoid an ambulance with its lights off, gliding down the drive to return to its garage. Now kill that fucker, he hissed. Ackerman knew that if he allowed the salesman to get frightened enough, his deranged mutterings might develop into a real intention. But he decided to ignore them for the moment because the Jaguar was now moving up into the bright yellow glow of the sodium lights. As soon as the car coasted to a stop, Ackerman got out, pulling the wounded man out behind him by the ankles. As he stepped back to duck under him for a fireman's carry, he stepped on the foot of a man behind him. He stopped and glanced over his shoulder. As he turned back toward the car, he still held the image of the man, a tall, barrel-chested policeman, wearing a light blue shirt with little epaulets on the shoulders and such a burden of metal and black leather around his waist that he looked a yard wide. There were a flashlight, a nightstick, a canister of mace, a pocket knife in a black leather case, ammunition, and the heavy black knurled hand grips of the service revolver, all creaking and clicking as he bent to look inside the car. He heard the policeman say, "'What's wrong with him?' And he answered, I can't tell, but he's bleeding and so is his friend. My driver found them lying in the street. The policeman moved to the double doors, which hissed open as soon as he stepped on the black rubber mat and grabbed an orderly who was pushing a gurney around the corner to the next hallway. He heard the policeman's voice. I don't give a shit who you work for. I got gunshot wounds out there. He had his hand on the orderly's back, so it looked as though he were pushing the man in his gurney out the door. The policeman and the orderly hauled the man the rest of the way out of the back of the car and lifted him onto the gurney. As the orderly wheeled him into the building, the policeman walked over to an ambulance driver who was just putting his oxygen bottle back into its carrying case inside his parked rig. As he and the ambulance driver pulled a stretcher out of the ambulance, its legs swung down and locked. By now the second wounded man was out of the front seat and standing beside the car unsteadily, and he gladly flopped onto the stretcher for the short ride inside. The policeman muttered, "'You two park the car over there and come back. I'll need you for a few minutes.' Then push the stretcher to the door. Instantly Ackerman was in the passenger seat beside the salesman. "'Drive! Get out of here!' he said. The salesman had been sitting motionless, not even daring to glance at the policeman in his rearview mirror. Ackerman knew it must have taken a great act of will for him. Since childhood, he had undoubtedly survived the way the thieves in the old days had, scattering at the first sign of the uniforms, each one scrambling in a different direction, down alleys and over fences, each of them alone and hoping that he wouldn't be the one they picked to chase down. Now the salesman was released from whatever had held him. His instincts, temperament, and ability to calculate all urged him away, and he let them carry him. He stepped on the gas pedal and the car was in motion. A hundred feet away, an old man was shuffling across the drive toward the emergency room, staring down at the pavement with a contemplative look on his face. He took each little step carefully, with intense concentration, satisfied with the almost invisible progress it represented. The old man was caught in the lights for a moment, and looked up defiantly, squinting a little, then stopped walking as though he intended to make this young fool wait as long as possible. "'You see the old guy?' Ackerman asked. "'Sure.' said the salesman, but he didn't slow down. Ackerman could see the old man judging the distance to the curb and estimating the damage he would sustain if he made a dive to the pavement. The old man's decision was conservative. He aimed himself at the curb and began to shuffle toward it, faster now than before, in a strange little dance that looked as though he were going down invisible stairs. The car shot past him, the slipstream blowing his coattails up and sending a ripple of wind to flutter his baggy pants. Then he was visible for a second in silhouette against the yellow light of the hospital entrance, still standing. The Jaguar spun around the corner, and its arc carried it into the next one, heading south again. Ackerman turned to the salesman. Do you know where you're going? The salesman shrugged. Can't stay out alone. Got to get with my friends. The Jamaicans will be hunting me. Let me out at the corner. 
The salesman's eyes narrowed and he glanced at him quickly. We still need to talk. What about? I need the gun back. They're looking for me. He had obviously been thinking about the predicament he was in. He had emptied the clip in the Uzi and sold his pistol, and now he still had to make it across the city to whatever stronghold his friends maintained. He wasn't sure he would be able to do that unarmed, and even he knew he couldn't stay out in a car as memorable as a Jaguar and not be caught by the police. Ackerman was surprised to detect in himself a certain sympathy for the salesman. All right, pull over up there. The salesman steered his car to the side of the street and let a taxi go by. Then he put his hand in his pocket and pulled out the five hundred dollar bills. Ackerman accepted them, then got out, and leaned back into the car to look at the salesman. The salesman was agitated. Where is it? Where's my gun? Ackerman pulled the big nickel-plated pistol out of his coat and laid it on the floor behind the passenger seat, out of the salesman's reach. If I were you, I'd drive around the corner to a dark spot before I tried to pick that up. The salesman looked hurt at the lack of trust, or perhaps disappointed that he wasn't going to get the five hundred dollars back. You have another one, don't you? You took one off B-Man. Ackerman answered, I've been doing this a lot longer than you have. Don't try to follow me. I can still kill you any time I want to. He closed the door and watched the jaguar move off into the night. He walked quickly down the street past a hotel, a bar, and two closed stores before he ducked into the next doorway. He looked out at the street for the jaguar, his right wrist beside his coat pocket, feeling the weight and square corners of the small automatic inside, without letting his hand pat it or touch it. The jaguar didn't reappear, even after he had watched the traffic signal change three times. The salesman had decided to forget about the money, and had gone to find whatever form of safety and shelter home could offer him. 7. Ackerman grasped the big wrought iron handle, pulled the heavy plank door open, and entered. There was a podium with a book of reservations on it, but the kitchen had been closed for hours, and the hostess had been replaced by a bouncer who sat in an alcove with a pilsner glass half full of flat beer. He was a melancholy weightlifter recruited from a local gym, a thirtyish man with a cap of black curly hair and a management-owned blue suit that had been let out to accommodate his squat, thick upper torso. He let his dark eyes stray upward to determine that the man coming through the doorway was alone, and therefore probably quiet, wearing a clean shirt and sport coat, and therefore probably not insane, and of average height and weight, and therefore manageable for the bouncer, if he had been overly optimistic about either of the first two. The bouncer took a bird-like sip of his beer and returned his eyes to a sad survey of the rest of the patrons, sitting at tables ranged around the dark interior of the bar. Behind the eyes he was a small, shy little introvert, who had inherited the body of generations of brawlers and laborers, then with introspective concentration had built it into a comic-book picture of a man, with muscles that he compared each day, one by one, with a series of photographs in a glossy magazine. He saw himself as a kind of lifeguard, who was always in attendance at a scene of continuous and foolhardy revelry that he was never moved to join. Ackerman walked past the bouncer to the bar, edged onto a stool, and found that he had immediately intersected with the bartender's orbit. "'Perrier,' he said." The bartender's answer was a warning and a challenge. That'll be three fifty. He reached for his wallet to signal that he was aware he was going to pay that much for a glass of water, and the man moved to the cooler. Ackerman placed a five dollar bill on the bar, then moved toward the sign that said restrooms. There was a dark little hallway and two doors with the international symbols for the sexes, two gingerbread people so nearly alike that they signified nothing until compared for differences. He had been glad to see the bouncer because it meant that the pay telephone would still be firmly attached to the wall and the book would be intact. The bouncer was the sort who would have considered the destruction of a telephone book an infraction that required his regretful attention. He had no difficulty finding the home address. There were only four Talarese numbers and only one Antonio. But then he noticed the business numbers. The first was Talarese's Bella Italia, then a number for catering, and one for reservations. 
The address was on Mott Street in Little Italy. It had to be the same place, the little catering store, where he had met Tony T. years ago. He walked back to the bar and sipped his bubbly water. The antique clock on the wall over the bar, a plain black face with glowing green numbers and a green neon ring around it, said that it was ten minutes to one. He sat in the subway car, looking at the spray-painted graffiti on the walls. The colors had gotten better, the viridian greens and new shades of orange, and the gold and silver metal flake. But the script was now so ornate that he couldn't read any of it. When it occurred to him that it might be a different language, he decided it should still be organized into words. It looked more like the samples of Sumerian and Phoenician in the books he had found in his house in England than like any modern language. The British were always complaining that London was no longer an English city. They should see New York. It had always been a few steps closer to chaos than London was, but now no European would recognize it as having any historical relationship with anything he knew or understood. It was as though the Indians had returned to claim it after a three-hundred-year sojourn in the woods. The train clattered to a stop, the doors opened, and he stood and followed two anorectic heroin addicts onto the platform. They were probably younger than they looked, and they looked about twenty, two pockmarked young men in tight black pants that betrayed the fact that they had sat on the ground at some point, and thin, almost antique jackets of early synthetic materials, one in a silky blue-gray that he remembered seeing on someone when he was a teenager, and the other in a dirty bile green with a texture almost like foam rubber. He could tell that they were holding because the shorter of the two kept patting his pocket to reassure himself that he hadn't dropped the bag or his works. In England, they made an effort to keep the poor bastards supplied and off the streets, so he had forgotten about them. But at least these two were holding, so he wouldn't have to watch his back when he moved out into the darkness. They would be on their way to a peaceful place where they could bring up a vein. He ascended a set of concrete steps that smelled like a urinal, past old paint that was beginning to peel, taking with it the most recent graffiti and revealing more beneath it. When he reached the street, he came around the railing and moved toward the catering shop he remembered. He had no trouble seeing the store from a distance. It was after one on a Saturday night, and two men in suits were standing on the street like parking attendants. A big gray car pulled up in front, and one of them went to the window to talk to the driver. When the car pulled around the building, Ackerman remembered the loading dock in the back. Even in the old days, the little square of tar had been an unusual extravagance in this part of town, where trucks usually stopped on the street in front of businesses and unloaded onto the sidewalk. By now, the Tallarazes could probably have lived off the rent on that much land. It was a place invisible from the street, where they could park a truck and bring anything in or out of the building. If the police had been both smart and honest for any extended period, they would have given themselves an education by watching that lot. He walked up the street opposite the store, holding it in his peripheral vision. There was more to it now. There was a restaurant on one side, with lights on but drawn curtains, and a big closed sign in the window. The store that he remembered was dark. As he walked, the street began to take on an unreal quality, as though it were part of an old, familiar dream, the changes that time had made in it, no more important than the little alterations his mind made when he invoked a landscape to contain his explorations in a dream. Once again he was walking alone on a dark street, clearing his mind and relaxing his muscles for the moment when he would need to decide and act faster than others could. This life should have been over long ago. Disconnected bits of memory began to merge as he walked. Eddie Mastruski must have been about forty on the winter day in Cleveland when they had sat in the car and watched the man walking through the snow toward the parking lot, and had both realized that if Eddie used his gun, someone would hear. Eddie had leaned down to zip up his rubber boots over the cuffs of his pants, whispering, "'Oh, shit! Oh, shit!' to himself more than to the boy. Then he had said, "'It has to be now. Tomorrow he'll know, and then nobody will ever get near him.' So Eddie chased the man down and killed him quietly with a tire chain. He came back red, sweating and gasping for breath. 
his eyes bulging as he started the car. I'm too old for this, he had said. The boy had said nothing. Eddie hadn't been entirely serious, but from the boy's position in the front seat next to him, watching his big chest heaving under the heavy overcoat and the bloated cheeks inflating as he blew out air, it had seemed true. Eddie had lasted a long time in the trade, and by now he had come to understand what that meant. Nobody could go on for thirty years now. It had been a generation that had something more than strength and stamina. They had some kind of animal stupidity, something that made them unaware of the pointlessness of going on. Some of the men who had dialed the telephones in the early 1950s and heard Eddie's cheerful, resonant baritone sing, Eddie the Butcher, over the wire, were still at it. Wizened, desiccated old skeletons, still studying the changing configurations of people and money to discern a pattern that would give them another way to steal. Eddie, younger than they were, was long dead. Eddie had been a butcher, and the shop hadn't been a simple disguise. It was part of Eddie's homemade philosophy that a false identity was always a transparent, amateurish ruse. He had raised the boy in the butcher shop, first teaching him to sweep and wash the floors, then to care for the gleaming knives and saws, then finally to use them himself, as though Eddie had expected him to follow that trade rather than the other one. But Eddie hadn't thought things through clearly. He simply taught the boy what he knew, some of it nonsense and some of it useful. Sometimes the long days in the shop came back to him now. I never knew a man named Earl that you could trust. For some reason they're all thieves. Why? I don't know why. But knowing it gives you an edge, because they don't know you know. He had taught the boy the skills of the butcher shop, but Eddie had never imagined that in such a short time butchers would become as anachronistic as blacksmiths. Now only the rich bought their meat from a real butcher. The shops were like boutiques, and the only reason customers came was because they had the illusion that the prices they paid made the chemicals and hormones disappear from the meat. All the butchers worked for big meat packing plants now and punched time clocks and belonged to the meat cutters local. They couldn't accept part-time work that might take them out of town any time they got a telephone call. Eddie had lived to see the beginning of this change. He would notice that some of his old customers drove past the shop on the way to the supermarket. He would shake his head as though the small profit he made from the shop mattered to him. You know what those bastards charge for a chicken? Two dollars a pound. When I was your age, I could get laid for two dollars. Did you? Hell no. You think the clap is a joke? Ackerman turned and crossed the street two blocks down. The only way to approach the restaurant without letting anyone get behind him was to enter through the loading dock. Eddie had taught him to clear his mind and spend a few minutes in calm, dispassionate meditation before he committed himself. You look, you wait, you think. Then if it's doable, you think again. Do you know how you're going to get out if your first plan gets blown? Eddie would have taken him past the restaurant and let him look at it. Once you're in, you're like an egg in a frying pan. You got two seconds to get in, see him and pop him. You got three seconds to get across the floor while they're wondering if you want them next. You got maybe a second to get out the door. You stand still more than a second at any step, you heat up and fry. But this wasn't Eddie's kind of job. Eddie would not have understood why he was here. Eddie's philosophy was, above all, cautious. They were only smart and stupid. Eddie had never understood the word audacity. When he had heard the word applied to Napoleon on television, he had thought about it for a moment, and then said it meant pressing your luck. Eddie would have told him he was a fool to come back to New York, but he'd had no choice. He had returned only because there was no practical way for him to stay alive but this. He had to kill the man who possessed the secret knowledge that he had been in England. If Antonio Talarese had already told the others, they would have insisted on sending someone more formidable than the three hastily armed leg-breakers he had seen at Brighton. Obviously, Talarese had decided that the chance of a sudden coup was worth the risk. 
Ackerman still had a hope that he had arrived in New York before the news that Mario Tallarese was dead. As he moved down the narrow alley into the parking lot, he could see that he was much later than he had thought. The telephone call from England had already come. A hearse was parked behind the store, probably waiting to meet the body at the airport. He stood still and looked at it, but there was no sign of the driver. The funeral home must be owned by one of Antonio Tallarese's friends. The driver would be a relative of the owner, a volunteer who had been invited inside with the others for a glass of grappa, or anisette, to help pass the time while they waited for the plane. He was all the way back in the old life now, feeling his heart trying to beat stronger, harder, but finding he was still able to keep it slow. Eddie had taught him about noises by making him watch the cat in the butcher shop. If the cat made a sound, it would wait minutes before it moved again. The boy had learned that he could do the same. If his foot dislodged a stone or a board creaked, he rested and waited. In the early days, when he had first worked alone, he had sometimes counted to an arbitrary number before moving again. It didn't matter what the number was, so long as he had waited beyond a human sense of time before he made another noise. Now, even after ten years of inactivity, he was still too good at it to have to think about it. He moved along the side of the building to the loading dock, rolled onto it, waited and listened. He could hear low voices inside the building. They were coming from the back of the restaurant. He could see them in his imagination, sitting in the kitchen. Eat, said a man's voice that he placed low and near the wall. How am I supposed to eat? It's almost two o'clock in the morning, and I feel like this is my fault. Shh, you'll give yourself agita. The woman was standing up, farther away. Nobody said it was your fault. This one was standing, too, another man, and he was moving, probably pacing. Please, Tony, eat something. You've got to eat. Ackerman used the aimless ritual of the conversation to crawl to the door. This was the entrance he had used when he had met Tony T. He pulled on the steel door, but it had an unbudging solidity that told him it was locked and staked down with a deadbolt in the floor. He would have to get in another way. As he moved closer to the kitchen door, he could smell something cooking. It was the burning fat of meat mixed with something spicy that burned his nose and made him hungry. He didn't allow himself to smell it for long because it belonged in the category of irrelevant sensory distractions. It was other people's food, just part of what pertained to them, like their talk and clothes and names. He stood in the darkness for a moment and tensed the muscles in his legs, feet, toes, and then arms. He took a couple of deep breaths and let his heart rate speed up and the moment of dizziness turn into tension. He took the little pistol out of his coat pocket, flipped off the safety, then opened the door and slipped inside the kitchen looking around him. He stared into the eyes of a thin, dark woman in a black dress with a string of pearls around her neck, incongruously wearing a pair of huge quilted oven mitts that looked like flippers. The woman froze, speechless, as he crouched and moved sideways behind the man seated at the stainless steel table. The man at the table saw her, twisted in his chair to see what she was looking at, and scowled. In the last decade the face had gotten coarser and thicker, and the wavy black hair now had a few wiry gray strands, but it was unquestionably Tony Tallarese. What? The mouth was thin and wide, and the pointed chin stuck out in annoyance until the eyes focused on the face that was too close. You? Why you? It seemed an odd question, but Ackerman had no time now to wonder about it. He thought about Eddie's egg in the frying pan as he placed the gun against Tallarese's temple and fired, then moved not back toward the door but forward, sidestepping the woman in black, who was running to the body slumped forward on the table, flapping her arms to get rid of the oven mitts like a startled bird trying to take flight. Nobody else in the kitchen moved as the woman flung herself on the dead man's back. Their eyes fluttered in their heads, not knowing where to look as he stepped past them. A middle-aged man in a dark suit and an apron— Two girls in their twenties, one black-haired and the other blonde, but like sisters, wearing short, tight black dresses with a lot of stiff lace and explosions of chiffon at the hems, as though they had just come from a nightclub. 
As he reached the swinging door to the dining room, two other young women, who had the flat shoes and big forearms of waitresses, rushed in past him, one carrying a fire extinguisher upside down. He was prepared for the screams, but the screams didn't come from them. They came from the woman clutching the dead man to her. He slipped out the door to the dining room. Inside the kitchen, the woman cried, Tony! There was a short pause, and then, What's this? The others flocked to her, trying to pull her away, but she didn't budge. She tapped on the dead man's back. There was an audible electronic click. A wire? The son of a bitch is wearing a wire! The woman tore at Antonio Talarese's back. The kitchen had turned into this small, dark woman's personal madhouse, and confronted by the spectacle, the others all seemed to forget about the killer. The woman clawed Talarese's shirt up out of his belt to his shoulders, so that everyone could see that Tony T. did have something taped to the small of his back. The woman squawked again. See? I never would have believed my husband. The grieving widow turned to the man in the apron. Are these things always turned on? What? The stunned man in the apron looked as though he had been shot, too. What? You know, can they hear? At night. I'm his wife. You know what I'm asking. The man seemed to decipher the words with great difficulty, groping toward the idea, but not quite believing that anybody could be asking what he thought she was. When he arrived at it, he reacted with contempt. For Christ's sake, Lucille, who fucks with his coat on? That seemed to satisfy the wife for a moment, and her bony shoulders drooped. But what he'd said had brought understanding to one of the waitresses, a plump, fair woman, about thirty-five. She seemed to remember something. Oh, my God, she wailed, and the widow's eyes flicked toward her and narrowed. The widow's lips curled back to bare her teeth. Haw, she shrieked. As she hurled herself at the buxom, peach-faced waitress, she didn't notice that both of the young girls in the black dresses and the other waitress were backing toward the loading dock with identical stunned expressions on their faces. One of the young girls was compulsively jerking at the chain of a diamond pendant, trying to snap it off her neck. The widow was so alert she could see into their souls. You too? You all let him do it wired up like a radio station? Her voice shattered into a cackle. Ackerman moved across the dim, empty restaurant, staying low and keeping his eyes on the door. He heard the hysterical woman exploring new octaves beyond soprano, but her screeches didn't resolve themselves into words. Behind him in the kitchen there was a series of screams as pots and pans and then a table were knocked over. He watched the front door of the restaurant, crouching in the deep shadows below the bar. He heard the door rattle as one of the men on the street tried to open it, and then saw their shadows moving rapidly back and forth at the windows. Their voices didn't reach him over the noise in the kitchen, but he knew that eventually one would make a dash around the building to the loading dock, while the other came through the front door into the dining room. He relaxed his muscles and controlled his breathing while the minds of the two men outside lumbered toward the only possible strategy. He saw a shadow float along the front window toward the alley, and then watched the other shadow loom suddenly at the door. A moment later, the glass was hammered inward, and a big arm reached through the hole and tugged at the crash bar. The door swung open, and a big man pivoted around into the restaurant, visible for only a second as his silhouette slid across the broken door into the safety of the darkness. This man's movements were an unpleasant surprise. He was big, but he used his strength to move himself gracefully into a corner and hold himself low, silently waiting for his eyes to adjust to the darkness while he listened for the sound of an intruder. He was crouching in a spot where nobody could get behind him, and he could control both doors. With every heartbeat it became more likely that the man was cunning enough to stay where he was until his partner came in through the loading dock and flushed any intruder out the kitchen door. In the kitchen, the widow had somehow freed herself from the man with the apron and resumed her tirade right beside the dining-room door, where the words were audible. Hawes! she shrieked. Then there was the quavering voice of another woman, younger, frightened, but stealing herself to defiance. He was the one who wanted to. This seemed to enrage the widow even more. Of course he was the one who wanted to. He wanted everything, like a little boy. 
I hope they play this on the six o'clock news so your grandmother's hear it and drop dead. And you with your bleached hair twitching your ass in his face every day. Suddenly the big man in the corner leaped up, knocked over a table on the way to the kitchen, bellowing, Gloria? What's she saying? He waited for the man to burst through the swinging door, then glided to the front of the restaurant. He pushed gently on the crash bar and opened the door only wide enough to step through it to the street. He put the gun into his pocket as he walked. In a moment he was around the corner, out of sight of the restaurant, a fortyish man in good clothes making his way toward the subway entrance two blocks down the street. As he walked he had no concern that the two soldiers would be able to sort out what had happened in the two minutes in which they might still catch him. If they did, they would be in their cars looking for a man in a car. As he approached the subway entrance, he reached into his pocket and felt the pistol. He was reluctant to relinquish it after all the trouble he had gone through to get it from the salesman's wounded friend, but he reminded himself that it was more dangerous to him than to anybody else now that he had used it. He moved down the steps to the shelter of the underground and used the change machine to buy a token to get him through the turnstile. It was all a sequence of simple, mechanical, logical steps. He saw that he was alone in the big echoing tunnel. In the silence he could hear the rails clicking somewhere, but the sound was still far off. He wondered how things had changed so much that he would be alone at a subway stop, even at two in the morning. He jumped off the platform, ran down the track to the tunnel mouth, and looked around again. There was no other human being in sight, and no sound except a train somewhere in a parallel tunnel, not even audible now, just a vibration through the bedrock. It had to be now. He took the little pistol out of his pocket, wiped it clean with his sleeve, laid it carefully across the gleaming steel rail, then turned, ran back to the platform, hauled himself up and waited. In a few minutes, even a few seconds, the New York transit system would effectively dispose of his weapon for him, turning it into something that looked more like a torn orange peel than a firearm. If the serial number miraculously survived, the nearest it would lead the most astute police force to him would be a delirious teenager lying in a hospital bed miles away. Ackerman heard the reassuring sound of the train long before it arrived. It was rattling through the tunnel as though it had no intention of stopping. He watched the rail where he had placed his pistol. Suddenly there was a flash of light as the nose of the train swept past. And then it was just a strip of windows, most of them empty or nearly so, a few somnolent, dull-eyed faces looking out past him at the walls. The train came to a stop beyond the boarding zone, and he had to walk quickly to reach the door of the last car as it opened automatically to receive him. He stepped through it just before it slid shut. As he moved to a seat, he took a census. Most of the cars he had seen were nearly empty, and a man alone sitting in the bright light would stand out like a stuffed animal in a diorama in a museum. In this car a dozen people sat in the sleepy boredom of the late shift, or the mildly disappointed memory of an evening out. Four big men sat in the two seats across from him, thick-necked beer-swillers with pudgy fingers and bowling bags at their feet. There were two tall, studious-looking black men sitting in the seat in front of him. One of them wore wire-rimmed glasses with small, flat, round lenses that looked as though they had been issued by a Soviet medical mission to Zimbabwe. They caught the overhead lights and glinted whenever he glanced at the four white men across the aisle. His companion seemed to be a little more used to New York subways, and kept his gaze ahead to avoid meeting the eyes of any possible lunatic who might be staring at him in incomprehensible hatred. The rest of the passengers were like him, solitary men who didn't want to be either memorable or visible in this place at this time. There were no sales to be made, contracts to be negotiated, or friendships to be started on a subway after midnight, and any contact with the people surrounding them was risky. He adopted the same pose. He slouched a little, but only enough to suggest ease, not physical weakness. Like them, he cleared his mind and set his face in an ambiguous, empty expression. He waited until the subway had stopped at 34th and 6th, then watched until a train decorated with a white airplane on a blue background arrived. The gradual replacement of words with colors and pictures had accelerated during his time away, and it made moving around a kind of puzzle. What could it be but an airport express? Maybe an ad for air travel? But it took him to the Howard Beach JFK airport station, and a bus came to shuttle him to the terminal. Ackerman didn't see people on his route. 
He saw the backs of heads, collars raised and bodies bundled against the pre-dawn chill, eyes half-closed because there could be nothing to look at until the train stopped moving. When he entered the terminal, he took the precaution of finding a door with a little picture of a man on it so that he could wash any visible traces of burned powder off his hands and forearms to fool a paraffin test. Then he went to his locker, retrieved his suitcase, and returned to change his clothes in a stall. He knew he was acting like a shopkeeper who had just killed his wife for the life insurance, but something unexpected had happened at Tolareze's. He wasn't sure exactly what it was, but he knew it couldn't be good. 8. Elizabeth Waring Hart poured boiling water through the coffee filter, then set the kettle back on the burner without making any noise. She stopped and listened to the baby monitor for a second, poured the coffee into her cup, and then sat in the cold pre-dawn darkness. As soon as she raised the cup and touched it tentatively to her lips, she heard Amanda's first stirrings. There was a faint little gasp that the monitor amplified into a rattling snore, and then came the roll. The crinkle of the biodegradable diaper sounded like the crumpling of a newspaper over the thin layer of static. Then Amanda began to coo to herself in her crib, and Elizabeth listened intently. In a few minutes she would be crying for rescue, but as long as she was experimenting happily with sounds and running the morning inventory of toys in her crib, it was better to leave her in peace. Elizabeth took another sip of her coffee. When Jimmy was this age, Jim had been the one to do this. He had been a morning person. Sometimes, soon after he had died, Elizabeth had felt strange when she sat here, taking his place. Sometimes she had even tried to talk to him, because it seemed as though he were nearby. She would say, You bastard! You stupid bastard! You should be doing this! The counselor from the hospital had said that anger was a normal reaction, but counselors were in the business of telling people things were normal that weren't. When the telephone rang, she snatched it off its cradle before it had finished its first jangle. Hello, she said, just above a whisper. Elizabeth. It was a statement, uninflected, and not enough to tell her who would call at this hour. Yes. She matched the emptiness of the tone. I think we've finally found something that will make you come back to organized crime. So it was Richardson. When she had transferred out of the section ten years ago, Richardson had been at her level, just a data analyst with a law degree. Now he was in charge. What's that? she asked without curiosity. She had been in two other sections of the Justice Department since then, and taken two maternity leaves, and nobody had ever asked her to come back. A couple of hours ago in New York, a man walked into the back door of a restaurant and put a hole in Tony Tallarese's head. Tony T? What surprised her was that she remembered who that was. She could be away for a hundred years, and she couldn't get the names out of her memory. There's only one suspect. He did it in front of Tallarese's brother, his wife, and three mistresses. Interesting. Who was it? The butcher's boy. But she wasn't really listening, because there was no other reason why this man would call her at this hour. She was already thinking way ahead, about the kid's babysitter, about the problem of arranging a temporary transfer out of her section when everybody was working double shifts, tracing money from housing and urban development into private bank accounts, and about the dress at the dry cleaners that she wished she could wear if she had to go into that office again. Part of her was also listening to the baby monitor because Amanda was beginning to change her tone subtly, occasionally pausing in her quiet babble to issue little bulletins of discomfort. Richardson gave her the old desk. It was amazing that it even existed. No, not that it existed, because anything that had ever been on a government inventory stayed on it, but that it was still here in the same place, not even shifted off the little wooden wedge Elizabeth had jammed under one leg to keep it from wobbling on the uneven floor. She played the tape recording a second time. The gun was unbelievably loud. She glanced at the report again. Thirty-two caliber. But of course he was firing at two feet from the microphone, into Tony T.'s head. She listened to the loud, scrabbling, tearing sound, and then the woman shrieking, "'The son of a bitch is wearing a wire!' She punched the button. 
She stood up and walked into what they had called the chief's office. In the old days, she wouldn't have considered walking into that room without knocking. But Richardson was her contemporary, and whether he knew it or not, he wasn't her boss. He looked up from his desk. Well? And the grieving widow said it was the butcher's boy? She said that's what her brother-in-law told her. He, of course, won't tell anybody anything. She happened to mention what he's been doing with himself all these years? I don't get the impression she'd ever heard of him before. When we catch him, you can fill each other in. Elizabeth felt it. She couldn't help that. But she reminded herself that Richardson wasn't complicated enough to try to jab the sensitive spots. Those ten years had been her portion of a decent life, her allotment. She was a widow, too. Richardson knew at least that much. She said carefully, We're not going to catch him unless we figure things like that out. You called me down here in the middle of the night, so help me. Richardson pushed aside his papers and looked at her evenly. Right. What were they doing in a closed restaurant? A party? Hardly, said Richardson. There was an empty hearse in the back lot. They were going to the airport to pick up Tony's nephew. It's been a bad week for Clan Tolerese. He was killed, too? Where? England. She jumped up. My God, we're wasting time. Get me the flight lists from London to New York. Every flight since the nephew died, and every flight out of New York since he killed Tony T., You're jumping to conclusions. We don't even know what happened to the nephew. It might have been AIDS. Then find out, but later. First the airline flight lists. Elizabeth worked alone. In the old days, it used to take hours of negotiations to get anything from the airlines. Now any question from the Justice Department, at least the Washington office, induced a special kind of panic. Too many planes had been dropping out of the sky. The fax machine kept buzzing, and Richardson's secretary had to keep walking back into the little cubicle to change the paper. Elizabeth crossed off all the names of women, then all the names of travelers with frequent flyer credits, then all the reservations made more than a week ago, then all the passengers with names he couldn't be expected to use, Yamaguchi, Babatundi, Gupta, Hernandez, and Ngayan, then looked through the sheets again. What else? What was it that made him special? Nothing. That had to be it. There would be nothing special at all. No special seat, special meals, special luggage arrangements. He didn't give a damn if he rode naked in the baggage compartment. All he wanted was to get out fast and disappear again. She checked the notations on the printouts once more, crossing off any passenger who had a special request. That left an encouragingly short list. There wasn't time to count the names, but there were still too many. She thought about what he had done. He had walked into a kitchen, shot Tony T. in front of a lot of people, and walked out. It was the middle of the night. Of course he had known Tony T. was dangerous. What he would have wanted to do was to sneak into Talarese's bedroom while he was asleep and empty the pistol into his head. It would have been between three and five in the morning, the time the police always picked for a raid— when he would be deep asleep, and the plane reservation would be based on what he had wanted to do, not what he'd had to do. He would expect to be finished and on the street by 5.30 at the latest, at the airport again by 6.30 and on a plane by 7.30 or 8. That was the absolute outside limit. Elizabeth pushed aside half of the flights. Would he sit around in an airport until 10.55 waiting for a way out when anybody could walk in and see him? Not a chance. He would be long gone by then. He'd be up in the air about thirty thousand feet on his way to... where? Not some place where there would be two flights a day, eight hours apart. If he missed the first one, there had to be another one warming its engines on the runway. Some place big and busy. She went through the pile of flights again, pulling out the small cities, losing hundreds of names as she did it, and feeling warmer now, closer to him. Once, years ago, she had gone through the airline lists, knowing that he was one of the names, and never gotten this close. He had already landed somewhere before she even knew he had taken a plane. But this time was different. 
These flights were still in the air. Maybe this time. He was running, and he wasn't going to cross his own path. No return reservation. She obliterated all the round-trip tickets, now finding reasons for eliminating names faster than her hand could move to strike them out. Almost all the remaining names had booked return flights. Form of payment. He would certainly have credit cards, probably in a lot of different names. But if he did, he wasn't going to let them be used to trace him away from the crime scene, and he wasn't going to throw one away for an airline ticket. He would use them for hotels after he had come to Earth someplace safe. He would pay cash for the ticket. There were only five names remaining on three flight lists now, and she laid them all out on the table and stared at them. One of them looked wrong. Hagedorn. David. She was sure she had crossed that one off already. She looked quickly from sheet to sheet. Hagedorn Mary traveling with Hagedorn Marissa. Parents. At one time she wouldn't have understood, but now she did. It was that awful, depressing anxiety that one of the planes was going to fall out of the sky and some sort of magic would keep Marissa from being an orphan. She crossed off Hagedorn David. There was nothing left to distinguish any of the other four. They had all bought tickets with cash on the day of the flight. All had chosen to leave New York on morning flights. All were males, traveling alone, taking any seat they could get. Somebody undoubtedly had heard a relative was sick, another had been called for a job interview, another had a girlfriend who wanted him to join her after all. The fourth had just fired a pistol into the head of a New York capo regima and was understandably impatient to get out. Richardson came in behind her, but she didn't look up. How's it going? I've got it down to four, she said. How the hell did you do that? What are the criteria? It would take an hour to show you. We don't have an hour. Give me the four. She handed him the three passenger lists with four names left untouched. I don't know how to get it down to one. He glanced at the lists. Dallas, Chicago, Los Angeles, another Chicago. What do you want to do? If there's any way in the world to hold all four of them, do it, Elizabeth said. He's running. Though he doesn't exactly run, he just sort of fades out. He won't stay put. He'll get on another flight under another name. He'll pay cash. How do you know that? There's no time. Look at those ETAs. I'll get the FBI on the phone. Elizabeth watched Richardson through the open door of his office. It was the third time he had been on the telephone with the FBI agent. He held his ballpoint pen over a yellow legal pad, at first poised to write something down, then just gripping it like a knife, clicking the button on the end of it nervously, retracting and extending the tip over and over as he listened. She waited at her old desk and tried to avoid the bad luck by watching the first group of ambitious GS-7s and 9s coming in to work early, each expecting to be the first, seeing her and looking puzzled, then seeing Richardson's door open and looking disappointed. She had been like them once, and it mortified her now, but at the time it hadn't been ambition. She just hadn't known enough history. They had still called it the Organized Crime Task Force in those days, behaving as though they had been brought together to cope with an emergency that would go away if they worked harder than the Mafia. That was before she had learned enough to realize that criminal conspiracy was the natural state of affairs in all civilized countries. People who worked for the Justice Department had to be in it for the long haul. But then Richardson was on his feet and out of his office, and the expression on his face was enough. No hits, he said. Dallas is seventy-one years old, and both Chicago's are military personnel. L.A. is already on the ground, and the FBI doesn't even have its team there yet. I'm sorry. Elizabeth shook her head. It's not too late. He's got to be in the L.A. airport or near it, trying to get out. He doesn't have another reservation. Don't we even have a bird watcher in a major airport like that? We don't have a picture or a description or anything else. Nobody's ever seen him. What are they supposed to do? You'll be getting on another flight. Try the name. It might not be any good now. Next time he can call himself Rufus T. Firefly if he feels like it. But there's got to be a way to stop him before he gets on another plane. It will be a one-way ticket bought for cash in the airport since his plane landed. 
I don't know, said Richardson. This is getting thinner and thinner. Please, said Elizabeth. This is closer than we ever got ten years ago. Jack Hamp was sitting in the coffee shop overlooking runway 23 with four engine mechanics from United when the crew chief happened to notice that the light on his beeper was blinking. It didn't blink often, so he didn't look at it often. He wasn't under the illusion that if there was an emergency, they would think to warn him, so a month after he had gotten this assignment, he had opened it up and cut the wire from the relay to the little speaker. Jack Hamp had managed to retire from the Los Angeles Police Department after twenty years and gotten a job as what he had thought was a Justice Department field investigator. At the moment, the job didn't involve much investigating. He was supposed to loiter in the L.A. airport and watch the huge, amorphous, anonymous crush of people getting on and off airplanes to see if he could spot any of the fifty or so men and women that the Justice Department was giving special attention to at any given moment. Most of the time, when somebody like that was coming through, Hamp would have the reservation in advance, and all he would have to do was to pass by the gate to see him step aboard, then report what he had seen. Subject Vincent Toscanzio. At 1353, subject boarded TWA Flight 921 for Chicago, ETA 7.53 p.m. Was accompanied by two male Caucasians listed as Harold Carver, positive ID Joseph Fortici, and Paul Smith, probable ID Frederick Moltare. It all went into the hopper for some analyst to sort out in Washington. The rest of the time he fished the crowds for special surprise guests nobody had known were out and about. He had no vanity, and he was good at looking like something other than a federal cop. He was six feet three and lanky, with pale blue eyes, long blonde hair, and a mustache. He looked like the aging cowboy he probably would have been if he hadn't been optimistic enough to join the Marines twenty-five years ago and accidentally seen a few big cities. He usually went to a gate when a crowded flight from a major departure point was unloading. He would stand a little back from the gauntlet of moms and pops, scrutinizing the file of passengers to see Junior a second earlier. He would carry an object, maybe a magazine, maybe only sunglasses or a set of car keys, but never a cup of coffee, because that was what people drank when they were on duty. And like the moms and pops, Jack Hamp would stare at each face for a moment right in the eyes because he, too, was hoping to recognize someone. He managed to pick out a few interesting faces each month, and this probably made his reports worth sending, but he didn't much like the assignment. He suspected he had gotten it because the department wanted him on the payroll but didn't have a clear idea what to do with him on a day-to-day -day basis. He was young to be a retired cop, forty-six, but he was too old and uneducated to be on the upward trail with the rest of the Boy Scouts. The Justice Department had put him through a refresher course in investigative techniques of the sort he had given to ten or twelve litters of rookie cops over the years, an orientation for federal employees that he had used to compile a list of whose calls he could ignore, and a little practice in shooting holes in cardboard cutouts that looked like the villains in a comic book. Then they had sent him back to L.A., Hamp walked with a barely perceptible limp as he got up and made his way to the pay telephone at the other end of the concourse. The man who had put the hole in his left thigh eight years ago had taken a little of the femur with it, and he sometimes felt the stainless steel pin. He dialed the number quickly. This is Hamp, he said. The man on the other end was somebody he had never talked to before, but Hamp knew Richardson's name. It was one of the ones he couldn't ignore. Ackerman walked to the Hong Kong Airlines desk. The man behind the counter was Chinese, but he had an engraved nameplate on his jacket that read Mr. Sullivan. His English accent made Ackerman homesick for Schaefer's life. "'May I help you, sir?' "'You have a flight to Hong Kong in twenty minutes,' he said. "'Do you have any seats left?' Mr. Sullivan clicked some keys on his computer. "'I'm sorry, sir. It's fully booked. We have another at 417.' Ackerman hesitated. Hong Kong was okay because he could go back through British customs after a week without raising any eyebrows. 
If he flew back through New York, there would be watchers in the airport, and he might never make it out. He decided that waiting was the smaller risk. I'll take it. May I have your passport, please? Ackerman plucked it from his coat pocket and handed it to Mr. Sullivan, who glanced at it and set it aside for a moment. How will you be paying for that, sir? Cash. Fine, said Mr. Sullivan. Let me just confirm that it's still available. He pressed three numbers on his telephone and began to speak in Chinese. Ackerman glanced around at the people lining up behind him and setting their luggage down. As he turned back, his eyes caught something peculiar. At the far end of the counter, there was another man speaking into a telephone in Chinese. It was the cadence that caught his attention. When Mr. Sullivan talked, the other man stopped, and then Mr. Sullivan said something, and the other man glanced in his direction. Ackerman watched the man until the two hung up almost simultaneously. He stood at the counter while Mr. Sullivan made out the ticket, copying his name from his passport, and then he walked away. He knew it was possible that Mr. Sullivan was only calling his supervisor to check on that reservation. It might even be that two conversations followed approximately the same course, ended at the same time, and had nothing to do with each other. But it might also be that two men who worked for Hong Kong Airlines had just made a year's salary. He had been away a long time. Ten years ago, the Balacantano family could steal the cargoes off wide-body planes in the middle of JFK and truck them out. It wasn't hard to believe that by now they could search passenger lists for the right alias. He walked to gate 28, where he was to board the flight for Hong Kong, then walked along the concourse until he found the right place to sit. It was two gates away, at gate 26. The seat he wanted was occupied, but a lot of flights were going to leave before he needed it. He used the time to buy a ticket for the 4.30 plane to Albuquerque, and then sat in a coffee shop where he could watch people coming through the metal detectors that guarded the concourse, until he realized that watching was pointless. They didn't have to send faces he knew. Somehow they had found out what name he was using. And they wouldn't be clumsy enough to get stopped by a metal detector. The gun would be concealed inside another steel object, or, more likely, was already here. He returned to Gate 26 and began his vigil with the idea that nothing would happen until they announced that his plane was boarding. Jack Hamp took his old carry-on bag out of the car and walked back through the front door, up to the metal detector station, where Marlita Gibson gave him a sober nod as she looked through the fluoroscope at the outlines of his Colt 45 1911 automatic and the spare magazines in the pocket beside it. Hamp had a strong desire not to fire it. The 225-grain semi-wad-cutter hollow-point ammunition was what he called the airport load. It not only mushroomed on impact, but expanded. It wasn't going through any walls if he missed. If he didn't miss, the recipient was going to find out that Jesus wanted him for a sunbeam. He snatched the bag off the conveyor and walked on. As he strode along the concourse toward Gate 28, he opened the bag and searched for a ticket folder in his collection that said Hong Kong Airlines. When he found it, he stuck it in his coat pocket where it could be seen. At the gate, he sat down in the smoking area, a few yards away from the nearest passenger, and lit a cigarette. If the man spotted him first, and was any kind of a shot, at least he wouldn't miss Hamp and put a hole in some kid's head. And this one might be pretty good. From what Richardson had said, he sounded like a genuine badass. As Hamp inhaled the first sweet, cool smoke from his cigarette, he thought about how much worse the last puff always tasted. He kept his eyes on the passing throng, moving from face to face, first studying, then rejecting. He acknowledged that if he was already thinking about how hot and nasty this cigarette was going to get, it was probably time to quit smoking. All the pleasure of it depended on your being able to keep things from yourself. He was going on the long odds that this Mr. Ackerman was going to be armed. It was highly unlikely that anybody could get on a plane at Kennedy and still be able to reach into his pants at LAX and come up with anything in his hand that he wasn't born with. But people who killed a lot for money got into the habit of brooding about such things in their spare time, 
and, more often than you would think, they found ways. Hamp glanced at the airline desk in front of the gate and noted that Mr. Sullivan was in position. As soon as Mr. Ackerman showed his face, he was going to meet Jack Hamp. Ackerman saw the tall, thin, melancholy, blonde man come into the waiting area at gate 28 and sit down to light a cigarette, and he studied him with special care. He had a worn carry-on bag and what looked like a Hong Kong Airlines ticket sticking out of his pocket. He was alone. He was doing pretty much what anybody would do in his position, which was to watch the people around him without letting them notice. But then Mr. Sullivan arrived. He came up to the second floor by climbing an exterior staircase, popped through the door they never let passengers use, and posted himself at the desk near the gate. But he didn't make any attempt to do anything that could be construed as work. Ackerman wasn't going anywhere on Hong Kong Airlines today. He decided he had better try to find out exactly what kind of trouble he was in. Ackerman moved to a seat that put the pillar at gate 27 between him and Mr. Sullivan at gate 28, and kept his eyes on the tall blonde man. The tall guy was a possibility. He had even managed to sit in the right place, where he had a clear fire zone in front of him and nobody behind him. But how the hell could they have gotten him here so quickly? Peter Mantino would practically have to keep the guy on call in the airport in case somebody he wanted showed up. That was unlikely. Ackerman still couldn't decide. The man had carried himself with a certain amount of confidence, as though he had some reason to be sure what was going to happen if he got into a fight, but as though he wasn't contemplating anything like that at the moment. It was the walk that came back to Ackerman. That was probably what had drawn his attention in the first place. He tried to picture it again, and when the man moved across his line of sight in his memory, he was favoring his left leg slightly. It was just the sort of unconscious change in his stride that two or three pounds of steel stuck on one side of his body might induce. No, the gun would be in the flight bag, where he could put his hand on it without attracting attention. Then something happened that was so unexpected that Ackerman didn't admit to himself that he had caught it at first. Four men entered the waiting area at gate 28 from different directions. They were all well over six feet tall and heavy, and they looked big and fat and white and obvious. They lurked in different parts of the waiting area, but kept glancing at each other to preserve fixed distances, like a team playing zones. Then each of them looked at the tall, thin, blonde man, as though they had been searching for him. From time to time each of them would watch him for a second and then turn away. Even the blonde man knew immediately that they were cops. Ackerman studied the man's reaction. The shooter couldn't believe it any more than Ackerman could. Whatever the shooter was carrying must have been picked up on the X-ray machine, or, more likely, somebody had seen him go wherever it was hidden in the airport and stick it in his bag. Now he was going to get arrested. Ackerman considered the possibility that he might be able to sit patiently until the cops rolled up the shooter, then stroll across to gate 28, step onto the plane, and get out of here. But then one of the cops started to walk toward the smoking area where the shooter was sitting, and the others, each in his own time, began to move closer. The shooter saw it, too, but he didn't look frightened. He looked angry, which was a very bad sign. It meant that he was at least considering doing something with the gun in his flight bag other than letting them take it and having his lawyer claim the bag wasn't his. Ackerman couldn't take the chance of sitting here while the tall guy opened fire. No matter what happened, this wasn't the way out of Los Angeles. He stood up and turned away, adopting the same purposeful, self-important gait as the men and women nearest to him on the concourse. They all seemed comfortable in the knowledge that airports weren't about space, but about time. Like them, he didn't pause anywhere or slow his pace, and he didn't look back. Elizabeth dialed her own number and waited four rings before the answering machine kicked in. Maria, she said, it's me. Please pick up the phone. After a few seconds, she heard the babysitter's voice. Wearing residence, said Maria. If she knew who it was, why did she say that? Elizabeth reluctantly accepted that she would have to explain it again, 
along with the part about the phone numbers. The line in the office at home was wearing. The one in the bedroom was Hart. Maria had easily understood that Jim's name was Hart, and that Elizabeth's name was Hart. But then Elizabeth had gotten overconfident and told her she used the name Waring at work. At first Maria had been suspicious. Did that mean that what Elizabeth did for a living was illegal? No, she was a government lawyer, and Waring had been her name before she was married. What did being married have to do with being a lawyer? Nothing. Then was being a government lawyer dangerous, like in Columbia? No, not usually. Then Elizabeth had been subjected to a lengthy cross-examination on precise gradations of risk. When Maria had satisfied herself that nobody was doing anything illegal that would put her in jeopardy of deportation, or anything dangerous that would harm the children, she had clearly decided that there was something disreputable going on. Her questions indicated that she suspected that Elizabeth had never been married, and that Hart was a fiction adopted to protect the illegitimate children. Since she loved the children, she could live with this. So where did Waring residence come from? Maria, Elizabeth said, how are the kids? No good. Not good? What's wrong? Her heart stopped beating and began to quiver. Jimmy wore dirty old sneakers to school. That's okay. I told him it was all right. This was a lie, but it was the only way to close the issue. Maria had been educated by nuns who really appeared to have believed that cleanliness was next to godliness, and she was convinced that going to school every day was a privilege to be celebrated in shined shoes, immaculate shirts, and pressed trousers. What about Amanda? She spit up. How much? A little spit up? Like a burp or a big one? Should I come home? Not too big. Little bit. But then she happy and go to sleep. Did you take her temperature? Yes, normal. Well, thanks, Maria. I'll call again later. You have the number here, right? I have it. Do you need anything? No. Goodbye. Goodbye. Elizabeth stared at the telephone. This was a special taste of hell that somebody had thought up for her. She had wanted children, and from the moment Jimmy had been conceived, she had understood that the term blessed with children wasn't an ironic way of saying it, but it really was how you felt. But there they were, and here she was. She was living the life she had said she would never live. Her children were growing up without seeing her for ten or twelve hours a day, while she was out chasing a career she didn't want. Another woman played with them, dressed them, took Amanda out in the stroller, and said the word tree or squirrel to her for the first time. She heard the phone in Richardson's office ring, and watched him snatch it off the hook. At first he looked elated, which meant that it was the FBI calling him from Los Angeles and not a file clerk letting him know that she was going to be late. But now he looked concerned, then frustrated. He leaned his head on his fist and let his shoulders slump from the tense shrug that had held them for the past five minutes, and she knew it was over. She drifted to the doorway and looked at him, lifting an eyebrow. They lost him, he said. Why? Her throat was dry, and it was just a sound to make anyway. It didn't matter. They don't know. He paid cash for a ticket to Hong Kong, then never showed up. Our bird watcher at the airport says it's because the FBI sent four identical G-man types who proceeded to walk up to him and ask him to point out the suspect, who incidentally was still calling himself Charles F. Ackerman. Today, he nodded. Today. Did the bird watcher say anything else? He's a little annoyed. He said if this guy's so important, how come nobody told the FBI to send the first team? Good question. I thought it was implied in what I told them, but he said they acted like we were after an 809er. What's that? I was afraid I was the only one who didn't know. It's what he calls a person carrying money out of the country for illegal purposes. They're not usually dangerous. What's 809, an IRS regulation? No, it's a telephone area code. Cayman Islands. Dutch Antilles. I'll remember that. It's probably where all the HUD money went. She turned and walked over to her old desk to get her purse. 
As she picked it up, she tried to remember whether she had left anything in the conference room. No. She could feel her pen, wallet, keys, and glasses through the soft glove leather. It was going to be all right. She could be in her office in the other building in time for work, and none of this would have to take up space in her mind. Then she realized that Richardson had followed her out. In a way, it was an appropriate gesture. She had given up several hours of her time to a division she didn't work for, and somehow the fiction had been allowed to grow between them that they had been friends in the old days, so for the moment it was good to maintain the pretense long enough for her to get out of here gracefully. The truth was that when she had left the section ten years ago, she had officially gone on vacation and then never come back. She'd had no impulse to say goodbye to anyone at the time, and when it had occurred to her that she should have, it was too late. Nobody in the office had called her either. Elizabeth, Richardson said. He was going to thank her for the favor. Fine, she thought. She'd say it was nothing, and then she would be out of here. But he said, I've got a favor to ask. Nine. Carlo Balacantano had been playing gin rummy since he was twelve, and he was very good at it. In October, he would be sixty-six. And it was one of the things he could still do as well as he ever had, because even though his arms were no longer heavily muscled and his knees were sometimes a little stiff, his mind was still able to determine and remember the locations of all fifty-two cards, if a game came down to that. Usually he needed to hold only about thirty in his head at once, and he could do that, talk and think about business, at the same time. But today he wasn't doing any of that, because he was sitting across the weightlifting table from José Luc Ospina. Every day Carl Bala came to sit under the overhanging roof of the weight training area. When he approached in his slow, leisurely stroll, four young men would step up and begin to haul the barbells off the leather-bound table, so that he could sit down, take his deck of cards out of the breast pocket of his blue denim shirt, and rip open the package. This ritual had gone on since his second month at Lompoc Federal Correctional Facility, eight years ago. He would have begun to play gin right away, but for the first four weeks he had been out of his mind. His lawyers had assured him right up until the last day that his case would be retried in the Court of Appeals. But the judge had read the trial transcript in one afternoon, then ruled that there were no grounds for appeal. This had somehow stuck with him during the next few weeks, tormenting him, awake or asleep. Carl Bala was not a no-neck whose reading speed was determined by how fast he could move his lips, but he simply did not believe that anyone could read twelve hundred pages of testimony in one afternoon. He suspected that the pompous little bastard was one of those people who had gone to a class where they learned to read by moving their index fingers down the center of the page. The fact that after all these years he had finally been convicted on a bogus charge had not struck him as outrageous. With few exceptions, the people he knew who had gone to jail had been guilty, but not necessarily guilty of the particular crimes discussed at their trials. The system knew its enemies. If he'd had the choice of either accepting the simple murder of Arthur Fieldston or confessing to all the things he had actually done, he would have chosen Fieldston. These days, the irritant that made Carlo angry most frequently was the existence of José Ospina. Four years ago, on a summer afternoon, Bala Cantano had arrived at the wait table to see the usual gaggle of prisoners wearing the thick leather belts cinched around their middles to keep their guts from popping out, straining to raise the heavy weights above their heads and curling the small barbells to make their already bulging forearms look like ham hocks. He had sat down at the table, pulled the little red string to open the cellophane on his new deck of cards, removed the jokers, and begun to shuffle. Then he had looked up to see a tall, dark young man with curly black hair and eyes like a cat sit down across from him. The man had his shirt cut off at the sleeves to reveal bony arms decorated with strange greenish tattoos. There were pictures of some sort of vegetation. They didn't look like natural plants. They seemed almost architectural. Most maddening of all, they looked familiar. Carlo Balacantano didn't recognize the tattoos until José Ospina had set his cards down on the table and whispered, 
Jin. Then he had taken off his shirt, and Bala had found himself staring at the face of Benjamin Franklin. The tattoos were the flourishes and scroll work engraved on a hundred-dollar bill. From that day onward, Jose Espina proceeded to ruin Carl Bala's life. Carl Bala was rich. Even now in New York, there were large, quiet men who spent all their time driving big, heavy cars to various places of commerce to collect his rake-offs, percentages, and tributes. He was also famous, in the way that mattered. Even here, three thousand miles and eight years away from the scenes of his triumphs, he could have walked into a hotel on the shore of the Pacific and taken the best suite in the place on the strength of his name. But that was in the outside world, and Carl Bala wasn't living in the world. He was in a small, sun-bleached federal prison twenty miles into the dry yellow countryside of central California, hedged between jagged, impassable stone mountains that rose abruptly from the valley floor to the east and broad, open lowlands that stretched to the sea on the west. Twenty miles of sparse, ankle-high weeds with every mile or so a crabbed, tortured live oak tree no more than eight feet tall to provide the only shade. In this place, meeting Jose Ospina was like watching a cockroach scurrying off his dinner plate. At first he had been a shock, but Carl Bala had tried to reconcile himself to it. Then, day after day, he had sat and felt the sting as the young man, looking a little bored, had set his cards on the wait table before him, and said in his soft voice, Jin. Even worse, there were times when Jose Ospina would watch Balacantano discard once, then pick up his cards, fan them out, close the fan, and say, I'll knock with ten, or eight, or three. And Carlo would be frantically leafing through his brand new hand, staring at the face cards, aces and tens he hadn't had time to count up, let alone unload. Stacked decks, Carl Bala could have understood. But these things happened when Jose Hospina hadn't so much as cut the cards. Palming and substituting a whole hand was not unheard of on the planet Earth. But Jose Hospina always played with the sleeves cut off his shirt, the flourishes of scrollwork copied from the currency of the United States visible running up his bare arms. He had no place to hide extra cards, no way of cheating at all. Jose Ospina was lucky. Admittedly, he was a pitiless, competitive, supernaturally alert gin player, but the immutable forces of probability and chance simply kissed him on the forehead and passed by him each day to settle with their customary ferocity on the shoulders of Carl Bala. Bala found himself living in this little penal outpost, where the only pleasure permitted him was winning at gin— something that happened so seldom now that when it did it felt like mockery. Carlo had used his status in the prison underground to find out what he could about Jose Ospina, and had obtained a copy of Ospina's official file. He had learned that Jose Ospina had been transferred to Lompoc after two years of good behavior at Marion, Illinois, where he had been serving five to ten on a conviction for possession of counterfeit money, and an arsenal of automatic weapons, including an M-60 machine-gun. Under distinguishing marks and scars was a description of the greenish tattoos, which the prison rumor establishment, later told Balacantano, had been done in Marion by Espina's partner, a talented engraver named Cardero. Under place of birth was the entry Lexington, Kentucky, suspicious since Espina had a thick Spanish accent. But when he double-checked eye color, the form said hazel, the category in which the United States government placed all colors other than brown or blue. Ospina's eyes were certainly not blue or brown. They were bright golden yellow, which was to say hazel. There was no sign that he was a card mechanic or a gambler or even intimate with gamblers. So Carlo had concluded that Ospina was merely riding a streak of luck like the vein of gold under Sutter's mill, long and deep, but still finite, and he had decided to wait it out. He had been waiting it out for three and a half years of frustration and simmering anger, having run up a tab of $344,000 in the process. 
In that time, he had stepped up his purchases of decks of cards, sometimes bringing out a fresh one twice in a single day. He had also been treated by the prison doctor for an incipient ulcer, and given a rubber mouthpiece to keep him from grinding his teeth while he slept. In 1958, when all of the East was at war over territory and dominance, and every three days somebody was found mutilated in the trunk of his car or broke loose from his anchor and popped to the surface of a river, Carl Bala had been able to eat heaping plates of hot sausage and peppers, then sleep like a hibernating bear. But not now. The effort of containing the anger had begun to threaten his robust constitution. The only release he had for his hatred was to send messages to his employees, subordinates, relatives and colleagues who lived in the outer world, demanding that they find the man who had framed him and get him out. Lately his demands had become more urgent, the implied rewards more princely, and the veiled threats more dire. There were already those who believed that, like others before him, Carlo had gone mad in prison. But a madman with untold millions of dollars might overspend to reward those who humored him. And nobody doubted that, mad or not, Carlo Balacantano would be capable of finding strong hands to carry out any form of revenge that stayed in his agitated imagination, long enough to turn it into words. These threats had become particularly worrisome to some of the lieutenants, who were now serving as stewards and trustees of his empire. Giovanni John the Baptist Bautista... Antonio Tony T. Talarese, Salvatore Calistro, Peter Mantino. These men had covered themselves in advance by mentioning Carl Bala's mad desires with exaggerated seriousness to their soldiers at more frequent intervals as the years passed, and Bala Cantano's people were becoming more easy to imagine. Batista and Mantino had also quietly discussed the possibility that if the culprit didn't turn up before the old man's first parole board hearing, it might be inconvenient or even suicidal to let him walk out of prison alive. Talarese had come to the same conclusion independently, spurred by the possibility that the old man might figure out that Talarese had been stealing some of the profits. Carlo Balacantano had intuited much of this, and informers had kept him abreast of the rest. He could easily have taken his revenge from the prison yard, but he needed these men for now. Thinking that they were working to fill their own pockets, they were amassing a greater hoard that he would come back and reclaim later. But he needed their memories more than their greed. They were all old enough to have seen the man he wanted. The young wise guys, the little weasels who were so eager to sell their bosses to the imprisoned chieftain and take over their fiefs, were too young. The butcher's boy hadn't been seen by anyone in ten years. Carlo Balacantano knew how the system worked. In order to get out, he would have to supply the system with someone to take his place. The replacement could be dead, as long as something linking him to the murder of Arthur Fieldston was found with him. A forged suicide note with a confession, the cigarette lighter that Bala had pocketed at Fieldston's office in the old days, when he had been there to discuss a deal, anything. A reasonable doubt might be enough excuse for someone to sell him a pardon, and would almost certainly be enough to get him a parole after eight years. Then he could get away from this place and from José Ospina, the man who was driving him mad. Elizabeth Waring sat in the small cinder-block building just inside the gate of the prison, watching the other visitors go through the formalities with the prison guards. There were a pair of lawyers who seemed to know each other, one tall, thin, and bespectacled, and the other a squat little blonde man with a brown suit that looked as though he had bought it cheap in a store that had a fat boy's department. They kept calling each other counselor and learned colleague as though it were a long-standing joke. Fidgeting nervously on a bench across from her were three women who bore the same dazed, sickly expression on their faces, but had nothing else in common. One was a young, coffee-colored girl who seemed no more than nineteen. She wore a shapeless brown-and-black outfit that seemed to include a kind of sweatshirt and something below that could have been a pair of pants from an Israeli paratrooper's uniform, but in sizes so large that her shy, cringing posture allowed her to hide in the material. Beside her was a tall, thin, blonde woman, 
who might have been fifty, but had such tight skin on her cheeks and forehead that she might as easily have been thirty-five. Her nose had likewise felt the surgeon's scalpel, and seemed rightfully to belong to some sort of teenage girl who waited on tables in a short skirt and luminous pantyhose. She wore no jewelry except a gold wedding band and an engagement ring with a diamond that might have been two carats. The third woman was about thirty, and Elizabeth had grouped her with the lawyers until she sat down with the other women, and her face assumed the same fixed, humiliated expression. She wore a business suit and a white silk blouse with a bow at the neck that wasn't a good idea. She even carried a briefcase. When the guard called, Henley, she stood up, walked to the desk and handed the briefcase to the guard, who opened it and removed a black lace negligee. The guard left the garment on the desk while he went through the briefcase for contraband, and Elizabeth could see that the woman's ashen face was aimed downward, her eyes not on the guard but on the negligee, as though she were willing it to disappear. The two lawyers stopped talking and stared frankly at the proceedings, then listened while the guard repeated a short orientation speech on the rules of conjugal visits. The young black woman seemed to shrink still deeper into her clothes, but the older woman turned to wood, staring straight ahead like the figurehead on the prow of a sailing ship. "'Miss Waring?' The voice was behind her. She stood up and turned to see a man in a suit waiting for her. He looked like a dentist, serene and well-scrubbed, with a shiny bald head. He held the door open, and Elizabeth went through it to the concrete steps outside, then shook the man's hand. "'I'm Assistant Warden Bateson,' the man said. "'I was told to expect you. Anything special you need?' Elizabeth would have preferred to hear a list of standard procedures for this kind of meeting. "'I'd like to see him alone, and I suppose it would be better if the other prisoners didn't know about it.' Bateson smiled. "'No problem there. We only have three conjugal visits, so we've got a couple of bungalows vacant. He's been assigned to clean one of them.' She sighted along Bateson's pointing finger to a small, low cinderblock building, just inside the fence. It looked like a communal bathroom in a trailer campground near a national park. "'Can I be of any help?' asked Bateson. "'No,' Elizabeth said. At the door of the little building, Elizabeth stopped and listened. There was a slow, rhythmic scraping sound, then a splash and clank, then silence. She opened the door slowly, which set off another clank. She took the scene in at a glance. The mop had been set in the bucket and leaned against the door so that it would warn Balakantano in time to get up off the bed. When he saw her, the old man was swinging his feet to the floor, not looking toward the door at all, but reaching for his shoe and pretending to tie the lace. She hadn't even seen a picture of him in ten years, but he looked about the way she remembered him. He was short and stocky, and wore his hair combed straight back, but close at the neck so that it didn't touch the collar of his blue workshirt. The prison jeans looked odd and baggy on him, as jeans always do on old men, the unaccustomed informality of them evoking a businessman who had bought them to wear on vacation and never broken them in. Balakantana's face was pinched and the nose hawk-like his little eyes glaring back at Elizabeth from behind a pair of glasses with a slight brownish tint. He finished tying his shoelace, then put the other foot up on his knee to tighten its lace, to show he hadn't been caught at anything. "'Keep your clothes on,' he said. "'Your old man will be out here when I finish.' "'Mr. Balacantano,' Elizabeth said. "'That's right. "'My name is Elizabeth Waring. "'Good for you.' The old man stood up, walked to the bucket, placed the mop in the ringer, and prepared to go back to work on the floor. Elizabeth reached into the inner pocket of her purse, pulled out a little leather wallet, and held it out toward Balacantano. U.S. Justice Department. He glanced at it, but showed no interest. I have a couple of questions for you, if you've got time. Balacantano leaned on his mop, and the cold eyes turned on Elizabeth, as though he had just noticed her presence and found it peculiar. "'Is that some lame witticism?' "'No,' said Elizabeth. "'Not at all.' "'Save your questions,' said the old man. He didn't sound bitter or angry. "'I don't answer questions.' 
Elizabeth had prepared herself for this. These aren't hard ones. They're about an enemy of yours. Just out of curiosity, what are you offering me? Elizabeth sighed. I don't usually have much to do with the people who run these places. She looked around the sparsely furnished room with mild distaste. It looked like motels built fifty or sixty years ago, when they had consisted of six little shacks arranged around a gravel drive. I plan to tell Warden Bateson that you cooperated. I don't know if that buys you time off for good behavior, or just two desserts at dinner. Carl Bala looked at her shrewdly. Come back when you can tell me which. Elizabeth met his gaze. Last night, Antonio Talarese was murdered. The killer was somebody named the Butcher's Boy. Do you know him? Balacantano considered his options in a new way. You're from the Justice Department? She nodded. What do you do there? She decided that telling part of the truth would give the right impression. I'm an agent on temporary duty with the organized crime section. I'm here because I think there's something unusual going on. I didn't bring my resume with me. What makes you think I know anything about this Tony Talarese or this other guy? Elizabeth took a deep breath. This man must be better at detecting lies than any prosecutor. The fact that he was alive and in his sixties proved it. She would have to work into it slowly. The charts in organized crime show an arrow going up from Antonio Talarese to you. That means you're his boss. If that's not true, let me know and we'll change the chart. It's no trouble. We have to change it anyway because he's dead. This isn't how it works, you know. I'm supposed to have my lawyers with me, and then we sit down and talk over your offer. If we can cut a reasonable deal, I tell you something. They can't just send some special agent in here to flash a badge and ask me questions. Okay, she said. I understand. I assure you that you won't be bothered again for the rest of your sentence. Bala looked into her eyes, and the thought occurred to him that maybe she wasn't lying. This was it, the first time in eight years that they had even bothered to come here. It was one thing to bargain hard, but it was another to see the only buyer on earth walking out the door. Wait a minute. At least let's talk for a minute. All right. She sat down on the chair across from the bed. Here's what it amounts to from my point of view. You want me to do something that's risky. I have a right to something in return. Here's what it amounts to from my point of view, she said. At the moment, the Justice Department is interested in finding the man who killed Tony Talarese. I believe you are, too. The difference is that you're in jail and I'm not. Oh, and there's another difference. You know who he is, and I don't. You're not offering me a pardon or an early release or anything? Elizabeth shook her head. I'm not at the level to make that kind of offer, and nobody would approve it. Those things have happened, but much more seldom than you'd think from the amount of publicity they get. And what nobody mentions is that they always involve special conditions. What kind of special conditions? It was time for the lie, and she gave it apologetically, so that she could look down and avoid his sharp little eyes. Look, I don't know an awful lot about your case. She knew everything about his case. But I don't want to lie to you. As I understand it, you're not a likely candidate. In addition to being cooperative, the person provides some evidence that what he did was minor, or that there were extenuating circumstances. I was innocent. Is that extenuating enough? She ignored his protest. I just thought that since this man murdered a friend of yours last night, you might at least know who he is. Carl Bala considered. If he said nothing, that would be the end of his pardon. If he said something, what would this woman do to him? He could tell the story in a way that wouldn't incriminate anyone but himself for what had happened in the old days. If he did, what were the police going to do to him? Throw him in jail for longer than life? There was omerta to be considered, 
but if he didn't mention anyone else's name, the cops couldn't go after them. So how would they know he had talked? Besides, from what he had heard, Omerta didn't mean shit to anybody these days. This was just the same as it had been all his life. A simple question of consequences. If he told her what he knew, maybe she could begin a process that would someday get him out. But even if he was making a mistake, there was nothing she could do to him. The one thing he was sure of was that it was his last chance. Yeah, you bet I know him, he shouted. He knew that he had spoken too loud, but it had taken such an effort to break the words free that he had forgotten to modulate his voice. Elizabeth kept her face slack to hide her surprise. Who is he? He's the crazy little bastard who framed me for murder. Balakantana let go of his mop and let the handle topple to the floor, then sat on the bed. Elizabeth watched the discarded glasses bounce once on the tight blanket. Balakantano noticed them, too, and went through the ritual of putting them back on. You want to close out your file on him? I want to close out my file on him, too. But not just yet. First he's got to give me my life back. Ten years ago, I made a mistake. I was an important man, capo di tutti capos. I had a lot on my mind in those days. You probably think it's like the movies. An old guy with a face like a prune and a shiny suit sits behind a table in a room so dark you can't hardly see him and sends big zombies out to machine gun a mom-and-pop grocery store because they didn't pay their nut that week. Looking at Balakantano, Elizabeth decided this was probably accurate. All the old man needed was the suit. Well, said Bala, it's not. It's like any other business. It's the shifting of capital to where it's going to do the most good. At the time I came here, at least 95% of my business was perfectly legal. I had interests in corporations, T-bills, oil leases, franchises, bonds, real estate, stocks. That's what made the money. Why do you think people who really own this country put their money in those things? Because they've got no balls? Let me tell you. If Citibank or Solomon Brothers thought they could make more money stealing cars, you wouldn't be able to get a ride from here to the bathroom. Once in a while, when things got rough, I'd cut a corner. Was that your mistake? asked Elizabeth. She couldn't believe it. Carlo Balacantano was talking to the Justice Department. Cutting corners? Bala's left eyebrow formed an arch. Please don't make me think you're stupid now. Elizabeth had allowed herself to get too excited to think clearly. She had to concentrate on what he said and keep him talking. How did this man fit in? Did he work for you? Balakantano thought about it, then shook his head. Even the people who worked for me weren't like that. Employees with a lunch bucket. But he was something else. He was a specialist. One day, with no warning, I suddenly developed a tax problem. And I want you to know I wasn't the only one. Some of the biggest corporations in the country developed the same problem on the same day. As Bala remembered it, he could still feel the shock and outrage as though he were hearing it for the first time instead of telling it. A United States senator, who had been obsessed with the unfairness of the income tax laws for twenty years, had begun to assemble a list of profitable corporations. They were doing nothing illegal, which was why they made such an effective set of public examples. All they were doing was plowing profits back into the business on capital improvements, acquisitions, new markets, new equipment. But in the computer search, the senator's staff had uncovered, along with the corporate giants, a company called FGE. They had left it on the preliminary list because it sounded big. The G and E might have stood for gas and electric. But FGE had been a low, dirty, beige building beside a shopping mall on the edge of Las Vegas. Half the building consisted of rented post office boxes, and the rest was devoted to a small office with second-hand furniture and paneling on the walls that looked like wood but wasn't. In it, a man named Arthur Fieldston did business as Fieldston Growth Enterprises. 
His entire trade consisted of receiving large amounts of cash from the quiet men Carl Bala sent to him, and paying it out to accounts that Carl Bala designated as payment for imaginary investments and services. The day Carl Bala learned that FGE was about to become famous, he had experienced a shock that felt as though he had taken a sucker punch from a small, weak opponent. He summoned Harry Orloff, the fat, disreputable lawyer who had invented FGE, to his farm in Saratoga and ordered him to dismantle his invention. Orloff had whined that it would take weeks, and in the meantime Arthur Fieldston, the last remaining member of a well-known Western landowning family, would receive a subpoena to testify before the Senate Finance Committee. At that moment, Carlo Balacantano had experienced a fit of something he would later describe to himself as mad caution. He had exaggerated the importance of the problem in his own mind. Then he had told Harry Orloff it was worth his life to be sure Fieldston didn't testify. To Elizabeth he said, My attorney, Harry Orloff, decides that he needs time to get the papers in order. He tells himself the only way is to get the senator who's causing the problem. That was Senator Claremont of Colorado. Elizabeth was listening to something she had waited ten years to hear. It was what had brought her into the case. At first, everyone had thought the senator had committed suicide, but then the lab people had discovered that the poison had been in the glass he'd used to soak his false teeth. But Carlo Balacantano was still talking. I didn't know what Orloff was doing to take care of things until it was too late. I'm sitting in a restaurant in New York one night, nice family place owned by the son of a friend of mine, and I get the word. This United States senator didn't die in his sleep in Colorado. Or he did, but the reason he happened to do that was that Harry Orloff had managed to hire a specialist to come in and do him. I'm shocked. I'm knocked on my ass. I'm furious. On the one hand, the hearings are held off, and Arthur Fieldston is hiding so he can't be dragged in to answer questions. On the other, my little tax problem with Arthur Fieldston is nothing compared to assassinating a fucking senator. I figure my only hope is that the rest of the world is going to look at the list of corporations getting subpoenas, and figure that one of the oil companies or the car companies had decided they might save a couple billion dollars by not answering too many questions. The problem is that when a big public figure dies, everybody in the country with a badge, gun, or law degree, or even a typewriter, comes out to beat the bushes. And that's where I made my second mistake. I'm sitting there at the table in the restaurant, and there's a candle burning on the table. My man tells me that Harry Orloff needs $200,000 to pay off the specialist because he's done his job and he's just shown up in Las Vegas to collect. I'm already so pissed off I can barely see. I'm looking at my guy, and it's like his face is at the end of a red tunnel. My head is pounding, and I notice I'm breathing so hard that the candle flame is flapping like a flag. When I hear the part about the 200,000 and the specialists showing up and registering at Caesars, I go absolutely berserk. I tell the people at the table with me that I want out of this. I want it to be like it never happened. And that was it. What do you mean? asked Elizabeth. That was what? Balacantano shrugged. That's what put me in here. What I'm guilty of is understating my income to the IRS. I figure two years is enough time on that, so I ought to be out six years ago. Elizabeth's face showed no expression. Except they tell me you weren't convicted of tax evasion. Balacantano waved his hand in frustration. You've got to understand what we're talking about here. I don't know how to make you see it. There's a lot of talk about hitmen and all that, so it sounds like going to an exterminator or something. What people don't think about is that getting somebody killed isn't all that hard. I saw a couple of days ago in the paper that some woman in Phoenix hired two teenagers to strangle her husband for a hundred bucks apiece. With competition like that, how does anybody make a living? I'll tell you how. There are only maybe five or six genuine specialists that I know about, so there can't be more than two dozen tops. And they're an odd bunch. You hear about movie stars and famous heart surgeons and these morons with the guitars, and somebody says they're prima donnas. 
They don't know what the hell a prima donna is. These specialists I'm talking about are very hard to deal with. A movie star does it for the money, sure, but he likes the applause, too. The glamour. The admiration. Not these people. They honestly and sincerely don't give a shit what you think, whether you like them or hate them. If people flock around them or avoid them, it's all the same. A friend of mine once told me it was because their egos were so big that they didn't think anybody else was even real. I don't know if that's true, but it's not out of the question. If you hear about some piece of ass who decides she's a great actress and throws tantrums at the director, people say she's impossible. You want to see impossible? Try sitting across a table from a guy who wouldn't notice if he had to tear your heart out of your chest on the way out because he's done it a hundred times before, and he's so good at it he can do it without having to wash his hands. Well, that was the kind of man Harry Orloff hired to delay the Senate hearings. One of the fifteen or twenty serious specialists. After that... When I said I wanted everything to be as though the whole Fieldston fiasco never happened, I was talking in general terms, and I was misunderstood. What did they do? Balakantano sighed. They arranged a meeting to pay him, but it was really a setup to lure him out on the Las Vegas Strip and blow his head off. I take it this was without your knowledge. Damned right. They only had it half figured out. They knew he could be terrible trouble and had to be out of the picture as soon as possible. They also knew that nobody strolls up to a professional killer and says, Sorry, pal, it was all a mistake. The man who hired you had no right, so we're not going to pay you. But what didn't occur to them is that there's a reason why these characters keep going into dark places with people where you know only one of them is going to come out. And it's always the same one. I'm not saying my people should have known what the reason was, because I sure don't. I'm saying they should have known that there was a reason and accepted it, and given the son of a bitch's lousy two hundred thousand and prayed to God they never saw him again. It's like watching the same dog go down a hundred rabbit holes and always come out with a belly full of rabbit. When you come to the hundred and first hole, do you bet on the rabbit? Elizabeth could see the frustration and anger growing in the old man as the story began to move closer to his own defeat. What he didn't know was that it was hers, too, seen from the other side as though through one-way glass. What happened? Carl Bala smiled a sad little half-smile and snorted as he thought about it. You probably wonder why I can tell you all this, don't you? The question did occur to me, Elizabeth conceded. Because they're dead. Harry Orloff, all of the people I'm talking about. He killed six or eight people that night. I think he didn't get Orloff until the next morning. Carlo felt a little twinge at the mention of Orloff because he had ordered his death personally. But it was the same thing. He wouldn't have had to if it hadn't been for the butcher's boy by that time running amok. A man who had shown that he could and would do anything, who had no allegiance to anybody, no discernible fear, and nothing to protect. Balakantano had simply reasoned that if Orloff were gone, the hired killer might not be able to figure out who he had been working for. That had turned out to be his third mistake. But he didn't stop there. He went across town to Castiglione's house. I thought the Castiglione's were a Chicago family. Balacantano looked at her, distracted, then seemed to collect himself. He spoke patiently. This is old Paolo I'm talking about. He was retired. Don't get me wrong, though. Castiglione was still a very important man. In the old days, he used to run Chicago. I don't know how old he was ten years ago, but he had to be in his late eighties. He lived in a big brick house at the edge of Las Vegas because it was supposed to be good for his emphysema. Vegas was under a truce. All the families had business there, and anybody could go there. Castiglione was one of the old ones. Strong. Didn't know what pity was. When he retired, he had generations of enemies. You should have seen the place he had there. From the street, all you could see was a big wall. 
When you got through the gate, it looked like the Maginot Line. There were floodlights and windows like slits in a pillbox. I wouldn't be able to swear he didn't have the place booby-trapped, too. Somebody new bought it a few years ago, and I wouldn't be surprised if some day they flipped a switch in the den and half the lawn blew up. Anyway... It's late at night, and this character has just finished turning my friend's little ambush into what looked like a busy day on the Eastern Front. But he doesn't go away. Instead, he takes a little drive over to Castiglione's. The rest of it nobody knows much about, because everybody there is, as usual, dead. This includes old Castiglione, his four bodyguards, and, get this... A special agent of the FBI who just happened to be there because his job was to sit in a car down the street and take pictures of everybody who came to the old man's house. So when I wake up the next morning, not only is Senator Claremont still dead, but so are five or six men who worked for me, and the lawyer who set up some corporations for me and who hid Arthur Fieldston so he couldn't accept a subpoena. So I've got millions of dollars in accounts that only Arthur Fieldston can sign on, and no living people on the spot to find him, and my little tax problem has turned into a multiple murder case involving a federal officer. Then around noon, things got ugly. I didn't get any phone calls. I got visitors. All day and most of the night, lots of very important men pulled into my driveway and came into my parlor and sat in my chairs and asked me what the hell I was doing breaking a truce that had kept Las Vegas open for forty years. Some of them thought I'd killed Castiglione. Some of them didn't know what to think. But all of them knew that when the sun came up in Vegas, there were about a dozen corpses lying around out there, and that maybe half of them belonged to me, and the others were Castiglione's. Balacantano seemed to be out of breath, but he added quickly, Except for the federal cop, who was going to attract such an army of federal undercover types that even the payphones would be tapped for the next hundred years. Why did he go to Castiglione's? Did he think Orloff was working for Castiglione? Hell no, said Balacantano. He did it because he knew it was going to create confusion. And it worked. To tell you the truth, I don't think he had any idea who those guys were working for. But he was sure that as soon as the newspapers printed their names, there'd be people a whole lot scarier than he was who would know. The thing that scared me wasn't who showed up at my house. It was who didn't. I spent the next few days kissing powerful asses because I was going to need them on my side if things blew up. Even after I did, it was a near thing. Elizabeth prompted him. What did you do about the killer? Balacantano studied the little woman who sat across from him and had a thought, but then dismissed it. She was a bureaucrat. I did what anybody would do. I hunted him with everything I had. He stared at her for a reaction, but she waited in silence. Balacantano shrugged. He found Arthur Fieldston before I did. I don't know how far he was thinking ahead. Maybe he knew that I couldn't get my money back if Fieldston was dead, and then he thought of the rest of it after he'd killed him. He buried Fieldston's head and hands behind the stable at my farm, then made a phone call to the Justice Department. Nobody ever saw him again until now. He looked at Elizabeth. You've got to help me. I'll do my best to find him. I'm not talking about him. I'm talking about me. He's just the way to get me out of here. I'm not your attorney. But if you do get an appeal, I wouldn't tell the judge everything, said Elizabeth. I shouldn't have to tell a bastard anything, Balacantano said. I'm not... "'Wasn't some errand boy. "'Does anybody seriously think I went out and shot Arthur Fieldston, "'then sawed off his head and hands in Arizona "'and brought them across the country to bury them in my yard? "'The only two parts you can use to prove who it was? "'What do you think I am, Edgar Allan Poe? "'Well?' "'I'm wondering who you think Edgar Allan Poe was,' said Elizabeth. "'You know what I mean. "'I was an important man.' When they have those cars with power surges that kill people, do they go to the president of the company and dig up his backyard to see if he's buried some suspicious carburetors? No. Does anybody even wonder who made the anonymous phone call to the Justice Department? 
Elizabeth had asked the same question in as many words ten years ago, but her superiors had been too eager to convict Balakantano to listen. She had asked it so many times that they had sent her on a vacation and deleted her name from the record of the investigation, so that the defense couldn't call her to testify. Can you tell me where to find him? The old man's anger and frustration were barely controllable now. If I knew that, do you think I'd be sitting here talking to you? You're the one who's got to hunt him down. Elizabeth stood up and glanced at her watch. Just for the record, do you want to tell me his name? No, said Balakantano. I don't know his name. What the hell does he need a name for? Ten. He hated to throw away the name Charles Ackerman. It had been a comfort since Eddie Mistruski had given it to him as a child, and it was his oldest possession. Eddie the butcher had always assumed that some day a lapse of professionalism would put an end to him, and the young boy he had taken in would be alone and running. The first thing he would need was money, and the second was a plausible identity, and Eddie knew how to provide him with both. The money Eddie wrapped in a package that looked exactly like the ones he kept in the freezer for the cat. Like them, it was marked "Giblets and Gizzards for Cat." The identity had been almost as easy in those days. Eddie took the boy for a walk in the sprawling forty-acre Catholic cemetery at the edge of town one sunny Memorial Day, when hundreds of other families were wandering over the grass and looking uncertain about exactly where Grandpa was buried. He'd had the foresight to buy a small bouquet of forget-me-nots on the way, which he carried with just the right degree of discomfort. They had taken a pleasant walk in the sunshine to look for the gravestone of a child born in 1950, 51, or 52, who had died after the age of five, but before the age of twelve. They had found six of them, and Eddie had dutifully copied down the names, the dates, and his estimate of the cost of the stones. Then they went to look at a couple of graves of men they had encountered professionally, and Eddie had explained his theory of reasonable fees. It was his hypothesis that the cost of a man's gravestone should be proportionate to the fee Eddie had received for killing him. Important men left lots of money, had lots of admirers, or at least associates, and had heirs who would not miss this final chance to remind people that they had been relations of powerful men. Killing these men was potentially more difficult and dangerous than killing the ones with small domestic granite plaques that bore only a name and two dates. Eddie had appeared satisfied, even though two of the men had eight-foot-high Italian marble structures, the size of tool sheds, with carved birds, flowers, statues of angels holding trumpets, and lengthy passages of verse that might have been copied verbatim from Hallmark Mother's Day cards. The next day, Eddie had taken him to the county hall. There, Eddie had paid three dollars for a duplicate birth certificate for his nephew Charles F. Ackerman. He had eliminated the other five possibilities because two had names that didn't seem likely. He remembered that one of them was Wong Cho Fo. Two had graves in the middle of huge empty plots, which meant that they still had lots of living family members the boy might some day meet. And one had a gravestone of such massive proportions and extravagant opulence that it must have been a sign of either conspicuous wealth or a memorable death. Thereafter, Charles Frederick Ackerman used his birth certificate to obtain a social security card, used both to apply for a driver's license, then opened a bank account in a city a hundred miles away, where he also obtained a library card and a post office box. Then he began to get on mailing lists, and Charles F. Ackerman took on a kind of life, with credit cards, club memberships, and finally even a pistol permit. In later years, he had built a dozen other identities that he had used and discarded, but he had never done much as Charles F. Ackerman. After Eddie had died, the name had begun to seem precious, and he couldn't think of it without remembering the sunny Memorial Day when he and Eddie had strolled together on the unnaturally lush green grass, playing the game of finding dead children with approximately the right dates of birth. Charles Ackerman's existence wasn't as well documented as Michael Schaeffer's. But it was older and deeper, started before the age of computers, and well established before a policeman would imagine he'd had the need or the capacity for adopting it. 
The methods he had used to create the identity were now out of date and impossible, because the trick had been done so many times for so many reasons that the police had put a stop to it years ago. He hated to say goodbye to Charlie Ackerman, but he had to. He had rented the car in Albuquerque under the name, and that had to be the end of it. The gun had been easier. He had found an advertisement for a firearm show in the Albuquerque newspaper, clipped it, then gone into a gun shop and looked around for something that would inspire the right amount of greed in the heart of an aficionado. He settled on an antique Italian shotgun with ornate scrollwork carved into the stock. It even had a carrying case that looked like a briefcase. He had taken it to the show and walked past the booths run by dealers, but lingered at the card tables manned by private collectors, until he had found the right one. The man was in his fifties and had a potbelly that he kept in check with a wide belt with a silver buckle that had a bird dog on it with turquoise eyes. He had five handguns to sell, three of them nickel-plated modern replicas of Colt forty-five single-action revolvers with white plastic hand grips like the ones the good guys used in cowboy movies, and two shotguns, one of them a double-barreled ten-gauge that his grandfather might have used for hunting ducks. The man had eyed his gun case and said, "'What'd you buy?' He had opened it, and the man's eyes had widened, then narrowed. "'I brought it with me,' Ackerman said. "'I'm trying to see if anybody wants to trade.' The man asked, "'What would you take?' Ackerman indicated that the Ruger thirty-eight police special on the table in front of him looked pretty good, but he didn't feel like hanging around all day filling out papers for a handgun. The man thought for a long time, then set his jacket over the pistol and said, "'Meet me in the parking lot.' The transaction was quick and simple, but as he was getting into the car, Ackerman was quietly accosted by a skinny young man who looked like an out-of-work car mechanic. Didn't you see anything in there you liked? His mind compared the two possibilities, cop and thief, and neither one. He just shook his head. No, same old stuff, he said, and prepared to start the car. The man said, Looking for something in particular? He decided on thief. Why, you got something? A few things. I'm a gunsmith. I do modifications, custom work, make a few accessories. The word accessories interested him enough to get him out of the car. In the trunk of the man's old Chevy was an oily bath towel, and laid out on it were a few homemade sears for converting M16s to full auto, a couple of forty-round banana clips made of two standard twenties welded end-to-end, -end, and various devices designed to hold handguns under dashboards and car seats. He took a chance. I can see why you aren't at a table inside. The man grinned sheepishly and then compulsively glanced around to see if anyone was watching. See anything you like? He shook his head. Sorry. The man looked disappointed. This ain't all I got. Give me a hint. He said. Ever made a silencer? The man had. William Wolfe was watching the effect of the sun coming up, hitting the distant face of the low mesa on his left and giving it a pink glow beneath the deep purple of the pre-dawn sky. Driving felt like a novelty. He loved the feeling of enclosure in the small box hurtling down the smooth highway at sixty-five as the sights around him changed. It wasn't just one object being replaced by another like it, but a change in the possibilities— he had been in New Mexico several times before, but now it looked new to him. There were low, rolling hills that flattened into unexpected places where the level plains dropped abruptly to reveal that they had been plateaus. All of it was covered with dry, knee-high sage that was almost gray, with dark pignons growing out of it like plants at the bottom of a vast ocean. And along the impossibly distant horizon, here and there a mountain would rise— not a range of mountains, but a single one, or a sawtoothed ridge of three, tilted a little as though something big had swept over it to push it aside. He had spent a few hours becoming William Wolfe in a motel in Albuquerque, and now the name had displaced the others in his mind. 
He had repeated it to himself a thousand times, rehearsing introducing himself to imaginary strangers, and even planned the signature. It would be two big, fast W's, each followed by low, cramped scrawls that looked so cursory that some letters might appear to be missing. The name William Wolfe had presented no problem to him. Names were the first accidental training that Eddie had given him as a child. Eddie had never actually taken any legal steps to adopt him, for fear that some public agency would be called upon to visit the home and create a file. Instead, he had sometimes referred to the boy as his son, sometimes as his nephew, or even as the child of a friend, as convenience seemed to dictate, and had made up names for him on these occasions. But as soon as he was old enough to learn a trade, the boy had been taught to select his own aliases. Circumstances had never allowed him to attach any interior significance to names. He might be Bob or Ronald at one moment, or the butcher's boy, or even the third one from the end of the line. It made no difference to him. In a heartbeat, he would be the second from the end of the line, without experiencing any interior alteration. Names were for other people's convenience, and their convenience was seldom of any interest to him. For a decade, he had found it useful to be Michael Schaefer. For a day, he had resurrected Charles Ackerman. Now it was easiest to be Wolf. Wolf thought about Santa Fe. It was too small to have a serious airport, but it was always full of tourists. The only reasonable choice was to fade into the amorphous, shifting group that came and went each day. He would arrive the way they did, and dress the way they did, and that was as near to invisibility as he could get. People in tourist towns let their eyes acknowledge new people only long enough to be sure they wouldn't bump into them. There was no reason to remember faces, because they would never appear again. Wolf felt the early morning cold as he got out of the car in the parking structure beneath La Fonda. It was a strange, calm, and airless chill that seemed to have been stored in the dark enclosure for a long time. La Fonda was the only hotel he remembered from the old days, a seventy-year-old five-story sprawling adobe building on the corner of the ancient city square beside the palace the conquistadors had built for their governors in 1610. There were already three cars exactly like his that he could see as he walked to the swinging door that led into the hall to the lobby. As he turned the first corner, he could see into the big dining room, with its uneven ceramic tile floor, and the fifty-foot canopy of painted glass that let in just enough light for the potted trees. There were only a few people sitting under the trees and eating breakfast. He knew that these were probably the ones who had come here from the east, where it was already late morning. There were two young couples who wore ski sweaters, jeans, and hiking shoes, and a table of five elderly people, three women and two men, who had the manner of a permanent traveling committee. They each spoke to the whole group, and then winked and nudged some particular ally, while the others felt comfortable ignoring what was said. Wolf could also see a table where four dark-suited businessmen held a serious discussion, looking as though their plane from New York had been hijacked, and they had been released, unharmed and unchanged, in the center of this small western town, and were now waiting for the answer to their inquiries about whom to buy it from. He glanced around the lobby, first at the registration desk, where a dark-haired woman in her forties made quick proprietary movements, arranging registration cards and keys to prepare for the morning check-ins. He avoided that side of the room and walked past two ancient Pueblo Indians, a wrinkled, leathery little man and a woman who undoubtedly was his wife, both of them busy opening modern black sample cases full of silver and turquoise jewelry for display on the bench by the wall. He drifted past a wooden rack of free tourist pamphlets, selected a Santa Fe street map, and walked out the front door of the building to the street. There were a few little patches of the early autumn's first crisp hard snow in the square, and the air was clear and thin. He would have been tempted to ask for a room in the hotel, but he knew that Santa Fe was too small. He looked up and down the streets that led into the square. There were the stores, he remembered, their windows full of intricately painted Indian pots, hand-woven blankets of wool dyed with bright vegetable colors, and antique pounded and burnished silver, bought, by tradition, so cheaply from the once-credulous Indians, that it was still called pawn. 
but among the stores was a coffee shop with outdoor tables turned upside down as a concession to the first taste of cold weather. He found it by following a couple in their thirties, who were tourists but looked purposeful in their gait, reasoning that nothing else could be open yet. Inside the door there was a steamy warmth to the air, a comforting heaviness to the dark wood tables, and a glow of hanging antique copper implements that he doubted the employees could even identify, let alone use. Wolf sat at a table and studied his map, while the waitress, a plump blonde girl of the type he could imagine leaving college to study astrology, poured him a cup of coffee and left a menu beside him. Andalusia was one of the narrow, cramped streets that ran parallel to Canyon Road, where he remembered that the galleries were. He had never felt an impulse to own paintings, and in the days when he had lived in the United States it would have been foolish. But he had walked down Canyon Road once, years ago, to pass the time, and he remembered the neighborhood. He judged from the map that he would have to leave the car blocks away and find Peter Mantino on foot. When the waitress came to stand beside him and said, Ready? He answered, Huevos Rancheros, because he hadn't had time to read the menu, and it was the only thing he remembered that places like this would have. When she left, he studied the map again, letting it suggest the way things would happen. If things were as they should have been, a man like Peter Mantino would put some obstacles between himself and the world. But six or seven years ago, Mantino had been convicted of a bunch of charges that Wolf couldn't even remember now, all of the bribery and suborning variety. Now he was on parole, supposedly living in voluntary seclusion hundreds of miles from the centers of power in Los Angeles and Las Vegas. All of this had been in the newspapers years ago, and even the reporters clearly hadn't believed a word of it. But the important part was true. If he was on parole, he couldn't have the sort of protection he was about to begin needing. Wolf still had not gotten over the shock of seeing the shooter at the airport, but he had never for a second doubted what had happened. The truth was, there was no way even Carl Bala could send a specialist to kill somebody in the Los Angeles airport. The airport lay unambiguously in the center of Peter Mantino's empire, and any consequences would fall exclusively on his head. The text of every letter to the editor would mention his name, the resulting crackdown would cut into his profits, and the token arrests would make his people cautious and unproductive. He had to have been the one who made the decision, and the man must belong to him. Mantino had started out running a crew for Balacantano in New York in the sixties, and then gotten to run the family's interests in the West, supposedly as a reward for faithful service. At the time, people had said there was more to it than that. They said Mantino had begun to attract a lot of loyalty in the family, and Balacantano had just wanted him out there and away from the soldiers. The world was full of little men who knew what big men were really thinking. It didn't matter why Mantino had reacted so quickly. Maybe he was still loyal to the Balacantano family, and maybe he was making a safe, easy bid for respect— while the old man was in prison and Talarese was out of the way. The only thing that was certain was that Mantino was taking enough of an interest to send shooters into public places. That changed Wolf's problem into figuring out how Wolf was going to stay alive. He needed to get out of the country, but nobody was going to let him step onto a plane to London without a passport. He knew of only one place where he might be able to get one after all these years, and that was in Buffalo over fifteen hundred miles away. It would take time to get there, and time to make the contact, and time for the passport. And every second that passed, he was heating up. He needed to buy some time. The only thing that gave him hope was that word of his return couldn't have traveled faster than an airplane unless it was passed by telephone from somebody in New York to Mantino. And Mantino wouldn't have told a lot of people in his organization that he was going to have somebody killed. That was the sort of thing nobody talked about until after it was accomplished. And it hadn't been accomplished. The shooter had gotten himself busted in the airport. Wolf had to take advantage of that mistake. The only way was to do the unexpected. Mantino takes a swat at a fly, and the fly goes right up his nose. Twice in his life he had seen what happened when a capo unexpectedly died. People reacted in different ways. A few would check in at out-of-town hotels and start making phone calls. 
but a lot of them would stay home and wait for somebody to get in touch with them. Usually it would be some acquaintance, a guy they had been introduced to at the races or somebody's cousin they had met at a wedding. The guy would say, Peter's dead. You have a problem with that? Or just, What are you going to do now? If you want to go with us, I can talk to some people. But until they heard from somebody, they were going to be watching a lot of television with the blinds drawn. Sometimes nobody got in touch, and the trouble just got worse. There had even been one famous time when a boss died and forty of his friends across the country died the same day. That was what they would be afraid of. Not that somebody Carlo Balacantano had put a contract on ten years ago had come for Peter Mantino. The low brown stucco wall around the yard would present no problem unless it had some electronic component that Wolf couldn't see from the street. He couldn't see or hear a dog, and the sign on the gate that said North American Watch Armed Response was comforting. It made it unlikely that Mantino had anything more sophisticated than a conventional alarm system that would summon untrained night watchmen. The house was a single-story adobe-colored building. Like all the others in this part of town, it was required by the building code to look as though the Spaniards had never left, although he suspected that any Spaniards that had made it this far north and east must have been a forlorn, raggedy-assed bunch. He maintained an even, leisurely tourist's pace and studied all the houses on the street with equal attention. At the corner he turned, walked to the street behind Andalusia, and examined the houses there. There appeared to be nothing of any consequence to protect any of them, but the situation was still troublesome. There were no cars parked on the narrow one-way street, and he had passed only a few pedestrians during his walk, none of them within blocks of Andalusia. Even if he could get in, getting out would be difficult. It was dark now, and the cold air was still and crisp. The patches of dirty snow that had melted in the sunlight were now furrows and tumuli of iron-hard ice, and Wolf watched for them so that he could step around them on the sidewalk. In his left hand he carried a paper sack from the store where he had bought the gloves and channel-lock pliers a few hours ago, but now it also contained the Ruger thirty-eight and its silencer. If necessary, he could drop the bag surreptitiously, but for anyone who might see him, the bag was an indicator that he had gone out on foot for a purpose and was on his way home. He moved along the storefronts on Galisteo Street, keeping under the roof and away from the thick pillars where he could remain only a shadow. Santa Fe was still a sunlit town for most of the year, even now. The inhabitants were out and in evidence when the bright sunlight warmed the ground, reaching it unimpeded by the extra mile of clouds, smog, and dust that covered other cities and without being blocked anywhere by tall buildings. But when the sun set, they disappeared behind the stone and clay walls, the oldest ones a yard thick. Even the restaurants that catered to the small quiet night trade were hidden in mazes of courtyards and passageways. The office of North American Watch was even more difficult to find. It had an entrance to the street, but that had been closed for hours. Behind the dusty Venetian blinds he could see a thin slice of the light from the dispatcher's desk. He walked around the building to look for the cars. These people were in the peace of mind business. They provided louts to drive by every four hours with flashlights, and since this was a state where anyone could wear a gun in a holster unless the weight of it pulled down his pants, they were armed louts. He didn't know the current procedures, but if they hadn't changed radically, on a cold night when there were few people on the streets, the management would save a few dollars by keeping some cars in the lot. If a call came in or an alarm lit up the board, they would call the police and then send one of the men in the office on a slow stroll to a car, so that he would arrive about the time the cops were composing their theft reports. It was better than he had imagined. There were three blue-and-white imitation police cruisers parked behind the building and a fourth at the curb. Wolf walked to it and put his hand on the hood. It wasn't even warm. He ducked down beside it, opened the door, and slipped into the driver's seat. He felt the ignition for the key, but he wasn't that lucky. They must have a hook inside the office with the keys hanging on it. 
He took the heavy pliers out of his bag, pried the bar away from the steering column, wrenched the ignition switch out of its hole, and tugged the wires out of the back of it. He pumped the gas pedal to the floor once, touched the two wires together, and started the car. He let the engine idle for a moment while he watched the back door of North American. There was no sign that anyone had heard, so he pulled away from the curb. Just as he was passing the building, another set of headlights came up the street behind him. As he turned the corner, he saw the car pull into the space he had vacated. It pleased him. If one of the louts happened to glance out the window, he would see a car where he was looking for it. Wolf kept the car at a crawl as he moved down the quiet, empty street toward Andalusia. He knew that when he had hot-wired the engine, he had started an invisible timer. But the danger would increase if he deviated from the pace people expected of this car. He made the turn onto Andalusia and allowed himself a little more speed. At 1500 Andalusia, he applied the brakes and let the rear end of the car swing out a little, so that he could stop at an urgent-looking angle to the wall. He glanced up at the house to be sure the car was visible through the iron gate, left the motor running and ran up the walk to the door, his pistol in his hand. He rapped on the thick wooden door, then rang the bell. Inside he could hear feet pounding down a hallway. He turned to the side so that whoever was looking out through the fisheye lens of the peephole could see the car. As he forced his eyes to scan the yard like a man looking for something, he felt his heartbeat quicken. It was these few seconds that would decide everything. Then he heard the deadbolt slip out of its receptacle and watched the big door open a couple of inches. A voice said, What is it? And Wolf turned to look into the man's eyes. He was in his thirties and wore his wavy hair long, cut in a style that seemed out of date until Wolf remembered that it might have come back. He forced his voice into a tone that would carry it. There had to be enough urgency to make the man forget his natural suspicion and want to find out what was going on, but enough confidence to assure him that Wolf was going to take care of it. "'North American Watch,' he said. "'You, Mr. Mantino?' The man moved away from the door, and Wolf stepped beside him into the warm chiaroscuro of a dimly lit space. There was a fire burning in the big whitewashed adobe fireplace at the other end of the room. He was startled when he saw a man in his fifties, lean and limber in the way that men were who spent a lot of time playing tennis, moving to a big cabinet on the far wall. "'What is it? I'm Mr. Mantino.' "'You got an intrusion,' Wolf said." Almost instantly he regretted it. He had expected to have time to attach the silencer before he fired. But now there were two of them, and they moved in different directions with surprising decisiveness. Mantino turned a key in the lock on the cabinet and reached inside. His hand came back, holding a short-barreled shotgun, and he didn't swing it around like a man gripped by panic, but held it pointed upward. He pumped it and moved into the hallway. "'Where is he? Have you seen him?' Wolf had no time to answer because now the younger man was beside him, and cradled in his arms was a thirty-aught six hunting rifle with a large clip in it. Holy shit, said Wolf, trying to infuse some incredulity into his voice. He's probably just trying to boost your hubcaps or something. The young man snapped. Then he made a mistake, and stepped toward the rear of the house. Wolf reminded himself that speed was really a matter of deliberate economical movement. He fell into step with the younger man, pulling Mantino with him. He took two steps, raised the pistol, shot the younger man in the back of the head, stepped back and swung an elbow into Mantino's face. He was surprised at how fast Mantino's movements were. He was already moving away, trying to swing the shotgun around in time. The elbow struck Mantino on the shoulder, and Wolf barely had time to jab the pistol against the man's chest and fire. Mantino toppled backward and Wolf fired three more times as he fell. Each time he fired, there was an instant when he wasn't sure the shotgun wasn't going to come the rest of the way around. The man's body made a spasmodic jerk backward each time he was hit, and Wolf had the sense that he was pushing a man toward a cliff by jabbing him with his finger. When Mantino finally hit the floor, Wolf kicked the shotgun away and fired the last round into his forehead. Wolf stood still for a moment and listened. He'd made a mess of it and he still had to get out. The security service car might buy him the most time left where it was, parked in front and still running. The neighbors would assume that someone whose job it was to respond to gunshots had arrived to take charge, and the police, who knew better, 
would be cautious about barging in without warning the armed and frightened rent-a-cop they would expect to find inside. He began to wipe his prints from the pistol. He went to the gun cabinet and opened it. There were five rifles of varying makes and calibers and a whole section devoted to handguns, all fastened to a blue velvet display board. He spotted a Ruger thirty-eight police special, pulled it off the board and replaced it with the gun he had used to kill the two men, then hurried to the back door of the house. He stepped out the back door, climbed over the fence into the neighbor's backyard, and kept walking toward the next street. As he moved along beside the house, he heard the first of the sirens. Things were happening too quickly, coming now like punches from an opponent he had underestimated. He listened for the route of the police cars. The electronic blips went on long enough for him to hear them on both sides of him before they stopped. He moved to the wall beside the house, knelt among the garbage cans, swung out the cylinder of the pistol he had stolen, and pushed in six rounds. Then he remembered the silencer he had brought with him. It had been machined to fit a weapon of the same make and model. Even if it didn't silence the report of the new pistol, it would suppress the flash a little. In the darkness, this edge might keep him alive. Carefully, he raised himself above the level of the garbage cans and sighted between the houses. He saw the police car in Andalusia pull up behind the North American watch car and two uniformed policemen get out. After a moment, one of them returned to pull the shotgun out of its mount in his squad car. Wolf turned to look at the street behind him and saw two more police cars glide silently to a stop. They seemed to have practiced a drill to cut off the escape of an intruder in these quiet streets. He ducked down and concentrated on what he had seen of the neighborhood as he fitted the silencer to the revolver. There were no crowds of pedestrians to lose himself in, and not even a passing car to distract the police. He had to break their choreographed plan, and the only way to do it was to add some element that they hadn't imagined. He considered starting a fire, but he would have to be nearby when the first flames flickered to life, and would be caught in the light. Then another squad car passed slowly up Andalusia. A spotlight mounted on its window strut, swept along the thin trunks of the trim shrubbery, sliced down the spaces between the houses, then shot upward to the roofs. Just before it came abreast of his hiding place, Wolf crouched to let it pass. But as he disappeared into the darkness, he retained an image. The spotlight moving along the fronts of the houses illuminated, one after another, bright reflecting signs that read, North American Watch Armed Response. As soon as the car passed, he came up again. He aimed his pistol at the front window of the house across the street and squeezed off a round. There was a faint spitting noise, and he could see that a wide spiderweb network of cracks had appeared. Pivoting, he shot the back windows out of the next four houses, then ducked down to reload. He was satisfied for the moment. No matter how crude an alarm system was, if it was triggered by sound, motion, or simply the dislocation of a conductive tape, it would go off when a window broke. He resisted the impulse to move his wristwatch up to his face in the darkness to time the armed response. Now was his time of greatest danger, while the police were still free to run their prearranged tactic unimpeded. He had to hope it would take them a few minutes to analyze the scene at Peter Mantino's house before they started to sweep the neighborhood on foot. He listened for footsteps or radio voices to reach him, and then heard more engines. There was the squeal of tires at the end of the street in front of him as the North American watch cars started to arrive. A voice on a police bullhorn said, "'Pull back out of here. This is a crime scene.' But there was no diminution of the sound of engines or the dimming of the glare of headlights. "'Yeah, you. Get out of here.' Wolf decided it was essential to see how the competition was faring, so he moved to the gate that led to the front lawn and looked through the crack by the hinges. There were two cars like the one he had stolen, and they had pulled into the driveways of two of the houses whose windows he had shot out. Men in jeans, flannel shirts, and sweatshirts were outside the cars now, carrying an odd assortment of handguns and flashlights. Two of them stood on the lawn across the street, looking skeptically at a policeman who was walking toward them. A third was already at the side of the house, looking over the fence and aiming his flashlight into the backyard. As Wolf waited for the mix to get as volatile as it needed to be, he glanced behind him toward the Mantino house. In front of it, he could see another North American watch car pull up in the middle of Andalusia. A large man got out of it, leaving the door open. He already held a heavy, long-barreled revolver in his hand, as though he had driven with it lying on the seat beside him. Wolf took three deep breaths to ensure that he had expelled all the carbon dioxide he could. 
It was carbon dioxide in the blood that made the hands shake. He eased his body upward, rested his arm on the top of the fence, and fired a single shot. The policeman on the lawn jerked in pain, let out his breath in a grunt, then crumpled to the ground, clutching his calf. The three security guards looked at him in disbelief, then at each other. Finally it seemed to occur to them that the shot had come from somewhere else. They crouched and swept the horizon around them, over their gun sights, looking for a target. But the policeman's partner was still at the microphone in his car. In his panic he left the external amplifier on, and as he shouted into the radio his message echoed through the empty streets. "'Officer down! This is 1 X-ray 22! Officer down! Need assistance! Officer down!' Wolf could see the three security guards now, but he couldn't see the other policemen in the car. He decided to take a chance. He stood up at the fence and shouted at the frightened guards, "'Police officer! Drop those guns!' then ducked and ran along the adobe wall across the front of the house. He knew he must be abreast of the police car now, but he stopped and crouched in the corner of the front yard and listened. "'You heard the man,' said the lone policeman. "'Drop them!' Wolf decided he had to increase the sense of danger a little more, or they were going to obey and let the solitary cop get control of the situation. He looked back along the house toward Andalusia Street. He could see that the policemen there had either heard the bullhorn or the radio, and were moving toward him through the back yards. He rolled over the wall to the next yard, then aimed around over their heads, and ducked down. They had seen the muzzle flash aimed in their direction, and heard the crack of the bullet breaking the sound barrier as it passed over them, and they responded as he had hoped. There was the blast of a shotgun, followed by eight pistol shots slamming into the corner of the wall. Then he heard three rapid shots fired from the house across the street, and judged it was time. He sprinted to the front of the next house and moved along the façade, then rolled over the next fence and kept moving. There were other sirens in the distance now, all converging on the quiet neighborhood. Wolf didn't dare slow down or look back. He trotted unerringly from one fence to the next, each time hoisting himself up and over the identical adobe enclosures, thankful that the sudden, unseasonable start of fall had made it too cold to leave a dog outside all night. At the end of the block he waited and listened for approaching sirens, but it seemed they had all arrived by then, screeching past him on the other side of the wall as he had ran from their destination. He pulled himself over the last fence and walked across the street to the far side of Galisteo. As he walked northward toward the ancient plaza, he crossed a little bridge over the captive river with concrete banks that sliced across the town. As he did, he noticed that it had the strange quality of magnifying sounds— Far in the distance he could hear a voice shouting into an electronic amplifier. The voice echoed and broke up, but he knew it was another police bullhorn. He also knew from the rapid reports of guns that the untrained North American watchguards had been too frightened to relinquish their weapons. The heavy firing was the sound of the police reluctantly concluding that the guards, either for this reason or because they had killed Mantino or wounded the policemen, represented a danger to the community. He hurried on toward La Fonda. Right now there would be crackling, fragrant fires of mesquite and pignon in all the big stone fireplaces, heating the bright, intricately glazed Spanish tiles along the mantels. Lots of Santa Fe natives would pass through for a drink on an evening like this, but some of them would have heard that the police were gathering on Andalusia Street. He would pass by the lighted windows and into the subterranean parking garage without crossing the threshold. By the time he had driven the few blocks to Highway 25, the heater of the little Ford would have warmed his hands as much as a fire. "'I think this is the second one,' said Elizabeth. "'If he wanted Peter Mantino, this is the way he'd do it. I think it's not over.' "'You're making a hell of an assumption,' said Richardson. "'You've got to act as your own censor on this kind of case.' "'I know that,' she answered her voice close enough to a monotone to serve her purpose. "'You're feeling frustrated and disappointed that we didn't get him at the L.A. airport, right?' "'I admit it,' said Elizabeth. "'I volunteer it, and waive all right to a jury trial. But all I'm asking,' Richardson interrupted, "'is that you think about it. Is it possible, not certain, but possible, that you see another gunshot homicide of another important man and say it's the same perpetrator because you want it to be?' You want another shot at him. Elizabeth's jaw clenched. You brought me in here to analyze raw data. My preliminary hypothesis 
when there are two murders of ranking members of the Balacantano family within two days, is that a pure coincidence is unlikely. There, I've done my job. Your job as section chief is to decide now, this minute, whether to send an investigator out to Santa Fe to find out what actually happened to Peter Mantino. Are you volunteering? Elizabeth's eyes narrowed. You're not calling my bluff, you know. I'd love to, but I just went to California, and I have two children who are expecting me to feed them dinner tonight and still be there when they wake up tomorrow. Have things gotten so bad since I left here that you don't have any real field men for a case like this? Richardson shook his head. No, I just figured out who to send. Give me a minute on the phone with him, and then I'll transfer him to you. Who is he? His name's Jack Hamp. Elizabeth turned and walked out of Richardson's office. She had heard the name before. He could be somebody she had met on another case. No, she had read it at the bottom of some report recently. But the button on her phone was already blinking. She punched it. Hello, said Elizabeth. This is Elizabeth Waring. Is this Mr. Hamp? What can I do for you, ma'am? Her expectations oscillated between two extremes. It was the unimaginative-sounding Western official voice that California Highway Patrolmen used when they wrote you a ticket. But she was going to need him in the West, after all, and Richardson had picked him out for a difficult situation. If Richardson knew the man's name, he must at least be competent, and maybe a lot better than that. I understand you've agreed to work with us on this case? Yes, ma'am. It was the ma'am. The last time she had heard it was from one of the prison guards at Lam Pak. When can you be ready to leave for Santa Fe? There was a significant pause. Then the voice said, I'm at an airport now. Then Elizabeth remembered where she had seen the name. It had been at the bottom of the report on the mess at LAX. Jack Hamp was the bird watcher. Hamp walked up Andalusia Street, then down Galisteo to the street behind it. He liked the feel of the sun heating the sidewalks without affecting the thin, cold air. He thought about Elizabeth Waring again. At the time, he'd had to pay too much attention to what she was telling him to give her voice the sort of analysis he considered necessary. All he really had on her, for sure, was that she was in her mid-thirties. She had mentioned that she had young children, but she was old enough to call herself Elizabeth and not to have to tone it down by a couple of syllables to Liz or Betty or Bess or whatever. She was not a large woman because there wasn't the kind of lasting tone that came from the big-boned ones with pink hands that were all knuckles. It wasn't a question of high or low, because women varied only from alto to soprano anyway, but something about how much real force and staying power was behind the voice. He judged that she was between five feet five and five feet eight, and probably a strawberry blonde or a redhead. It was a brave guess, even for an expert like Hamp, because not many real redheads went through law school. A lot of the bright ones were like Hamp's second wife, Donna, who was sort of a career redhead. She was a trained painter, but apparently she had spent her college years exploring the shades of green, blue, and purple she could wear to set off her hair. The marriage had been made in heaven during what must have been a celestial holiday, when everybody up there was blind drunk and frisky. Donna had cried when she had found out he was a cop, but by then it was too late, because he had already verified her credentials as a bona fide redhead, and she was a committed woman. At the time, his pants were hanging on the rail of her bed with the butt end of his pistol showing, but that hadn't bothered her. Later he decided he hadn't given her reaction as much thought as it had deserved. Not that she wasn't a law-abiding citizen, within certain limits, but she was not a cautious person or a docile one. They'd had a lively time of it for nearly five years— but it had ended by her going after him with the claw hammer she had been using to attach a canvas to its stretcher bars. Donna's problem was symbolized in his mind by the fact that she had gone after him with the claw end of the hammer. It was uglier and more spiteful that way, but the bludgeon death victims he came across professionally almost always got it with the blunt end. It was just more practical. 
Maybe Elizabeth Waring had brown hair, the sort that had very tight little curls in it that made it stick out. There was a certain intensity in those women, too, and a lot of them went to law school. Hamp spotted the police sticker on the door of Mantino's house and took in the rest of it. The killer had seen it all the way he was seeing it now. The houses were all too close together, the streets too narrow and quiet for an easy shot and a quick retreat. Since the police had found a North American watch car in the street, he had probably chosen to impersonate a security guard, but something had gone wrong. At that moment the ordinary man would have defeated himself. He would have tried to do something to save his skin, hide in an empty house or look for an escape route the police knew better than he did. But this man had done something else. All policemen were drilled in hesitation, firing warning shots into the air and trying to keep innocent bystanders away. If they'd had a plan, it would have been to contain his movements and assume that his desire to stay alive would make him behave rationally and therefore predictably. But this one was an aggressor. Any victim was as good as another. Anything that caused confusion or added to the escalating violence was an advantage. His best tactic would have been to give the impression that what he was trying to do was not to run, but to kill them. Hamp looked around. There were lots of long straight firing lines he could use. Adobe walls around the houses to hide his movements, tall trees and thick hedges to complicate their view but not his. In the dark, the police had to distinguish which among the twenty or thirty silhouettes they could discern belonged to their comrades and which to another man they didn't even have a description of. By the time there were fifty policemen and armed civilians on the scene, any shot fired had a two percent chance of hitting a murderer and a ninety-eight percent chance of creating one. This was what the old gangster in the California prison had been trying to describe to Elizabeth Waring. The tape recorder team in New York had managed to stumble on a man who had never done anything for a living except kill people. He had been doing it for, say, twenty years, and he had gotten pretty good at it. There was only one stop left to make, and that would have to wait a few hours. Evening was the time for visiting policemen, when you could talk to them in their homes. Hamp walked to the door of the freshly painted one-story gray house and rang the bell. He could hear a dog barking somewhere in the back, then the loud scratching noise of its toenails as it ran across an uncarpeted floor to sniff under the door. He sensed that it was big, probably a shepherd or a doberman, and he felt better when he heard a deep male voice cajole it away from the door. "'Go on,' it said. "'Into the kitchen.' Then, "'Kitchen! Stay!' The toenail sound receded into the distance. A deadbolt gave a metallic clank as the man slipped it. Hamp conceded that the precautions were understandable. Lawrence was an ordinary policeman. He'd have spent enough of his career looking at the work of intruders to develop a desire and talent for home security. His house wasn't impregnable by any means, but a burglar would find it discouraging enough to make him move on to the next one. The door opened, and Hamp looked the man in the eye and held out his hand. "'Jack Hamp,' he said. "'FBI.' Now he rapidly revised his expectations. Lawrence was in his early thirties, over six feet tall and athletic, his black hair cut by a good barber. The voice was quiet, and the eyes were intelligent. "'Fernando Lawrence, pleased to meet you.' Hamp regretted the lie, but Elizabeth Waring had spent an hour telling him what she knew and what she wanted, and the quickest way to get it was to lie. She hadn't told him to. He had figured it out on his own. He had been a cop for a long time, and he knew how it felt to wear the uniform. When a cop heard FBI, he had a pretty clear idea of what to expect and of who he was talking to. He might like it, or he might not but he was going to answer questions because he didn't think he needed to ask them. If you said you were a special investigator for the Justice Department, he was going to spend a lot of time looking at your ID and asking you what you did for a living, and maybe after you left he would make a couple of calls and maybe find out through his own connections that you had spent the last two years sitting in an airport, or even that you were just doing legwork for a woman lawyer you had never met and he didn't need to care about. The image that would come to mind was that of a young female assistant D.A. 
and the fact that the office where she did her nails was in Washington instead of at the county courthouse didn't make any difference. She wasn't the one whose hands shook while she was strapping on the bulletproof vest to go in after the barricaded suspect. She was the one who let the suspect go the next day because the paperwork didn't look to her like it was going to add to her one lost record. Or else on the second day, after the charges didn't get filed in time because she was at lunch with the councilman from the 75th district. It was simpler not to have to get past all that. He followed Lawrence into a small living room furnished with a few large leather chairs and a long couch that had a half-folded army blanket on it. On the wall hung a dark red Indian weaving that Hamp recognized as a good nineteenth-century pattern. "'Sorry to bother you at home, Lieutenant,' said Hamp. "'But I'm sure you understand that we'd like to handle this as quietly as possible. The press seems to take a particular joy in letting the public know when we're on a case, and this time it might lead to some wrong conclusions.' He had brushed across the sensitive spot without poking it. The police here would be smarting now, defensive because they sensed people were wondering how fifty men had lost a gunfight with one, and disoriented because they didn't know the answer either. The press would imply that the FBI was wondering, too. Lawrence said only, Sure. You mind dogs? Hamp hesitated, relinquishing the relief that he had felt at having this behind him. No, he said, I used to have one. If it was a working police dog, he knew from experience that when Lawrence told it to leave him alone, he would have to say it in German. Every department in the country figured that the average fleeing suspect didn't remember enough of what he had learned in high school to get a job, let alone call off a dog. Lawrence said, Martha, in a normal voice, and Hamp heard the toenails again tapping lightly toward him from the back of the house. He turned and saw a gray-brown standard German shepherd, at least three feet tall, with a chest like a barrel, and a huge, gaping mouth emerge from a hallway. She walked past Hamp, gave him a look, and then sat down in front of Lawrence's chair. When he pointed at the couch, the dog leaped up and lay down on the army blanket. "'She gets lonely,' said Lawrence. "'She and I were air police.' Hamp nodded. "'How old is she?' Nine. You made lieutenant fast. Hamp stopped trying to remember his German. It wouldn't do any good. Lawrence had been one of the men Hamp had seen when he was in the Marines, guarding the most sensitive installations. Strategic Air Command bases, Air Force communications centers, and listening posts, walking the perimeters with guard dogs. The sight of them had always struck him as vaguely poignant. The dogs were given to the men as soon as they were weaned, and man and dog trained together, sleeping together in the same barracks, never more than a hundred feet apart for at least the length of an enlistment, and more often for the life of the dog. If the man was married and lived off the base with his wife, the dog lived with them, and the two would report for duty together. The attachment between them grew so strong that they were like two men, or sometimes two dogs, the one who walked upright representing to the other one mother, father, and head of the wolf pack. The loyalty was so blind and unbreakable that when the A.P.'s enlistment ended, the dog had to be discharged with him because it couldn't live without him. Hamp had seen them in Thailand, Vietnam, and other places, the strange, solitary pairs the embodiment of a primal nightmare, the big, vulpine creature perfectly capable and even eager to hurl its ninety pounds of muscle and fang into a man's throat, if it would bring a whispered word and a gentle pat from its master who had trained it to attack even more efficiently than its ferocious instincts would have prompted. Hamp stared at Martha. The dog lay quietly on the old army blanket and stared unblinking into his eyes, her head resting on her paws. He turned back to Lawrence, who seemed to be looking at him with the same expression. In your investigation of the break-in at Mr. Mantino's house, there was something about the term break-in that jarred Hamp's mind. Whatever had happened, the entry was the least of it. But Lawrence's eyes moved to the dog, and Hamp's followed. The dog's ears were up, and its head was turned toward him attentively. Hamp felt a sudden alarm. The dog had sensed that he was feeling uncomfortable, maybe by smell or by a sound in his voice, and it was already beginning to show little signs of agitation. He had to do something before the animal began to suspect that he wished Lawrence harm. 
he had to stay on solid neutral ground and get the master to talk. Tell me anything you found that the FBI might need to know. He knew better than to try to talk to the dog or make a friend of her. She had been brought up to feel no interest whatever in any human being but Lawrence. He tried to formulate something that he could say for the dog's benefit, something scrupulously true and sincere. I know it's a tall order. I'm asking you for information without being able to reciprocate. The dog set her head down again. Any time someone like Mantino dies violently, there are possible consequences and implications, and I don't know yet what they might be. The report says it appeared to be a simple B&E for purposes of robbery. The dog seemed to be satisfied, so he sat back in his chair. Lawrence hesitated, then began. You have to understand that this is the biggest disaster for our department in the last hundred years, Hamp answered. I understand. We can... He sensed that he was in danger again. I can assure you that I haven't any intention of letting what you tell me go into wide dissemination. And I'm not interested in the details of what went wrong. I'm interested in the murderer. The tension seemed to go out of the big dog. She kept her eyes on him for another moment, then looked at her master without lifting her head. He hot-wired a car from North American Watch and drove it to the front of the house so the occupants would see it and open the door to him. After that we don't know the exact order of events, no witnesses, no prints. But here's what I think. He got them to believe there was some danger, and Mantino and Sobel picked up guns from the gun cabinet in the living room. When Sobel headed for the back of the house with a thirty odd six, he shot him in the back of the head. Sobel had to be the first, because it's pretty hard to do that to a man carrying a loaded weapon if he knows you're coming. Then he shot Mantino five times in the chest and the front of the head before Mantino could get a shot off. What next? He kept his head, created confusion, and got out. He behaved like a real soldier. Hamp held Martha in the corner of his eye as he spoke. I'm interested in this man. Martha cocked an ear, but there was no agitation. It was just like trying to beat a lie detector, he realized, and pushed on. Is there anything in this to indicate where he came from, or where he'll go next? Nothing, said Lawrence. In the early fall there are about a thousand hotel rooms available, and about forty percent are rented. We're pretty close to having all of them accounted for. We're working on the planes and trains and buses. I'd say he drove in, did his job, then drove out without attracting any attention. He's got nothing to worry about from anybody around here. Who was Sobel? Male Caucasian, 6'1", 185, good build, broken nose, lots of his prints on the guns in the cabinet. He was licensed as a private detective, but I can't find any indication he worked at it much. I think he was a bodyguard. Lawrence and his dog watched Hamp closely. Hamp leaned forward. Do you have any idea why Mantino hired a bodyguard instead of a member of his own organization? Was he afraid of something? I was hoping you could tell me. It got him, though, didn't it? Hamp thought about it. If Mantino was afraid of a paid assassin who used to work for the Mafia, it made a lot of sense. The one who gains the most is the one standing closest when the body falls. But he couldn't allow Lawrence to start asking him questions. Even if he managed to compose answers, the dog would smell his tension and premeditation and turn on him. What was missing from the house? Lawrence gave Hamp a wry look. Nothing. Kind of odd, isn't it? The theory is that he didn't have time or made more noise than he'd expected to. Ham recognized that Lawrence was better than he looked. Not as an investigator, because anybody could see it wasn't a botched robbery, but as a cop. He had been pondering the murder, stewing about it for two days, and using the time to look, listen, and evaluate. He had found the discrepancies between the official story he was paid to help concoct to keep publicity down, and what his common sense told him was true. 
Now he was working on his own theory. If he was working on it alone, then all he could do was get in the way. But if he was good, there was some small chance that it might lead him, not to the predator who had made a brief and relatively harmless stop in this little community, but to Mantino's associates. This good man could have no more idea than his dog did what it would mean to bring himself to the attention of those people right now. Hamp eyed the dog and determined to discourage him. He wasn't trying to rob him, said Hamp. Washington is sure of that much. Elizabeth was, at least. The dog sensed Hamp's discomfort and turned its head to face him. In a moment, he knew, it would slowly align its body with its head, aimed toward him. It was a hit. Lawrence nodded. Okay. So what? So his death doesn't fit the standard motivation of an ordinary murder. I don't know why he was killed, and we might not know for years. But it wasn't a local matter. Do you understand? Lawrence reserved judgment. Tell me. I'm asking you not to go out and pursue any leads on your own. If something comes up, turn it over to the FBI. Hamp was tempted to try to frighten him, but he could tell this was not a man who allowed himself to be frightened. To threaten him would just ensure that he would never drop the case. Lawrence sighed in frustration, and the dog looked confused. Was her master angry at this stranger? She decided not to take any chances. Hamp watched as her big, muscular body sidestepped into line with the head, so that she was hunched on the couch, ready to spring at him if her master triggered the impulse. "'Fair enough,' said Lawrence. "'Do I have your word?' asked Hamp. The dog smelled the tension and her master's uncertainty. She hunched lower, and her upper lip twitched, as though she could already imagine the taste. Yes, Lawrence said finally. Hamp smiled. Good, he said, and he meant it. He felt the tension begin to go out of him. I appreciate it. He stood up and took a step toward the door, then stopped and patted Martha's shoulder hard. He could feel the muscle and bone under the fur like a man's upper arm. A tongue like a wet slice of ham slipped out between the lower teeth and the thick tail whipped back and forth. As Hamp walked to the door, Lawrence shook his hand. Now that's something, he said. She doesn't like people much, but she sure likes you. Hamp sat on the bed and looked above him at the big, crude wooden lintel beam over the door that led to the bathroom. There were lots of Spanish touches in the Fonda. Little colored designs hand-painted in unlikely places on the white walls, and even the walls themselves, a foot and a half thick on the outside. It was the sort of building that conveyed a sense of security. Hamp had seen curiosity take some strange forms in his time, and if a man like Peter Mantino was dead, it was conceivable that some of the people who felt close to him were in town. If they were, none of them would be above bugging the room of a Justice Department field man, just to see if his leads were any better than theirs. He decided that all he could do was to turn on the television set to mask some of what he was going to say. When Elizabeth Waring answered, her voice was almost a whisper. Hello, said Hamp. I hope I didn't wake you. Jack? That's right. I just finished up with the local police here. They don't have much to go on, but the best guess is a lone man who probably didn't have anything in mind except to kill Mantino. The second best guess is what's going on in the papers. What's that? A robber impersonated a security guard to gain entry, found the victims armed, and had to kill them to get out. Do you think it's the same man? I don't know that two crimes are enough to establish a reliable pattern. She sighed deeply enough so he could hear it. Jack, yesterday I used up a favor in personnel to look into who you are. I know you probably don't expect much from me, but please don't let that keep you from telling me what you think. Not what you know, because nobody really knows anything yet. Because I found out I can expect a lot from you and I'm going to need it. Hamp ran this through a second time and it surprised him. 
she was manipulating him with flattery. It was exactly what he would have done if he were the one stuck in Washington. She could easily be one of those blondes with long, straight, shiny hair and light, empty eyes who could look at you without blinking and dazzle you with bullshit. Ninety-nine to one, it's him. Why? There aren't a whole lot of people who would do it this way. It takes a certain kind of person to walk into the other fellow's home ground, look him in the eye, drop the hammer on him, and walk away. Si Tolerese and Mantino were both people he knew probably weren't alone. If he knew who they were, then he'd know they were as likely to be armed as he was. It's not like the sort of thing a psycho does, where he wants to watch some defenseless victim get scared and suffer and all that, so he can feel powerful. It's the opposite. He knows he's outnumbered and probably being hunted, and he has to be sure because he can't hang around and try again. He does it this way because he knows that the other fellow is going to take a second or two stuttering and fumbling, and he knows he isn't. You hear what I'm saying, right? He knows he isn't. There was a pause on Elizabeth's end of the line that sounded as though she were thinking hard. What's he doing now? I think he's already done it. He wouldn't have booked a Hong Kong flight if he wasn't trying to get away. I think the reason he went after Mantino has something to do with that. Maybe it was a payoff to somebody to get him out. Mantino had an outsider for a bodyguard, which to me means he didn't trust somebody in his own organization. But it's just as likely that our boys simply wanted to get everybody in an uproar, so they'd be too busy putting in bulletproof glass to go out and look for him. Welcome aboard, Jack. What? You just figured out as much about the way he thinks as anybody else knows after ten years. Save the congratulations. Why? Because if I get too good at this, sometime I just might get a look at him. What's wrong with that? I might waste a second or two making up my mind. Eleven. The New Mexico experience had been a disaster. He couldn't keep putting himself in positions where some scared cop could pop him in the dark. Eddie Mastruski had been the world's greatest advocate of caution. Wolf could see Eddie again, fat and sweating, his eyes bulging and the veins in his forehead visible as he drove the car onto the highway outside St. Louis. That wasn't right, kid, he had said, glancing up at the rearview mirror, then down at the boy, then into the mirror, then into the other mirror so often that the road in front of him seemed only an afterthought. It was at this moment that the boy had begun to worry. Eddie looked as though he were about to explode. The boy had seen piles of internal organs in the butcher shop, but had only a cloudy notion of how they worked. He thought that the pumping of Eddie's heart was increasing the pressure in his body and that if it didn't stop he would have a heart attack, which in the boy's mind meant an explosion of the pump. We do this for a living, said Eddie. It's not some kind of contest. We can't go around getting into gunfights. The boy had nodded sagely for Eddie's benefit and watched him start to settle down slowly. The boy's part of it had gone as Eddie had planned. He had sat in the back of the movie theater next to some boys his age, and Mancuso hadn't even noticed him. To all the adults, he had just seemed to be one of the gang of kids who had come together from the neighborhood to see the movie. When Mancuso got up in the middle of the movie to go to the upstairs bathroom, the boy had followed. He hadn't wanted to follow because he was getting interested in the images on the huge screen at the front. The movie was La Dolce Vita, and he could still remember the moment when he'd had to walk out. It was dawn somewhere outside Rome after a night of incomprehensible carousing, and Marcello Mastriani had climbed onto some woman's back and was riding her like a horse on the grass. The boy had no clear notion of what was going on, or if indeed it really was going on, or was just some foreign way of conveying decadence. It was the only image he now retained of the film thirty years later, because it was what had been on the screen as he had glanced over his shoulder when he reached the aisle. He had longed to stay at least until the scene changed, because although it had never happened in any movie he had ever seen, he had some forlorn hope that somebody was about to have sexual intercourse, or at least that the woman was about to become naked through some happy act of negligence. 
Even he could see that the rules were different for foreign movies. He had never seen Doris Day and Rock Hudson behave like this, and he hated to leave without knowing. Because of this, he was annoyed with Mancuso when he followed him into the men's room in the loge. But when he had opened the door, he had forgotten about the movie. Mancuso hadn't gone in to relieve himself. He had gone in to meet two other men. When the boy walked in, all three had turned to face him, jerking their heads in quick unison like a flock of birds. The boy had looked away from them and gone straight to the urinal because he couldn't imagine any other act that would explain his presence. He had stood there, straining to coax some urine out of himself. Could they tell he wasn't pissing? The three had moved away to the end of the room. He could hear their leather soles on the hard white tiles. Mancuso gave the two men crinkly envelopes, and then the men left, swinging the door against the squeaky spring that was supposed to hold it closed. As Mancuso went to wash his hands at the sink, the boy had wondered why. But Mancuso was using it as an excuse for standing in front of the mirror and admiring his thick brown hair. Then he had run his wet hands through the hair and taken out a black plastic comb. The boy had tried to stop time, to hold everything the way it was while he decided, but it didn't work. Mancuso put the comb in the breast pocket of his suit and turned to dry his hands on the filthy rolling towel. The boy turned with him, took the revolver out of his jacket, and aimed at the base of his skull. When he fired, the noise was terrible and bright and hollow in the little room. Then he dashed out, as much to escape the ringing in his ears as the corpse. But in the dim light of the small, orange, flame-shaped bulbs mounted on the walls of the mezzanine, he saw his mistake. The two men hadn't left at all. They had been waiting just outside the door for Mancuso to join them, and now they pulled guns out of their suit coats and aimed them at the boy. He remembered the puzzled face of one of them, a tall, thin man with a long nose. He looked at the boy, then passed him as though he expected someone else to come out of the men's room. The boy ran. Years later he understood that it was probably the only thing that had saved him. To pull out the gun again, even to stand in one place long enough to allow the two men to think, would have doomed him. But he ran down the stairs to the lobby, where Eddie was just coming out of the swinging double doors with some scared ushers and three other middle-aged men in hats and long overcoats. At first the boy thought that Eddie had been caught, because they looked like plain-clothes cops. But when the two men with guns had appeared behind him on the stairway, everybody but Eddie ran back into the theater. Only the boy and Eddie fired. Both of them aimed at the same man and hit him, and left the other to get off two or three shots over the railing. He was too cunning because he fired at the big glass door to the street, where Eddie and the boy should have been, instead of into the lobby where they were. The boy aimed again, but then the railing was a blur because he was being snatched off his feet and hustled through the pile of broken glass into the street. Eddie had been right to do it. Eddie was a born foot soldier. He always kept in the front of his brain the certainty that anyone who thought he had a valid reason to put his head up when the air was full of flying metal was an idiot. And now it was time for Wolf to put his head down. It had taken him two days of driving to reach Buffalo, and he felt a kind of empty-headed euphoria to be able to stand and walk. His right foot was cramped and stiff, and the tendon behind his right knee felt stretched and rubbery. He walked along Grant Street and studied the buildings. They hadn't changed in the ten years since he had seen them except for the signs, so there was some hope. When he had arrived in Buffalo, he had found it gripped by some kind of madness. The center of the downtown section had been bulldozed and sandblasted, and now lived a strange, mummified, decorative existence, with a set of trolley tracks running down Main Street and a lot of lights to verify the first impression that there was nobody on the sidewalks. They had hosed the dirty, dangerous occupants out of Chippewa Street and turned the buildings into the core of some imaginary theater district. The whole business alarmed him. What could have become of the old man if there was some urban renewal craziness going on? But the juggernaut had obviously run its course before it reached Grant Street. The respectable blue-collar sections obviously hadn't struck anybody in City Hall as a priority, and they retained their ancient, gritty integrity. 
When he had been here on business with Eddie when he was sixteen, they had driven by the house slowly but didn't stop. What is it? he had asked. Eddie had answered, There's a man in there who makes people disappear. He's black, sort of brown and leathery, like my shoes, and he's about a thousand years old. Remember where it is. Never write it down, just remember. Years later, he had made his way to Buffalo with a contract on him so huge that it wasn't expressed in numbers. The word had gone out that the man who got him would never have to do anything again for the rest of his life. So he had found himself one winter night in the musty, dark parlor talking to the quiet old man with the big clock ticking on the mantel and the old furnace in the basement pumping warm air up through the register at their feet. I know who you are, the old man had said. It'll be expensive. Ten years later, here he was in the parlor again. This time the old man said, I remember you. It'll be expensive. I know, Wolf said. He considered himself lucky that the old man was still above ground, with ten years added on to the unknowable number he had already lived. The old man seemed to be thinking about how long ten years was, too. How hard are they looking after all these years? Don't lie to me. They found me, he said. They must be trying hard. Why? You know why. No. Why now? I've been living far away all this time. I wasn't stupid enough to even think about coming back, but Tony Tallarese found me. So you killed him, which makes four. Peter Mantino makes six, because you had to shoot a man to get to him. So everybody knows. People talk. This time I listened. Why? I knew you'd been away. That meant you don't have anybody you didn't know ten years ago. So you waited for me to come? I waited. Are you going to help me? When you were in trouble before, you didn't want to run away from it until you hurt them. You killed about twenty of them before you let it go. It wasn't twenty. The old man shrugged. It don't matter. I want to know if you're going to do that again. No, Wolf said. It was worth trying to get Tallarese before he told anybody where I was. I thought he was too greedy to let anybody else collect. Then there was a shooter waiting for me at the L.A. airport. Unless things have changed a lot, there's nobody who could have arranged that except Mantino. Who else do you want? Did you come to town to get Angelo Fratelli? No. All I want is a passport and a way out. I want to go under again. Then I'll go see a man. The old man pushed himself up out of the chair with his arms and stayed bent over for a second before straightening. As he dressed for his errand, he looked frail and antique. He put on a sleeveless sweater, wrapped a scarf around his neck, put on a dark brown overcoat, and then snapped a pair of rubbers over his sturdy leather shoes to keep his feet dry, as though it were midwinter. He walked carefully to the door. Lock it behind me. Anybody comes who don't have a key, shoot him. I didn't bring a gun. The old man had to turn the whole upper part of his body around to look at him. There's a shotgun in the closet. He closed the door, and Wolf could hear him slowly and carefully moving over the elastic boards of the porch toward the steps, and then silence returned. The house was still fiercely neat. The knives hanging from hooks in the kitchen had been sharpened so many times that they all had fillet blades, but they were hung in unbroken, descending order of length. The old man's collection of boots was lined up in ranks in the front of the closet. The shotgun was a Remington that might have been acquired any time after the turn of the century, and it rested in a stand that the old man had made, with a block at the floor cut with a jigsaw to fit the butt, and a pair of bent clamps on the barrel to keep it from toppling over. The plastic cap of an aspirin bottle had been fitted over the muzzle to keep out the dust. Wolf lifted it out of its stand and sniffed it. Linseed oil on the stock and gun oil on the barrel. 
He pumped the slide and felt the smooth, easy clicks as he ejected a shell onto the carpet. He glanced at it before he slipped it back in. Double lot buckshot. The old man didn't want to have to shoot anybody twice. He had been awake most of the time for seventy-two hours now, and his mind was beginning to feel the wear. He had to force himself to stay alert for a few more minutes. He found the box of shotgun shells on the floor behind the boots, filled his coat pockets with them, and took the shotgun with him. He was beginning to feel an exhaustion almost like dizziness, so that when he turned his head he had to take a moment to focus on the new sight. He knew he was probably reacting to this more than to the danger of sleeping alone in the old man's house, but he felt a nervous restlessness that made him afraid to close his eyes. Eddie had given him advice on that, too. Before you go to sleep, always be goddamn sure you're going to be alive when you wake up. He used to keep the boy up watching the cars behind them while he drove, or sometimes just looking for a likely place to drop a weapon or change a license plate. Once he had even made him check off landmarks to be sure the road map didn't have any mistakes on it. Sometime in the last few years, Wolf had admitted to himself that he had always known it was because Eddie hated to be alone when he was scared. Eddie would have said, I'm not scared, I'm just alert. It still made him sad to remember that Eddie had been alone when he had died. He walked through the house to the pantry, opened the door, and turned on the light. The shelves were lined with cans and bottles to last for years, all arranged in rows, front to back, like the displays in a tiny supermarket. He found a twenty-five-pound sack of rice, placed it on the floor as a pillow, laid the shotgun on the floor next to it, and turned out the light. For a moment he lay there in the dark, opening and closing his eyes and not detecting a difference. He wondered if he would have to try something else. It had been ten years since he had slept on a floor, and the tile squares were harder and colder than they looked. But the idea of getting up again seemed an immense labor at the moment, and then he forgot what he had been thinking, and had to remind himself. He decided he had better move, but later, when he felt more uncomfortable. And then he was asleep. He didn't dream. Instead, his mind roamed the house, running hands along the walls, feeling the faint vibration of the old man's oil furnace, like the sound of an engine pushing it somewhere with glacial slowness. Deep in the timbers there was the almost inaudible creak of the house standing up to the wind off the river, and outside tiny particles of grit blowing against the impervious shell of brittle paint on the clabbards. It was like being deep in the hold of a ship at anchor. His mind kept patrolling the surfaces, reassuring itself that the shell was tight and unbroken, and that his sleeping body was secreted in the center where he had hidden it. When he awoke, his first sensation was that he had missed something on his rounds, made a mistake. But then his mind tripped on the contradiction. He couldn't have been both asleep and awake. But he knew there were people in the house. The floor amplified the impacts of their steps, and he could feel them in his body. The old man would have come in alone and warned him if he was bringing somebody back with him. He picked up the shotgun and slowly crawled to the pantry door. He pushed the door open an eighth of an inch and looked out into the kitchen. It was still dark. He listened for a moment until he was sure they were no longer in the room. He heard the creak of a door in the hallway being pulled open quickly, then a long silence. If there were people sneaking around the house in the dark, then the old man wasn't one of them. He would have known it was the best way to get his head blown off. Could the old man have sold him? Not after giving him a loaded shotgun. Somebody was looking for Wolf. At first, the search would be quick and cursory. They would duck across doorways and step aside to swing doors open. When they had been through the whole building once without any resistance, they would go through again looking for hiding places. He had to get out before they got to that stage. He held the shotgun level with the floor as he slipped out of the pantry into the open kitchen. He set his feet down softly, moving to the kitchen door. Now he could hear voices in the parlor, quick and urgent and soft. He slowly turned the doorknob and pulled the door open before he let the spring turn it back. He took a step over the threshold, then another to take the weight of his body, then another and another until he was down the steps. 
He took a deep breath of the cool, damp air and blew it out to let it merge with the wind. As his head cleared, he admitted to himself that the old man must be dead. He walked around to the back of the house, looked in the window, and saw them. There were two of them, both carrying pistols in their right hands. One was tall and fat, with bristly gray hair pushed back like porcupine quills. He kept his pistol pointed down at the floor, while the other, a twenty-five-year-old with a pitted complexion and a sharp, chiseled face, danced around opening closet doors and jumping out of the way as though he weren't sure when his partner might decide to shoot. As he watched them, he studied the eager, predatory expression on the face of the young one. He looked as though he had just watched the old black man die, and the sight had agreed with him. He was in a state of excitement, thrilled that he was going to get to do it again. It took no more than a second for the impulse his look ignited in Wolf to travel its course. He knew Eddie Mastruski would have said, What do you get for it? But by now the impulse was traveling too fast, gaining strength and getting hotter, and it made him raise the shotgun to his shoulder and hug it tight. He fired through the window, pumped it, and fired again. After the second shot, as the barrel leveled from the kick and he pumped it again, there was an instant, like the wink of a camera shutter, when he saw pieces of glittering window glass turn end over end and sprinkle the two bodies sprawled on the floor. He lowered the shotgun, pressed the disconnector, and quickly pumped out the last three shells. Then he released the magazine, gave the barrel a quarter turn, and removed it from the receiver. He held both halves under his coat and walked down the driveway to the street. He had told the old man he hadn't come to town to get Angelo Fratelli. But a lot had changed since then. Angelo Fratelli hated white wine. It was his belief that it was a weak, sour version of the rich, blood-red Paisano he had been drinking since he was a child. He had heard the sister say in school that when Jesus was on the cross, the Romans had given him vinegar and water with a sponge, and he had assumed they were talking about something that just tasted like vinegar, maybe cheap Spanish sauterne. That was what Angela was drinking now. Every year, between Ash Wednesday and Easter, he drank white wine only. It was a legacy from the days when people ate fish on Friday, and although religion had said nothing about what went with it, the Fratellis had always assumed that the scriptures implied white wine. The drop of cognac or grappa that he liked after dinner was out too, because those concoctions were clearly on the side of luxury. He was still drinking white wine this late in the year because of a promise he had made to St. Giovanni in return for a favor and from time to time he wondered if the favor was sufficient to merit the sacrifice. But he always lost weight during Lent, and on the whole he was satisfied with the return he got on this last vestige of his religion. He weighed 230 pounds on Easter morning each year. By the time Ash Wednesday came again, he weighed 245, and over twenty years that was an extra 300 pounds so he calculated that if he hadn't switched to white wine every Lent and spoiled his appetite, he would weigh about 550 pounds. He was 53 now, and it would have been a real problem. He wouldn't even have been able to slide into his reserved booth at the Vesuvio restaurant. This would have been more than a humiliation, because the booth where he now sat was his place of business. It was under a stained-glass window with a picture of Mount Vesuvius trailing a huge cloud of white smoke across the blue sky. It allowed him to sit with his back to the wall without seeming to, because behind the window were six inches of whitewashed brick with light bulbs cunningly placed to simulate the light of the Italian sun and the glow of the volcano. The booth wasn't reserved in a crude way. It was simply that the waiters never seated anyone else there. If an outsider asked for it, they would smile and nod and conduct him to another part of the restaurant. Angelo Fratelli was an important man. In a way, he was the restaurant's biggest attraction. Every night at six, he would drive into the lot at the rear of the building, walk around to the front, come in, smile at the older waiters, and go through the dining room to his booth. When he sat down, Lorraine, the fifty-ish blonde waitress he seemed to prefer, would bring him his wine. She would set the carafe on the table roughly, nearly spilling it, and clank down his glass. If he said, 
Nice day today, she would snap. Can't prove it to me. I've got to be on my feet in this dark hole all day. If he said she looked good, she'd say, Don't even think about it. For reasons nobody had ever fathomed, Mr. Fratelli found Lorraine amusing, and when he left each night, he would give her a large tip. Since all the employees in the Vesuvio divided their tips equally, Lorraine's rudeness to Mr. Fratelli was considered a form of heroism. From a certain point of view, she was risking her life for the good of all. Angela Fratelli was the reigning leader of what in Buffalo was called the Arm. Nobody presumed to guess why Angelo tolerated Lorraine, but it was for a combination of reasons. One was that he thought it made him seem affable and approachable. In reality, he was anything but affable. In the wars of the fifties, he had filled his share of car trunks, and since then had cultivated a reputation for savagery by ensuring that the kills he wanted attributed to his wrath were found naked and mutilated in fields south of the city. Everything he did was calculated and premeditated. Although he had no interest in spending time with other people, he had found that a good portion of his business was brought to him by people who would never have dared speak to him if it weren't for his supposed accessibility. His demeanor had been practiced since the forties, when he had been given as a franchise a stable of shop-worn and unprepossessing prostitutes by Francisco del Pecchio, the potentate of that era. Angelo's natural temper was gloomy and dyspeptic, and at first he found that the prostitution business was tough going. Potential customers were instinctively frightened when they saw him, and often left before they saw the merchandise he was offering, because they suspected that the young 230-pound entrepreneur might have conducted them to his lair in the Albemarle Hotel to garrote them for their wallets and watches. This, in fact, was one of the business practices he was reduced to considering when one day a prospective client, a gypsum buyer from Ohio, enlightened him. "'You think I'm crazy enough to go out in the dark in a strange town with you?' Thereafter, Angelo had concentrated his considerable will on changing his image. He had spent some money on decorating the upper floor of the Albemarle, more money on some respectable suits for himself, and still more money on presents and clothes for his sullen and underworked talent. He made it a policy never to enter a room without smiling at everyone he saw, and, if possible, calling them by name. He developed a comical way of talking to his girls, patterned after the way he and his male colleagues in the arm talked to each other, a tone that was simultaneously conspiratorial and derisive. He even gave them nicknames like mobsters. One, a girl who had been born with a blonde bovine beauty in a part of Alabama that hadn't seen fit to reward it suitably, he called Slowly But Surely. Another, a tall bony woman who might have been a fashion model, if she had had a pretty face, he called Olive Oil. And a younger girl of similar charms and handicaps, Extra Virgin Olive Oil. His star, an intense young woman named Gloria Monday, was so inventive in what she did to, on, under, and with her clients, that she achieved a clientele that wasn't either blind drunk or lost, but actually knew the way to the Albemarle. Angelo had never heard Latin outside of church, but he could read an inscription, and when he saw a sick transit Gloria Mundi on a tombstone, he started calling her Sick Transit Gloria. That had been a long time ago. Now the girls were old or dead, and Angelo's hearty, expansive manner had become so habitual that he had often displayed it at the most inappropriate times, such as the night when he had executed a young Canadian named Boromier for being found in close proximity to a truckload of cigarettes that unofficially belonged to Angelo, and again when he had attended the funeral of a close friend. Because it bore no relation to his feelings, this bogus jocularity could surface at any time when he wasn't concentrating. It added to his stature and reputation in his later years, because when it appeared, it was chilling. Angelo was alone in his booth tonight. It was a brief vacation for him. Usually he was encumbered by Capella and Salvatore, two young retainers sworn to die to protect him. The problem with young men sworn to die to protect their patrons was that they didn't actually want to die. 
so large portions of their mental capacities were devoted to vigilance and suspicion. This left so little for ordinary human commerce that it made them dull and preoccupied companions. But tonight Angelo was to meet with a man who wasn't willing to speak in the presence of third parties, and hadn't the experience to appreciate the fact that at any given time Capella and Salvatore were only half conscious of anything that was said, and in any case had no interest in it. Angelo sipped the terrible white wine and rolled it around his mouth so that he could detest it. Then he set the glass down, filled it again, stood up, and went to the men's room. As he walked across the dining room, he felt the eyes of a dozen people on him, all establishing his presence to the satisfaction of a hundred grand juries. He had seldom done what he was about to do. The Vesuvio was his sanctuary, and to use it as an alibi in any illegal activity would have been a violation of trust. But the man he was going to meet was a banker, a solid citizen who had, to Angelo's knowledge, never done anything that wouldn't put a grand jury to sleep. Angelo passed the men's room door, went out the fire exit in the hallway near the storeroom, and emerged beside the dumpster in the lot behind the restaurant. He was so overwhelmed by the sweet, nauseating smell of fermenting vegetables that he stopped to peer over the edge to see what they were. He was dispirited when he saw that the smell was from a collection of empty quart cans of tomato paste, all opened and dumped hastily without being scraped. These days everybody was in a hurry. In the old days they had made the sauce from fresh plum tomatoes. He looked for the car Salvatore had left for him and saw it immediately. It was a small gray Toyota registered to someone named O'Reilly, who ran a gas station and used it as a loaner for regular customers. O'Reilly had no idea who would be driving the car, or that it had anything to do with the way Salvatore made his living. It was a favor of no consequence to O'Reilly, but the fact that he had done it had, without his knowledge, made him eligible for dividends in the future. He would probably find that, over time, he would gain a few customers who would mention that Salvatore had recommended him. But he might also find that, when he was worried about his property taxes, they had already been paid, or that his daughter had miraculously moved up the waiting list for admission to the most desirable girls' school. In the most extreme case, he might find that when his enemies were about to triumph over him, forces that had nothing to do with him would destroy them, suddenly and utterly. The world worked on goodwill, favors, and reciprocities, but the system was too crude to keep the exchanges in proportion. Angelo drove out of the lot without even glancing in the direction of the space where his own Cadillac was parked. In ten or twenty minutes he would be back at his table. He drove carefully. The car was probably like a fingerprint collection by now, having been loaned to half the city without being cleaned. But if he hit something, there wouldn't be much question as to who had been driving it. Wolf heard the sound of the Toyota leaving the lot. As soon as its lights had passed, he knew the driver's eyes would be turned to look up the street. And he sat up in the back seat of Fratelli's Cadillac. What he saw seemed impossible. The driver of the little car that was going past Angelo Fratelli's new caddy was Angelo Fratelli. He ducked back down, opened the door a little, and kept the light switch in the doorframe depressed with his keys while he opened it wide enough to slip out into the darkness. He reached inside to the floor to haul the shotgun out after him, then hurried to his own car. Angelo wasn't sure why he was going to the trouble of meeting McCarran in secret and alone, but he was intrigued by the request. McCarran was the president of a small bank that operated only in Erie County. Banks had always titillated Angelo, and they titillated him even more since he had begun to read the stories about savings and loans being closed by the government. It amazed him that so much crude bad-boy thievery had gone on behind the substantial institutional columns of those places. There had been clowns who had imagined they could practically stuff their briefcases with their depositors' money and walk out the door free and clear the day they declared bankruptcy but oddly enough, it seemed that the clowns were right. The government was picking up the tab, and those former savings and loan officers were sitting on their yachts drinking champagne. Obviously, Mr. McCarran had been reading the same newspapers Angelo had. He would be thinking that right now, as the army of sweaty little federal bookkeepers were busy breaking their pencils and gnashing their teeth, 
while they worked their second year of double shifts to figure out what had happened to all the money in the savings and loans, they would be letting the banks alone. McCarran obviously had a scheme. Those guys must all know each other, too, just the way Angelo and his colleagues did. They weren't exactly competitors, because there was plenty to go around. But they kept an eye on each other, because nobody ever knew the future. And if one of them got too big, he would be dangerous. McCarran would be sitting in his big old Victorian mansion on Delaware Park Lake, and he would read about how the dumbest bastard he had known at Harvard Business School had just gone under. He would say to himself, it makes sense. Then he would read on to learn that two hundred million dollars had somehow disappeared on bad loans, and he would know. For an hour or a day he might pretend he didn't, but he would know. The dumb bastard had somehow ended up with the money. The federal regulators wouldn't be able to figure out how, but McCarran would because he was in the same business. So now McCarran had done something that not even the most cynical and suspicious of investigators could have anticipated. He had set up a meeting with Angelo Fratelli. This bank president, whose social life was reported in the Buffalo News, and seemed always to involve his being in a tuxedo at an odd location like a hospital or the art museum with others like him, needed Angelo. All that remained now was for Angelo to hear what his part in the scheme was and what he was going to get out of it. It might be that one of Angelo's companies would be the one to default on a big loan, or even that McCarran had somehow found a way to get the money in cash and needed someone with connections to haul it to offshore banks. Angelo didn't waste much time speculating on the specifics because he wasn't dealing with a little teller with a drug habit. This was a bank president, and if he had a scheme, it was probably so complicated and devious that nobody else could even follow it. Fratelli drove to the park and along the curving drive around the lake. Across the water he could see the fronts of the Art Museum and the Buffalo Historical Museum on a little hillside gleaming white in the moonlight. Then his view was blocked by trees again, and he passed the first brick walls of the zoo. Now he saw McCarran. He was standing on the first of the asphalt basketball courts in the park, and he had a big tan dog on a leash. Angelo was a little unnerved. When McCarran had said he walked his dog at night, Fratelli had imagined a hairy little yapper, not a big slavering monster. But he pulled over anyway, extricated his large body from the little Toyota, and stepped onto the lawn. "'What kind of dog is that?' he asked. He leaned against the fence instead of going through the gate onto the court. "'It's a golden retriever,' said McCarran. He reached down and pounded the dog. To Fratelli it seemed he had hammered it pretty hard, but the dog appeared to love it, so he ventured closer. "'Don't worry,' said McCarran. "'He doesn't bite.' "'Then what good is he?' McCarran seemed to think about this for a long time. "'My wife bought him.' he said finally. "'Come on,' said Angelo. "'Get in and we'll go for a ride. "'If we stand around here, it's only a matter of time "'before kids come to hit us over the head "'or cops come to save us.' "'McCarran and the dog moved out of the basketball court "'and to the side of the car. "'As the banker opened the door, Fratelli stopped him. "'Has he taken a leak lately?' "'McCarran smiled. "'He won't foul the car.' As Angelo went back to the driver's side, he thought about that one. Foul the car. Whatever this McCarran was going to be worth, he was a real dog-and-horse, riding-boots-and-driving-gloves asshole. As Angelo started the car, he felt it lurch and rock, once as the dog bounded into the back seat, and once as McCarran seated himself in the front. He pulled out onto the drive. He wasn't surprised that in the enclosed space of the little car he could smell the dog, but he could also smell something fainter. McCarran was wearing some kind of perfumed aftershave or cologne. He had always heard that it was déclassé to slap that stuff on. It seemed to Angelo that as you moved up the social strata, at each step all the rules were reversed. It was like clothes. At a certain level, not wearing nice clothes meant you didn't have a job. Two levels up from there, it meant you didn't need one. 
Wolf was driving past the park that abutted the zoo when he saw a man and a dog come out of one of the basketball courts. At first he couldn't be sure what was going on. But in the rearview mirror he saw the man join somebody who could have been Angelo Fratelli. When the dog and the two men got into the little gray Toyota, he knew. At the first turn, Wolf pulled over, stopped, and lay down on the front seat. When he saw the headlights flash on the ceiling of his car and then vanish, he sat up and prepared to follow. Angelo drove to Delaware Avenue and turned left to go out of the city. He had begun to feel that he needed to bring this one up into the light and take a look at him. Driving around in the dark wasn't going to tell him who he was dealing with. He turned the next corner and then turned again at Elmwood toward the State University. The traffic was consistent and still heavy, but most of it was going away from Buffalo State at dinner time. On an impulse, he turned on Forest Avenue and went up a short driveway to a parking lot at the edge of the campus. Ahead of him was a carload of young men. They took a ticket from a dispenser, and a wooden beam raised itself to let them in. "'What's this?' asked McCarran. "'Why are we stopping?' The university. There's plenty of people. It's a good place to talk. Is this safe? Who do you think those kids are going to recognize? You or me? Angela waited for a stupid answer, but when it didn't come, he drove into the lot, stopped the car in the middle of a row, then turned toward his passenger. Okay, Mr. McCarran, what do you want from me? The banker took a deep breath and spoke carefully. I have a problem. I was going to say, I have reason to believe, but that's not strong enough. I know I have a problem. I've been borrowing funds from certain accounts. They were secret, set up with false names. I knew that the owners wouldn't go to the authorities if they discovered a problem, but now they know, and I think someone will come for me at some point. Angelo didn't conceal his disappointment. Shit, he said. What do you want, protection? McCarran said, I don't think that if they really want me, bodyguards would be of much use. I'd like to get out of the country. Maybe you could arrange whatever you do for your own people in this situation. Plastic surgery, papers, and so on. Angelo moved his head from side to side and let out a little snort that was partly a laugh. It was absurd, but maybe if he did this man a favor, he wouldn't regret it. After all, McCarran was still the president of a perfectly good bank. That kind of thing mostly happens in the movies. But if you'll tell me who's pissed off at you, I might be able to get him off your back. He began to calculate how it would work. He could tell McCarran his enemy was demanding a million dollars. Then, with a hundred thousand or so and a slight expenditure of bluster... Angelo could probably convince any reasonably small-time wise guy that he had saved his honor and had settled his dispute. "'It's not like that,' said McCarran. "'I can't tell you much. I thought they were drug dealers, but now I believe it's the... uh... CIA.' Angelo's hands gripped the steering wheel, and he could see that his knuckles were turning white and feel that rage was gripping his chest and throat." All of his visions of access to a bank were laughable. This man was insane. He had heard of this kind of thing happening. Sometimes they saw religious visions or heard voices telling them to do things like drop their pants in some public place. Sometimes they decided the CIA was bombarding their feeble brains with radio waves and listening to what they were thinking. He wasn't going to get inside the bank, and clearly within a short time McCarran wasn't going to either. He held his temper. Gee, he said, I don't know what to tell you. McCarran was alarmed. You won't do it? The C-fucking-I-A? I just don't know. Angelo avoided McCarran's wide-eyed, gaping face, letting his eyes wander to the nearest lighted building. At the corner of the building were two glass doors, so the whole corner was glass. Beyond the door, in the hallway, he could see a few students, but there was also a man in his late thirties or early forties with sandy hair. The man was looking at something on a bulletin board. No, he seemed to be reading everything on the bulletin board. 
He looked odd to Angelo. What was it? There was something about the way he carried himself, a slight slouch, as though he were keeping most of his weight on one foot, his coat open, and his arms down at his sides. Then Angelo realized that the man was looking at him in the reflection on the dark glass of the door beside him. Angelo studied the face in the window, and then began to sweat. My God, he said, and realized he had said it aloud in front of this lunatic, but then decided he didn't care. What's wrong? asked McCarran. What is it? Your heart? He grabbed Angelo's arm. No! Get your hands off me! Angelo started the car and backed out of the space, then guided the little car around to the exit. He made it down the narrow drive about forty feet, then had to stop to wait for the cars ahead of him to pay the man at the kiosk and drive off. The station wagon at the head of the line settled its accounts with the man and pulled forward under the raised barrier, but then something very noisy happened to it. At first Angelo didn't see the bus coming any more than the driver of the wagon did. But just as its nose moved a couple of feet into the street, the bus arrived to occupy the same space. It was on its approach to the bus stop, so it was only inches from the curb when it hit the station wagon. It popped the front bumper off, took the grill, and smeared the front end of the station wagon sideways as it came to a stop across the driveway. Angelo looked for a way out. The curb on both sides of the car was at least a foot high, and if he tried to bump over it, he would probably get stuck halfway. His caddy might have made it, but this little Toyota's donut tires didn't have a chance. He was stuck in a track like a go-kart in an amusement park. There were two cars and something that looked like the end of the world ahead of him, and at least four or five behind him. Curious people were now beginning to come out of the nearby campus buildings, some of them looking amused, some worried. The man he had seen would wait just long enough for the confusion to peak, and then he would be here. Angelo couldn't defend himself. He didn't even have a gun. If he had been in the Cadillac, he could at least have used the phone to call for help. He looked around him. Far down the street to his left was the lighted yellow sign of a bar called the Canal. He turned to McCarran. We've got a little problem, and here's what we're going to do. Problem, said McCarran. They'll have that cleared up in a few minutes. Angela was afraid he was going to break the steering wheel with his bare hands, so he carefully put them in his lap. I'm going to get out of the car and walk down to that bar with the yellow sign. You slide over, take the wheel. I can't slide over in this car. You come around, wait for them to clear the exit, drive down to the bar and meet me. Angelo's slow, clear, quiet voice had frightened McCarran more than it would have if he had been screaming and shrieking. He held on to Angelo's arm with a grip that slowed the circulation. No, no you don't. Tell me first. Angelo glared at him. This was when he would have killed him if they hadn't been stuck here surrounded by people. This was a man who, if left alone, would shortly begin to line his hats with tinfoil to protect his brain from the CIA's microwaves. But he tried anyway. There's a man in that building. Don't look. I said don't look. He kills people for a living. He shouldn't be here. I haven't seen him for years, and now here he is. See, said McCarran, he's after me. Angelo sighed. He's not after you, for Christ's sake. He's after me. McCarran wasn't to be dissuaded. I came to you tonight to tell you they want me dead. A hitman shows up and you say he's not after me? Please, said Angelo. Just do it. Come around and take the wheel. No, said McCarran. Not a chance. Now Angelo grabbed McCarran's wrist and freed himself of the lunatic's grip. It was much more difficult than he had anticipated. McCarran was as big as he was. This is not the kind of man the CIA would send. Give him a membership card and security clearance and all that shit. He's a fucking animal. That's very reassuring. Look, my life depends on you now. Get us out of here. Angelo nearly said, no, my life depends on you. But the thought was too distasteful. This guy doesn't know you from shit. You're nothing. The people he works for take out six of you a day and he still wouldn't make enough to pay for gas. This is my town. 
If he's in my town and nobody told me he was coming, he's looking for me. Now I've got to get to a phone. He gave McCarran's wrist a little twist as he threw it back in his lap and got out of the car. He walked fast, stepping over the high curb and striking out across the shrubbery to the sidewalk. But then he heard a car door slam, and he listened for the other door to slam and let him know that McCarran had gotten into the driver's seat. Instead, he heard the loud blare of a car horn. Then there were running footsteps, and an unfamiliar voice yelled, Hey! Get back in the car! Find it out at home, you old faggots! He was mortified more deeply than he had been since he was a child. He felt chills in his spine, inside the very bones. But when he touched his face, it was hot. When McCarran caught up with him, Angelo was so angry that patches and bursts of color were floating across his field of vision. You couldn't listen, huh? The man was dead. He might still be walking around, but now the only gratification that Angelo could promise himself was that McCarran was going to know why he was dying while he died. You expect me to sit there and let him kill me? My only chance is if I stick with you. McCarran obviously didn't know that he was beyond having chances. His chance had been the chance to do what Angelo had told him to do. Shut up, said Angelo. There was no possibility the butcher's boy hadn't been looking at him. But why would he be looking for him in a university parking lot? If he wanted Angelo, he would look for the Cadillac in the parking lot at the Vesuvio. Of course he had. But he had seen Angelo come out and get into this little Toyota, and it followed him. Tonight, of all nights of the year, he was away from his soldiers, unarmed and alone. Where are we going? Shouldn't we get off the street? McCarran asked. Now it occurred to Angelo that the reason he was in this situation was the call from this lunatic who was dogging his steps, practically stepping on his heels. He glanced at McCarran again, but the suspicion dissolved into simple anger. McCarran was too crazy to have knowingly betrayed anyone. He really was frightened. No, said Angelo. We go to the bar and call for help. If that one gets us into the darkness off the street, we don't come out again. Behind them a horn honked again. This time it was a long, loud bleat that ended with what sounded like someone beating his fist on the horn six times. Wolf drifted out of the building with a crowd of curious students. The bus driver and the owner of the station wagon were out of their vehicles and standing on the street, so the onlookers began to lose interest. There was no tragedy to participate in, or even carnage to see. The event had already been diminished to the dull haggling in which the drivers served only as temporary representatives of the insurance companies and lawyers who were the real principals. The horns started again. The two drivers in the accident climbed back into their vehicles, the bus driver pulled away from the wrecked car and stopped at the bus stop, and then a few young men pushed the station wagon away from the exit and around the corner to the curb. Now the horns began in earnest, and Wolf looked at the source of the commotion. There was the little Toyota stalled in the narrow drive to the exit, and behind it there were now eight or ten cars, all honking their horns. Two of the young men who had pushed the station wagon were looking into the gray car and shaking their heads at someone inside. When the someone lunged over the back seat into the front and began to bark at the horns, he understood their problem. They wanted to get in and move the car out of the way, but they were afraid of the big dog. As Wolf stepped to the street, he could see two men walking quickly up the sidewalk toward a lighted yellow sign. The big man with Fratelli, whose face he hadn't been able to see, was probably a bodyguard. He obviously had the knack. There had been no way for the bodyguard to sense that Fratelli was in danger, as in fact he wasn't, at least for the moment. Wolf had already decided not to make an attempt tonight. There were too many witnesses. When the gray car had entered the university visitor's lot, he had followed it on a whim. He regretted it now, as he walked back toward his car amid the sound of horns. Somehow he had frightened the bodyguard, and a whole series of responses had been triggered, each placing additional obstacles in his path. Now Fratelli would dig in, the bodyguard would marshal reinforcements, and in an hour Fratelli would be a very difficult man to kill. Wolf climbed into his car and started the engine. 
He backed out of his parking space and joined the line of cars waiting to get past the toll gate to the street. He could see that the two men were just coming under the big yellow sign down the sidewalk. Then something odd happened. The two of them tried to squeeze through the front door at once and got stuck for a second. Then Fratelli stopped and let the other man go in front. It was puzzling behavior for a bodyguard. Once inside the canal, Angelo could see that the place was disgusting. It was full of the kind of people he had seen on television buying cars like the one he had just abandoned or talking about tax-sheltered annuities, and every one of them was drinking white wine. The place was dim but full of living plants with little spotlights on them, and the bartender was dressed up like a neutered poodle with a high collar that had a little black bow around it. He could see the telephone in the little alcove just this side of the bathrooms, so he rushed across the room, fishing in his pockets for change. He was almost at the telephone before he admitted to himself that he didn't have any. So he came back to grab McCarran, who had been headed off by a woman in a little blue suit like a man's. "'I'm afraid we're all booked up,' she was saying. Angelo said to McCarran, "'Give me your change.' The woman looked at him doubtfully. "'I was just telling your friend—' "'Fine,' said Angelo. "'I just want to use your phone.' McCarran placed a little pile of coins in his palm. As an afterthought, Angelo added, "'And we'd like a drink. White wine.' Angelo returned to the telephone to find a young woman dropping a coin into the slot. He leaned close and said, "'Are you going to be long?' As she turned to look at him, he could see that she was about twenty-five years old and the sort of young woman he hated most. She smirked at him. Probably, but it's none of your business. She had light brown hair, almost blonde hair, a big pair of glasses with red frames and lenses that glittered in the light of the little spot on the nearest philodendron. The enormity of the situation engulfed Angelo as the young woman took off her earring on the side where she was going to clamp the phone. She was actually going to prolong this just to piss him off. She had no idea of what the planet she lived on was really like. She was probably a clerk in the women's clothes section of a department store, or with that arrogance probably the senior clerk, who decided which clothes to buy from the distributor. She was very much like that young woman two years ago who had come up behind him on the street on the day when the computerized timing device on that year's new Cadillac had malfunctioned. He had been coughing along, on or about four mistimed cylinders, spewing black smoke and going twenty miles an hour just trying to make it to the nearest gas station. She had pulled up behind, leaned on the horn for a full minute, then passed him. As she went by, she turned, that same smirk on her face, held out her upturned fist and raised a carefully manicured middle finger at him. Angelo had gone mad. He let the Cadillac glide to a stop by the side of the road, ran out into the street to flag down a cab, and followed her. She went to the parking lot of a real estate broker, got out and entered. He waited long enough to see her sit down at a desk and put her purse in a drawer. She was so overconfident that it never occurred to her to look behind to see what might be breathing down her neck. That night, when she walked out the door of the realtor's office to drive home in her bright red Ford Tempo, she had a surprise. The surprise was embodied in two men who had made the trip over the bridge from Fort Erie in Canada for no purpose other than to demonstrate to this young woman that the world was a much darker and more dangerous place than she or anyone she knew had ever imagined. Angelo couldn't believe it. This night was the worst experience he'd had in five years, even before the girl. Now he was stuck in this fern bar with a man so crazy he might change his mind about his persecutors at any moment and start screaming they were from Jupiter instead of Langley, Virginia. But even that was nothing. Angelo had seen the butcher's boy. Everything else was a mere distraction in comparison. He had to get on that phone. He waited while the young woman dialed, then watched while she counted the rings. When there was no answer and she hung up, he felt as though a weight had been lifted from his chest. But when she snatched the quarter out of the coin tray and put it into the slot again, he started to have trouble breathing. It was at this moment that the woman's boyfriend appeared. He stepped up beside her, glanced at Angelo, and said, "'Everything okay?' The young woman frowned and said, 
Sally's not answering. Not that I could talk to her without any privacy. The young man turned to Angelo and seemed to puff up like a male grouse. Can I help you? Angelo's eyes burned with a heat that made him feel as though they were sweating into his head. His right forearm came forward and his hand went to the man's groin and clutched his testicles. The man's eyes bulged with something beyond surprise. What was happening was so unheard of that it couldn't be real. The pain told him it was, but it also told him not to attempt to do anything about it. To push this insane demon away from him meant that when the hand came away, it would still be holding on to his testicles. Angelo said, I need to use the phone. Tell her. The man said, He needs to use the phone. His back was to his girlfriend, so she couldn't see anything except that the two men were face to face. I know he does, she said. Tough. Angelo gave a little squeeze. The man said in a very different voice, Tracy, get off the fucking telephone! Now! He's got me by the balls! What? said the young woman. I mean literally. It's not a figure of speech. If you don't, I'm going to kill you myself. She slammed the phone onto its hook, stomped out into the dining room, grabbed her coat, and was out the door before Angelo loosened his grip a little. I'm going to let you go, said Angelo. But before I do, I want you to know that my name is Angelo Fratelli. You don't know that name, but you can probably find out who I am. You can tell your girlfriend that if I ever see her again, it doesn't matter where or how. On the street, in a store, anywhere, she's going to die. He let the man go, and the man walked stiffly to the table, pulled several bills from his wallet, left them on his empty plate, and then continued out the door. Angelo put his quarter into the telephone and dialed the number of the Vesuvio. Thank you.